The Project Gutenberg Evoke of a Climber in New Zealand. By Malcolm Ross, this evoke is for the use of anyone anywhere in the United States and most other parts of the world at no cost and with almost no restrictions whatsoever. You may copy it, give it away or reuse it under the terms of the Project Gutenberg license included with this evoke or online at WAF. Gutenberg. Or, if you are not located in the United States, you will have to check the laws of the country where you are located before using the Sebok. Title A Climber in New Zealand Offer Malcolm Ross Photographer Malcolm Ross Release Date August 12, 2020 Weeter Evok 6730 Sveen Language English Produced by Fagunth Fiona Holmes and the online distributed proofreading team at DACT. Waf. Net this file was produced from images generously made available by the Internet Arc of American Libraries. Start of the Project Gutenberg Evoca Climber in New Zealand Transcribers Notes Hyphenation has been standardized. Don't. The name MASH is under Zerbigrin in the index. Is not mentioned anywhere in the project except in the index as follows. Matches, Ehin, Twitwito, Fifty Re, One Hundred Sixty, Two Hundred Nine to Fighter. Zerbigrin's Christian name was Mashes. Words surrounded with underscores indicate italics, and words surrounded with an equal sign indicate bold. Changes made are noted at the end of the book. A climber in New Zealand, the superiority of the mountains to the low ends is as immeasurable as the richness of a painted window match with a white one. Or the wealth of a museum compared with that of a small furnished chamber. Ruskin, the king of day, lingers lovingly about his white throne in the southern Alps, and from there he burns his brilliant fires in the heavens above and along the level world below. Rufferford Waddell. Illustration. Mount Cook. A Climber in New Zealand by Malcolm Ross. At So At Art Loon S. Formerly Vice President of the New Zealand Alpine Club Offer of Rangi. In Tuho Land, etc. Illustrated from photographs by the Offer London Edward Darnold, 1914. All rights reserved to my wife, who in camp and bivouac rejoiced with us in victory and cheered us in defeat. Preface some of the material contained in the following pages appeared in the London Times. My thanks are due to the manager for allowing me to republish it. Articles that have appeared in the Alpine Journal and in some of the leading Australian and New Zealand news parsentously the Otago Daily Times. The Christchurch Press. The Wellington Post, The New Zealand Times, The New Zealand Herald, The Melbourne Age, and The Australavish and also been used. These articles have all been rewrought and more revised. I am indebted to Drive Teichelman for the interesting illustration facing page 209 to Keese, and to the Tava Witness for the photograph of the Rev. Mr. Green, Best, and Kaufman. The other illustrations are from my own photographs. My thanks are also due to Mr. F. M. Lum, late secretary of the Alpine Club, and author of five months in the Himalaya, for the special interest he has taken in the publication of this book. Finally, I must record my great indebtedness to Lord Bryce, the distinguished author and ambassador, and a former president of the Alpine Club, for the charming introductory note that he has written. M. Park, London, February 7, 1914. Prefatory note by the right Han. Discount Bryce on the west side of the southern island of New Zealand there rises from the sea a magnificent mass of snowy mountains, whose highest peak, around the Ormat Cooked, reaches an elevation of 12, 340 spin feet, some of the loftiest summits are visible in the far distance from the railway which runs down the east coast of the island from Christchurch to Dunedin. But to appreciate the full grandeur of the range it must be seen neither from out at sea or from points north of it on the west coast. The view from the seaport of Greymouth on that coast, nearly a hundred miles from Orangi, is not only one of the finest mountain views which the world affords, but is almost unique as a prospect of a long line of snows rising right out of an ocean. 
one must go to northwestern America, or to the Caucasus where it approaches the Yuga sign, north of Poti, or possibly to Kamchakti of which I cannot speak from personal knowledge, to find peaks so high which have the full value of their height, because they spring directly from the sea. The Andes are of course loftier, but they stand farther back from the shore, and they are seldom well seen from it. In southern New Zealand the line of perpetual snow is much lower than it is in the Alps of Europe. It varies, of course, in different parts of the range, but generally speaking. A mountain twelve, zero feet high in New Zealand carries as much snow and ice as one of fifteen, zero feet in the Swiss Alps and New Zealanders point with pride to glaciers comparable to the Nelch and the Mare de Glace. On the west, some of the great ice streams descend to within 700 feet of Sealville, and below the line of perpetual snow the steep declivities are covered with a thick and tangled forest, extremely difficult to penetrate, where tree ferns grow luxuriantly in the depths of the gorges. The region is one of the wettest and most thickly wooded in the world, and it is a region that might have lain long unexplored, except in those few spots where gold has been found, had it not been for the growth, about seventy years ago, of the passion for mountaineering, which has carried British climbers all over the earth in search of places where their prowess could find a field for its display. The first who forced their way into it were some New Zealand government surveyors in 1860 at Y. The first mountaineer to attempt to Rondi was my friend the Rev. W. S. Green of Dublin, now one of the most hunted veterans of our on Alpon Club, who had all but reached the summit when nightfall and bad weather forced him to turn back. After him came some bold New Zealand climbers and Mr. O. F. Fitzgerald, one of the former, Mr. L. So. Fife with his companions, George Dram and J. Clark, reached the very top of our on the in 18 night with her. Among these native mountaineers, Mr. Malcolm Ross has been one of the most daring and most persevering. I had the pleasure, at Wellington, New Zealand, a year and a half ago, of listening to a most interesting description which he gave of his adventures and those of his comrades, and could realize from it the dangers as well as the hardships which the climber has to face in New Zealand. The weather, on the west coast especially, can be awful. Four fierce storms sweep up from the Tasman Sea, that most tempestuous part of the Pacific, whose twelve hundred miles furnished the twelve hundred reasons why New Zealand declined to enter the Australian Federation. The base of operations is distant, for no alpine hotels and hardly any shelter huts have yet been built, such as those which this wist, Gemrinsorization, and Italian alpine clubs have recently provided in their mountain lands. The New Zealand climber, who has been almost always his own guide, has sometimes to be his own porter also, and the slopes and glens, when one approaches the west coast, are covered with so dense a growth of trees and shrubs that progress is always slow and often difficult. No finer work in conquering nature has been done by climbers anywhere than here, but the guerdon was worth the effort. The scenery is magnificent, with a character that is all its own. For New Zealand landscapes are unlike not only those of our northern hemisphere, but those of South America also and the youth of the islands have been fired by the ambition to emulate those British mountaineers whose achievements they admire, as well as by a patriotic love for their own beautiful and fascinating land. I hope that the fresh and vivid descriptions Mr. Ross gives of the charms of New Zealand landscape, and of the scope which its peaks and glaciers afford for the energy and skill of those who find that the European Alps have now little that is new to offer may draw to it more and more visitors from Britain. February 2, 1914.
Contents chapter I descriptive and historical page tearing cognate and experiment in Eclamitoshamanus volcanic mountain chip thermal regiments Lano of Gornu with Southern Alps de Quispirchitin and economic asbestic and sent upon character fully explored scenes historic cliff bimbers ascents to mittenty from accident one chapter D in the olden days across the Mackenzie Plain Sha Alpine Lake Steak cuisine and Ruti a Jeher and a rage hath old hermitage a passing storm pisviancing a camp a huge more in a Zibian was vegetationing to the larger skankan alpine river bivouac in the valefated is a torsion tent in the wilds twenty four chapter ewe in the olden days skin list first sight of the hoxtator ice fallen alpine panner and the weather musings of a lady mountain era storm in camp and acrobatic feet returned to the hermitage a scribe aligned sea lifts are meeting with fifteen avalanche from saft in the mountainside thirty nine chapter of the conquering of orang melia range and expedition at difficulties of transdrops potenced in the desmond river manufacture of if light of our porter climb to the bivouac rocket ficky sits with the cocopal nurse to protectionals for a howard bivouac fifth totio chapter v the conquering of an rentage and second the genius of hand have evacuable in a storm founder and lightning lower the tent a cold repestre title lose those lads knee fashions at the old who tote aurora of loss a kick and trouble and the stormy return home sixth of swing chapter by the conquering of a lutage and psych and another attacking out the frozen tent camp on the plate of fosding a new root block while wall of rocks and aprobata performance nested once more finding the lost swaps renter to the hoot a fourth attempt public to the plate sombing by lanterland days of a nykashesh final eye scope danger leader once more a terrible storm seventeen's chapter by the conquering of a wound and bicted greens root abind denied and graham explore the hooker side kind upon the serious work out a schwand along cool gain saddle guy and defeticle drop was casses at last he descent falling stones one hundred five chapter v above the plains the Tororu range mountain rail where known has charm of high place for the beach for censists and birds urn and misses corpore a botanist sparadus though told in the new a reverie on a hilt up one hundred sixteen chapter x down in the valleys the valley of the muella trying more and narrow fresco compabive rectory merimeter in the rain in the valley of the tasman relocations on being one's own porter of curious keyed and at a mountain hoot an evening under a rock one hundred twenty chapter rex and ascent of haining her a glacier tramp penguin rex a ferial and bretiscot and breakfast and some reflection pick of a lactus wiblets runs a sharp air tescaling a precip his borage a saxi a difficult ice slopey a problem solved by rubber in the cemetery splendid panorathem descenti bivouac again one hundred forty for chapter d an interlude thunderstorm at the huth sunbont brigadiery habitation housing problem kaying cal frex afters in a late dinner marius of beeld met in one hundred fifty at chapter g key deal i beck in the minarets mate de love achillery attempts and historic bivro were cape lock and endorinus v redown the vel affections under a rocket in the mist provis Concerning long rants by candle cargital stunnus and meet a scene in clade clansterings a bugrish descent of the minarets a quick descent return to the hut one hundred six dips wing chapter zeasy across the southern alps we decide to make a new pass bivacat milk brunister wine unal tory warning and the glacier and on the pass return rock and broken asim a difficult climbing and ice fall and an avalanche shoot were reached the whimper glossier a cannonade from the dome we explore new country as coast vegetation one hundred seven chapters of across the southern alps continued an uncomfortable bivouac and a frugal meal we start down the volafry of the virgin forced grown way of the century an interesting discover cavalled it by gurge a veritable fiery londo bivouac on the river bank a sleepless night one hundred ninety three chapter east across the southern alps can spoil an adventure in the river dripping mountain nuisance and flies have an innies and short commons willed cattle in the forced fortance on the sands down the broad volia habitation at last for goes into hospital Spit an exciting redevelopies a beach and a miners at the villa condor and lucky recross the alps all and a back at the hermitage two hundred two chapters ev in keywheel and nearly expedition a lost exploratory aboriginish great lick separate tippet navigation grand you rough t canaware mackinans passive use from the sumptim punt balloon in dangerous mood a bivouac in the forest of cooker out and the arfa river and milford sand two hundred fifteen chapters ev in keywheel and colman somewhat explored counter doxer of of new glacier some
upon an old moor in Eithbridges of Kiwi land a spotless place tree grin for gris fenchidings to tupchidins to zrex an exciting glissage adeptchit killed by vlaki southern starched cross and the bearded reary vigiclep again written juni in the rain cantles were to fullness a concert and camp flows to explorers two hundred thirty six chapters v e t the first crossing of mount cook incidents and rooted a fang at a hoot in the leave a and in mount cook a minor thickly e moment offeted by the weather is planned sense it scales again two hundred six different chapters x the first crossing of mount cook contude in testing a leg a moonlight reduced stair for the traversential and ruling mist fesh comes a ferry at put o by mulic threats and in the dusk a three face fin its lobby in the manor at sunno ridges and racks mid miscontinuous fanal slip chap summit gained two hundred eight retair chapter kex the first crossing of mount cook installed on the summit of ayrch wage commence the descent and abs lay struck our test been over a precipic a sloping shimmied and gressless decentrabum loses his hot a cold would nain a frozen slope a failing stones and dissy in a kiss deducting steps by moonlight fanal wobe shrank spurs by candle worked second sun resfitic hermitage at last two hundred nantifs and index three hundred thirteen list of illustrations meant pup from a tarn on the sealy range front to speak facing pedro a foo from gordaha looking through the rift at the side of the latter volcano six crater of gordaha party on farther lip of inner crater through which clouds of steam rise three thousand feet ten kaufman rev w s green and boston new zealand sixteen jack clark new zealand alpine guide sixteen peter graham new zealand alpine guide sixteen the hermitage mount cook thirty crossing the hooker river in the cage forty crossing the tasman river dixon driving fifth year camp cookery at bivwa crock d Labeck fifth year the mount cook bivwex extiskies the hooker river warehouse range in background seven turfy in campon plateau during attacks on mount cookite crossing the murchison river fip in turnerite telly d beaumont from Malt Brunbib Wuk 100 Mount Cook from the Upper Tasman 114 Mount Darwin 120 Witter Mount Sefton. The short white line at foot of dark moraine in middle distance is the Hermitage 130 Cooking Scones at Bull Glacier Camp 140 T. So, Fife, emerging from Murchison River 140 the Sunburnt Brigade. On Tasman Glacier Ice Cliff 150 at on the Upper Tasman. Mount Darwin in background 150 at D. Lobeck Bivouac Crop 106 Diskies Crevissant Esmond Glacier. From 400 to 500 feet deep 180 Twato on Lake T. New 220 to homeward bound. Sealy range with footstool of Sefton in background 240 for Mount Walter. Part of L.E.D. Beaumont on right 207 Tefu above the clouds. View from Mount Cook Bivouac. Tasman Glacier thousands of feet below. Liebe Grange in background 200 Itixis Mount Tasman. From 11. Zero feet on Mount Cook 290 3000 its loc. The dotted line indicates route to where the Zerbegrinerite is reached 209 Tiki summit of Mount Cook. First photograph of it taken. Brain. Toner and five on summit two hundred nine to kisa climber in new zealand chapter i descriptive and historical we took the path our fathers tried with swinging stride and brave the views we have the hearts we hold are what our fathers gave wandering through an english village not so many years ago a friend chanced upon a dame's school in which new zealand was being described as some small islands off the coast of australia infested with rabbits and only three years ago my wife was asked by a lady in the lissom club in london if the mayoress were still cannibals and if there were tigers in the jungle it is not perhaps surprising then that astonishment should still be expressed when the statement is made that new zealand has alps and glaciers vying in grandeur and in beauty with those of switzerland distant fields are green but seldom white and new zealand is a far country the new zealander however born and bred fifteen thousand miles away still calls england home long may he continue to do so he knows more of england than england knows of him and in time of stress he will cheerfully give it, out of his slender means a batful worcester as an ajib's luck into the world or 
in time of danger, by the veldt with his own red blood, and there will be nothing of selfishness in the sacrifice, as has sometimes been hinted to me by the little Englander, but, reverting to the main question, this ignorance in regard to the outer empire, which still prevails, reminds one of the story told by a well Connor offer on mountaineering, who once saw in the parlour of a cottage in England a wonderful erection of what appeared to be brown paper and shavings, built up in rock-like fashion, covered with little toy-box trees and dotted here and there with bits of mirror-glass and cardboard houses. What? inquired the visitor. May this be that? said the owner of the house. Very slowly, is the work of my late husband a representation of the Halps, as close as he could imagine it, for he never was a brogue. Like this lady's late husband, there are many people who have heard of our Alps and volcanoes, yet have little idea of their size and importance. Let me endeavour, by way of introduction, which the non applying reader may skip if he lacks, to give some idea of the character of these mountains and of their history from a climber's point of view. The flora and fauna of the New Zealand mountains are especially interesting, but it would need much more space than is available within the limits of this book to deal adequately with them. Such references as I have made are only the passing comments of the climber, and not, in any way, the studied dissections of the scientist. But there is one matter partly of historic and partly of scientific interest, the facts of which may very well be placed on record here. It relates to an experiment in acclimatization that is, I believe, unique in the history of the world. I had often thought about the introduction of Chamos to the Southern Alps, but the difficulties of capturing a sufficient number and of transporting them from the heart of Europe halfway round the Wald and through the tropic sea seemed so great as to make the experiment almost impossible of achievement. But some few years ago, when my friend Contredemriel Ritter Ludwig von Hannel, then an honorary aide de Peck on the staff of the Emperor of Austria and King of Hungary, himself a famous Tomos hunter, was in New Zealand, we talked the matter over. Hanel then said to me that if he could bet some of the curious New Zealand birds, such as the kiwi, the weka, the kakapo, and the key for his majesty's zoological gardens at Schönbrunn, he believed that the emperor, in return, would send out some chamos for the New Zealand Alps. This was too good a chance to be missed. And I told him that, so far as the New Zealand government was concerned, I felt sure that our side of the project was already as good as arranged. Von Hannel replied that he could not, of course, speak for the emperor, but he would do his best to persuade him. Without more ado, I took my friend along and introduced him to Mr. Ling. Oh, one, then the head of the tourist department, and he, being keenly interested in acclimatization matters and also a sportsman, promptly fell in with the idea, which was also readily taken up and sanctioned by Sir Joseph Ward, at that time the minister in charge of the tourist department. In due course the birds were sent to Austria, and eight chamos were forwarded to New Zealand via London in 1907. The chamos arrived in New Zealand on March 14th of the same year. They received the utmost attention on the voyage, and stood the journey very well. I went to see them on the arrival of the steamer, and they appeared to be in fine condition. Afterwards they were sent by steamer and train and wagon to Mount Cook and liberated in their new home in the Southern Alps. A few years ago some of them were seen, by one of the guides, with young at foot. Mother Day, while in Vienna, I paid a visit to Schönbrunn, and looked for the New Zealand birds. I found that all but one had died. He was a sedate and venerable keek, and very set he looked, confined, as he was, in an ordinary parrot cage. I said a few words to him in his own key language, and he cocked his head knowingly on one side and eyed me curiously as if he had heard the sounds before but had almost forgotten them. For his own part, he seemed to have lost the power of speech in key language, 
I have no doubt in the years gone by he was one of the young bloods of Kiel and who used to come home with the milk and drouse us from our peaceful slumbers in the mountain hut on the great Asmund glacier, and that I myself had hold both stones and imprecations at his was likely head. But now I felt said at heart when I saw him cribbed, cabined, and confined in his little cage. It seemed as if his death after all would be laid at my door and I longed to take him back with me to his friends and relatives in his home in the southern Alps. But with the Chamos it is different. They have a new home more glorious than their old one. And for years to come they must be protected from the gun of the hunter. In these southern Alpine solitudes they can multiply and thrive in the land of the bird for which they were exchanged. While he poor fellow pines in his foreign cage, the capturing of these chamos for new zeal and resulted in the destruction of many others which in their wild flight from their walled captors dashed themselves to death over the precipices of their rocky fastnesses while others were maimed there was therefore an outcry in austria against their capture through the persistent efforts of the admiral however the experiment is to be repeated this year on a small scale I had the good fortune to meet him again in the end of the other day, and he was quite keen about it. There being now, of course, a necessity for a change of blood if the experiment is to be quite a success. New Zealand owes to the Emperor Franz Joseph and Terry or Mordenal von Honolitz best thanks for their efforts in connection with this novel essay. The mountain system of New Zealand is as varied as it is interesting. In the North Island there is a series of volcanic mountains as fascinating, almost, as are the Southern Alps. How the fire came to New Zealand is told in Maori legend. The Maoris themselves looked upon the higher volcanic mountains with superstitious awe, and they considered them toppled, or sacred. No white man, and certainly no Maori, dared set foot upon them, and the fact that they were toppled prevented, for a long time, the obtaining of scientific knowledge regarding their craters and their summit configuration generally, their origin was attributed to a famous Faringa, or high priest, who piloted one of the canoes of the early migrants from Hawaii, the fabled home of the Maori people. This man, with another high chief, took possession of all the country between the Bay of Plenty and Mount Rufu, in order to assure fruitful years these two ascended the neighboring volcano of Gornohau and set up an altar to make the necessary incantations. The cold then, as now, was very bitter, for the winds blow keen from the adjacent snows, and it seemed as if the old Fuenga would die, when happily the thought occurred to him of sending for some of the sacred fire that was in the keeping of one of his sisters in Farwa, Hawaii. She straightway came with the fire, Wherever she halted in her underground travels, their fire remained, and where she came to the surface to breathe, there appeared boiling pools and geysers. Thus there was a trail of fire and boiling pools all along her route from White Island, down through all the Fermal region to Gornuhau and Ruafu. The fire revived the old man. If, in commemoration of the event, he left it burning in Gornuhau, as a sacrifice to the gods he cast his slave wife down the crater, and the mountain has ever afterwards been called by her name. The legend is picturesque, but in satisfying. Years afterwards a famous chief called Tihu he was killed in a great landslip upon the shores of Lake Turpo. His body was being taken to burial on the sacred mountain, when a terrific thunderstorm, or an eruption, came on, and the bearers, hastily depositing their burden in a cave, turned and fled. This made the mountain still more sacred, and the early scientists dared not attempt to explore the range. Both Hochstetter and Diefenbach must have been greatly disappointed that they were not allowed to set foot upon these sacred mountains, because then, as now, Gornohai was the real center of volcanic energy in New Zealand. Illustration. Rufu from Gornohai. It is... However, the Fermal region in the vicinity of lakes Rotorua, Rotomadana, Torwera, and Topau that is best known to the great majority of New Zealanders and to the sightseers, oh, from all parts of the civilized world. 
flock to this truly wonderful region. All the thermal phenomena possible seem to have been plentifully distributed throughout this territory. The crowning glory of it all was the pink and white terraces. But these, alas, are no more. For on June 10th, 1896, they were either blown to bits or buried in the rain of mud and scoria that came from the eruption of Tarawera, and made the beautiful surrounding country a desolate wilderness. The story of that eruption with its loss of life, both Maori and European, has often been told, and there is no need to repeat it here. Nature is gradually recklessing the scarred hillsides, and even the bruised and wounded trees have been healed by the hand of time. The tourist wanders through the land just as he did before the eruption, and the birds and the fish killed or starved to death, as a result of the rain of mud and stones and fiery bombs, have been replaced by others of their kind. In this particular part of the Fermal region the main center of activity remained at the site of the old terraces. But during later years it seems to have shifted to the region of the famous but short-lived Wayming geyser. This huge geyser threw a column of boiling water, steam, loved, and stones considerably over a thousand feet in air. On August 1903 the geyser was the scene of a terrible tragedy, an unusually severe eruption resulting in the death of two young girls, another visitor, and the guide, Joe Warbrick. The party had gone rather close in order to get a photograph. The eruption suddenly became terrific, and a great column of boiling water, shooting out at an angle, swept them off the hill into the overflow from the geyser. They were carried down in boiling water for nearly a mile towards Lake Rotomadana. The bodies were recovered shortly afterwards. Within the last few years, Wayming has become quiescent. But there is still great activity nearby at a spot that has been aptly named Freifinken Flat. There is much thermal activity to on what is supposed to be the site of the old pink terraces. The completion of the North File and Main Trunk Railway has now brought the volcanoes within easy reach both of Wellington and Auckland. And year by year, a few, Gornhout, and the Tangariro Range are becoming favored playgrounds for the more energetic class of Holiday Merkazing. Gorno How is apparently entering upon a period of renewed activity, and within the last four or five years there have been some fine volcanic displays from its crater. It is a perfect volcanic cone, 7,515 feet high, and terminates the Tongariro mountain range to the southward a range that has, within comparatively recent times, been the scene of tremendous volcanic energy, the desolate nature of the country on the eastern side of the mountain, and the vast extinct craters of the range itself, are now silent witnesses of the fiery activity of bygone ages. There are still several centers of great thermal energy on the Tangriro range. At the lower and northern end, Timori and Ketatai are in a state of almost perpetual turmoil, and clouds of steam rising from their seafing cauldrons are visible many miles away. The red crater, near the middle of the range, is still hot in places, and jets of steam hiss through small vents in the gloriously tinted rocks of its sides. At the extreme southern end of the range is the active volcano of Gorner High. In wintertime its slopes are clothed in snow and ice. Occasionally, four days at a time, it sends a vast column of steam fully three thousand feet in the air, and then it is a magnificent sight. At the period of greatest activity the scene must have been almost beyond description. Born a high was then, indeed, a Helen chained, a New Zealand Popemer. Mm -hmm. M. Roshis graphically depicted such a scene as may well have been witnessed by the original inhabitants of Moreland though or Vassal Peaks thy smoky banners spread, splashed with red flame as ever on they sped in serried ranks, squired by the lesser hills to purple realms of mystery. The day failed of her sun when thy red furnace flamed, and night was all aglow when earthquakes played beneath thy heaving breast of startled snows. About two years ago a geologist saw of in the prater. If, later still, when the mountain was particularly active, a glow as from molten lava appeared in the sky. It would not be at all surprising if at any time there were an eruption on a grand scale. 
Fortunately, the surrounding country is so unproductive as to be but sparsely settled, and therefore a serious eruption would be more spectacular than destructive. The southern Alps extend in a series of ranges from the north to the extreme south of the Middle Island. In the south, the ranges, which run in different directions, are intersected by the splendid fires on the one side and by the arms of the long, deep lakes on the other. The mountain masses, in some places, come sheer down to the water's edge, and their bases are far below the level of the lakes or of the sea. Many of their lower slopes are densely wooded, while their summits are capped with perpetual snow and ice. In the region of Milford Sound they rise steeply from the water's edge, and their solid and sometimes smooth granite walls seem uninviting to the foot of the climber. Going farther north we have another fine series of mountains in the region of lakes Wakatapi and Wanaka. Dundite high, as heights go in the European Alps or in the Himalaya. They are imposing mountains. It is only within comparatively recent years that passes have been discovered between the lakes and the sounds, and although these passes do not lead the traveler beyond the Sioux Plain heights, they take him through scenery that is no less remarkable for its beauty than for its grandeur fitting introduction to those greater marvels in the heart of the southern Alps. Northwards, from Mount Aspiring, which is at the head of this jumble of southern mountains that spreads itself through Firedland and Lakeland, the southern Alps proper extend in an almost unbroken chain along the western side of the middle island of New Zealand to where Mount Cook, or Ronby, rears his snow crowd ridge above the grim precipices and flanking glaciers, if dominating the landscape, gives an outlook from sea to sea. Here we are amongst the monarchs of the range, and the views are indescribably grand. There is a glorious alpine panorama stretching north and south. If, though all the highest mountains have been climbed, there are hundreds and hundreds of untrodden peaks and passes still awaiting the foot of the climber, Illustration, Crater of Gorner Howe, traveling over the level lands in the southbound train from Christchurch on a summer's day, one sees wheat fentif and golden in the sun, the gray-green of oxenir, the darker green of weltled root crops, interspersed with clumps and lines of English and Australian trees, making relieving splashes of color against the purple haze of the foothills, and indicating a fertile soul. At intervals we rumble over the long bridge of Sumsnoft River, with its great shingle flats and islands, and its opalescent water forming many interlacing streams, and we realize that the work done in the giant laboratory of the Frost King, in the heart of the Alps, is here finding its full fruition. We know also that the planing glacier, the roading torrent, and the crumbling moraine are still at work. They are the mills of the gods slowly grinding, and though they grind exceedingly small, they have made, in time, through the agency of these great snowft rivers, a land that is of a verity flowing with milk and honeyal, and that is already the granary of the islands. Thus the southern Alps have an important bearing upon the economic possibilities of the country. Their never-failing rivers, by means of irrigation, will make possible a still more intense cultivation on the plains of Canterbury and Otalo. But beyond all this there are possibilities almost under a in the enormous power from lake and river now running to waste. In short, the southern Alps may one day make New Zealand not only the playground of Australasia, but its manufactory as well. A return recently compiled, giving the more important available water powers in both islands, shows an average of three. 817, 180 horsepower and 2, 850 or 470 kilowatts. A considerable number of these powers are suitable for general industrial development, but the largest ones, being mainly in then settled portions of the Middle Island and near the deep water sounds, are particularly suitable for utilization in connection with ilkotrichomically or electric militoc industries. Finally, the southern Alps must not be despised from the tourist point of view. They already bring many visitors to New Zealand from all parts of the world, and in years to come.
when toward Australia and the sweltering Pacific number their population by many millions. This splendid mountain chain, both in summer and in winter, will have become the playground of the new nations under the Southern Cross. But apart altogether from the physical aspect and the economic aspect, a splendid alpine chain, such as forms the backbone of the Middle Island of New Zealand, is almost certain to have some influence upon the character and physique of the nation, and more especially upon the character and physique of a nation endowed with those qualities of hardihood and adventure that are such predominant features of the Anglo-Saxon race. In an interesting article on mountaineering as a sport for soldiers, published in the Times in 1907, the writer M. M. S. Amir pointed out that there can be few better tests of the essential qualities of leadership than a really critical moment on a mountain. The man who can retain his judgment and confidence, and keep up the spirits of his party, when the way has already been lost, when all the rocks are coated with new verglas, when fingers are numb with cold, and when the guides begin to lose their heads and jabber furiously in incomprehensible potoshes, the man who in warfare is no less certain to keep his nerve and sustain his subordinates when casualties are heaviest, and the hope of support faintest. Where there are mountains and where there are British people, there will, of a surety, be climbing, and the sport develops character and brings out qualities that are of first importance in the affairs of everyday life as well as in warfare. From this point of view, therefore, as well as from the others mentioned, New Zealand has a valuable asset in her mountains. It is an asset, though, that is already being developed to some purpose. The splendid mountain chain that forms the backbone of the Middle Island was, during the early period of colonization, a terra incognita to all but a few New Zealanders. And it is only within recent years that the sons of those bold pioneers who traveled over so many leagues of ocean to build themselves new homes and to lay the foundation of a new and sturdy nation have ventured into the heart of the southern naps to wrest the secrets of the higher snows. The age of conquest has been long delayed. But once started, the conquerors have marched to victory with even greater vigour than did their forefathers in the European Alps. It took some little time to gain the necessary experience, for the Antipodan climbers had not only to learn the craft and taught by others, but they had to be their own guides, their own stepped efforts, and even their own porters. With the first taste of victory came the lust for other conquests, if one by one. The great peaks have fallen. Till now there is not one first school's mountain left on Canarct, and already traverses and new routes up old peaks are becoming the fashion. Though the New Zealanders have won for themselves many of the higher summits, there are a number that have fallen before climbers from the motherland. The New Zealanders, however, did their work without assistance. And it says much for the courage, for the endurance, and for the resource of the race that the sons of the pioneers have accomplished this remarkable record without a single fatal accident, and indeed without serious misadventure of any kind, to an Englishman, and a member of the Alpine Club, the Rev. William Spotswood Green, belongs the credit of having initiated Alpine climbing in this the farthermost part of our outer empire, it was his work in the southern Alps that fired the imagination of that hardy band of young colonial pioneers who, like their forefathers in the Alps of Switzerland, were destined to lead the way in Alpine conquest. Green came with two experienced Swiss climbers, Emil Boss and Dulrich Kaufman, and though he was not successful in reaching the actual summit of Mount Cook, he very nearly got there. The story of his adventures is simply and graphically told in his book, which must ever remain a classic in New Zealand mountaineering literature. Mr. Green had many difficulties to contend against before he got to Mount Cook. To begin with, his wagona came to grief in that Esmond and was swept bodily down the river. Birch Hill Station was then the last human habitation on the way to the glacier world and it took a long time before a camp could be established at the foot of the spur where now stands the ball hut. The attempt to climb the mountain by the main or eat failed, 
the party got on to a narrow reed along which they came to the first rock tooth of tottering splintered slate which was climbed with great difficulty and danger the ridge connecting this with the next spike was so loose that it trembled beneath their feet and made further climbing madness an attempt by way of the eastern face of the mountain also failed the warmth of the sunshine caused many avalanches one of which nearly buried the party a route by way of the great plateau and the linda glacier was however discovered on march first the party spent the night on the spur near the bivouac rock subsequently so much used by the new zealanders they started next morning on their historic climb via the linda glacier and after some difficulties they found themselves close to the foot of the reed connecting mount cook with mount tasman as the party advanced along their route many avalanches fell from mount tasman a halt was made for breakfast and some of the impediments deposited the crevices were numerous and but for the fresh snow would have bored the way three hours work brought them to the head of the glacier after which they turned to the left f crossing the reet reached tanice field color to gain which they had to do some severe step duft here the real work began and the first and last view was got of the western sea after climbing up the color they reached a wall of ice and decided after a council of war to try to cross the color which at first had been rejected as too dangerous the setting of the sun lessened the risk if, though it was an anxious time the opposite side was reached in safety after all the rocks were inaccessible and the party had to climb through a notch and thus reach an ice lips beyond down which swept a stream of detached ice if, as it was falling and getting late in the afternoon the question of advancing was discussed but as the bivouac could not be gained before dark and what was presumed to be only an hour's work lay before the party it was decided to go on keeping close to the rocks an icicle berkshrand was reached but avoided by a detour to the left and at six b m mr green best and kaufman stepped on to the crest of orondi this was they thought too late an hour to permit of their going on to the actual summit as there were no rocks at hand no cairn could be built and they were forced to retreat leaving no record of their ascent until the rocks were reached they had to descend backwards with faces to the ice beneath one or two fragments of rock were placed mr green's handkerchief and kaufman's matchbox with great difficulty and some danger they lowered themselves down the lower end of the ice lips and as they crossed the couloir to the opposite rocks night closed in in a little time the moon rose enabling the three men to find a partial shelter beneath the rock ridge on a little ledge less than two feet wide and sloping outward and there they spent the nine hours of darkness stamping to keep up the circulation and talking and singing to drive away sleep which would have been fatal to them every quarter of an hour an avalanche trembled there being a warm northwest wind which probably saved them from being frostbitten at time thirty the descent was recommenced and the snow was found to be very soft one crevice being almost impassable the plateau was completely changed in aspect by an immense avalanche but they found the knapsack where it had been left and enjoyed its contents although the bread was twenty days old for they had been twenty two hours without food in the serics they found their track obliterated one avalanche having covered an area of two hundred acres and filled up a large crevice while they were crossing the great plateau a grand avalanche fell from the dasmin cliffs with a deafening crash at one p m the bivouac was reached and a welcome cup of tea and half an hour's rest endured then they returned to their camp at the Bull Glacier in the Tasman Valley. Illustration Peter Graham. Illustration Kaufman. Green. Best. Long before Mr. Green's visit, the early pioneers had done considerable preliminary exploratory and geological work. Though they did no serious alpine climbing, many of these, 
including Drive, Von Hast, have now passed away, as an indication of the dangers these pioneers had to face. It may be mentioned that out of quite a small band, Mr. Howitt lost his life in late Brunner in 1860, and Mr. Loon Dobson was murdered on the west coast in 1860. Drive Sinclair was drowned in one of the branches of the Rangi Tata River. He was buried at a place called Mesopotamia. In the words of his friend, Drive von Hast, near the banks of the river just where it emerges from the Alps, with their perpetual snowfields glistening in the sun, amidst Veronicus, Sinisaros, and covered with Salmesias and Gentians. There lies his lonely grave. Illustration. Thack Clark, following in Mr. Green's footsteps came the Canterbury climbers. They tried mud cut by Green's route. Above, like him, they failed, though on one occasion Messrs. Mannering and Dixon made a heroic effort and got within about a couple of hundred feet of the summit. The season of 1890 for Shenty will ever be memorable in the annals of New Zealand mountaineering, for that was the season in which the first of the great peaks fell. On March 7, 1895, Fife, by himself, made the first ascent of that splendid rock peak Malt Brun 10, 248 feet, with Jack Clark and Drive. Friends prone caricaturist from Germany, he climbed Mount Darwin 9,700 feet, and with George Graham he ascended Mount de la Beck 10, 40 feet in the foot till 9,074 feet. It was a fine performance for the young New Zealanders, who had by this time acquired not only the craft of climbing, but also of root fiendus. Meantime there had been no further serious attempt upon Mount Cook, but Tully in the season 189 of Ertifting the New Zealanders were again at work. If, on Christmas Day 189 Whiffer, succeeded in making the first ascent of Mount Cook, their struggles, under adverse circumstances, and their final success, are dealt with in another part of this book. That same season, Mr. Oat at Fitzgerald, a member of the English Chopin Club, arrived with the famous guide Zerbegrin to climb Mount Cook and other peaks. The visitors spent some time in Christchurch, and on their way to the theatre of operations they met the victorious New Zealanders returning from their conquest. Fitzgerald, however, continued his expedition, and did some remarkably fine work, including the first ascents of Mount Tasman 11, 406 dispin feet, Mount Sefton 10, 350 feet, Mount Hadinger 10, 6 trike feet, and Mount Seely 8,615 feet. To Mr. Fitzgerald also belongs the honor of having discovered an easy pass from the vicinity of Mount Cook to the west coast, a pass that others had been seeking for some time but had failed to fend. There was no further serious climbing for a few years, until Mr. Lee mm. so Fife and the writer made the first ascent of the minaret sten, fifty-eight feet, an ascent of Hadinger by the eastern face, and the first pass between the head of the Great Hesmond Glacier and the west coast. In 1905 our party made the first traverse of Mount Cook. About the same time the west coast climbers drive, Teichelman and the Rev. Mr. Eugen, with Mr. R. S. Moth, a Scottish climber, and Guy Vallex, Brain, came into prominence. They commenced a series of ascents from the western side of the range, on which the scenery is more varied and even more imposing than it is on the eastern side. They made the first ascent of Street, David's Dome 10, 410 feet, and made a new high pass over the main divide to the Tasman. Some fine work was also accomplished that season by Mr. Agent. Sillam, in company with the New Zealand guides Clark and Graham, he ascended Mount Cooked, Malt Brunt, the Footstool, and Seely, and succeeded in making the first ascent of LED Beaumont 10, 200 feet in the southern peak of Mount Cook 11, 840 for feet, in 1907 drive, Teichelman and the Rev, 
Mr. Reuven, with Alex Brain, made the first ascent of Mount Douglas 10, 107 feet and of Taurus Peak 10, 570 feet, Mance Hast, Landefend, Conway, and Glacier Peak all over 10, zero feet also fell to them. There were no high ascents made in 1908, but in the 1909 season the guides were kept busy. Mr. Clove Mondold, a member of the Alpine Club, made the first traverse of Malt Brun 10, 420 on feet, and Mr. M. M. O. Also a member of the Alpine Club, with three guides, ascended Mount Cook by a new route from the Hooper Valley. The climb was mostly on good rocks, and is probably the easiest and shortest way to the summit of the mountain. Several first ascents of Second Sol's peaks were made in 1909 in Captain Head, an Englishman, with guides J. Clark and a brain, made the first ascent of Mount Aspiring, F. in company with Mr. M. M. All in the same guides. Mount Sefton was ascended for the first time from the western side. No resume of the work done in the Southern Alps would be complete without reference to the magnificent survey work and the measurements of glacier flow made by Mr. Mm. M. Brobrick, so out of the New Zealand Survey Department. Mummery in his delightful book about his climbs in the Alps and Caucasus says, humorously, that a mountain pass is through three phases, an inaccessible peak, the most difficult climb in the Alps, and an easy day for a lady. His classification has been proved true in regard to the New Zealand as well as the European Alps, and Mount Cook, which baffled Green and his Swiss experts and the early New Zealand climbers, has now been climbed by two women. Mr. Four, a civil gull, in 1911 made the ascent by the Hooker Rock Route in company with the two guides Peter and Alex Brain, while Mrs. Linden, an Englishwoman resident in Australia, a year later, with Peter Graham and D. Thompson, made the ascent of Mount Cook by Green's more difficult route. The conditions for both ascents were perfect. Miss Dufour has also climbed Mount Esmond 11, 475 feet, Mount Dampier 11, 323 feet to First Ascent and several other peaks. This season 1912 a Tarrant, in company with Graham and Thompson. She has succeeded in making a traverse of the three peaks of Mount Cook from a high bivouac on the Hucker side to the bivouac on that Asmund side a remarkable feat. On this trip the climbers were favored with glorious weather, and the conditions were also good. Otherwise the climb would have been almost hopeless. The writer has looked down the long icy knife edge that, with its bends and steep slopes and cornices, journs the three peaks together, and has realized the almost insuperable difficulties in the way of success, except under ideal conditions. All Hunter, Ned, to the two New Zealand guides and the young Australian girl who have accomplished such a daring feat. In connection with this brief historical resume of mountain climbing in New Zealand and looking back over this series of victories, one without a single fatal accident, it remains only to pay a tribute and it must be a very high tribute to the members of the Alpine Club, whose precept and example we have so closely followed. When I first started climbing, the Rev. Mr. Green sent me an ice case and an article on the death roll of the Alps. What two more appropriate things could he have forwarded to an amateur anxious to learn the craft in a four country ass till have that axia treasured possession? But I have long ago lost the article, and it occurs to me but that by the reader of these pages it may be laid to our charge that in some of our expeditions we did not err on the side of timidity. My answer to that will be that we were always, or nearly always, doing pioneer work, and so had to discover the dangers as well as the routes, and that, generally, when the weather failed, when the avalanches began to hiss down the slopes or crash from the cliffs, or when the rocks began to fall, we either waited or turned tail and fled. But, in any case, the most critical would, surely, 
not have had us run no risks at all. He is a poor soul, and there can be no pride of race in him where we'll shoe call danger. Two years ago it was my privilege at the invitation of my friend Lordless Nodno give a lecture at Government House. Wellington, before a famous historian and ambassador who is one of a long line of distinguished presidents of our club, F at the close of the lecture, had one of those charming speeches which he so easily mechesmesipes the necessity for the caution that I myself had been preaching. But afterwards, at supper, his wife came to me and said, I like my husband's preaching to you about caution white. When he climbed Ararat, his only companion was his ass case, but she said it with a smile, and with what I judged to be a feeling more of pride than of reproach, so you see this fondness for a spice of danger is in the blood, and cannot be altogether eliminated in the old country any more than in the new. And I will even go the length of saying that it will be a sorry day for the race when it is no longer a feature of British character. Mount Cook has now been climbed by four routes. It has been traversed from east to west over the highest summit, and along the ridge from south to north, the first ascent was made by New Zealanders who had never seen a guide at work, and all the other ascents but one have been made with guides who have learned their craft. Untaught by others, in their native land, all the high peaks have now been climbed, with or without guides, Zerbegrin being the only foreign guide who has ever stood on the summit of a New Zealand alp. And during all these years there has been no fatal accident to mar the tale of success, but what of the future it is scarcely to be expected that this immunity from accident will continue indefinitely. There may come a day when some climber, caught in bad weather, or endeavoring to achieve the impossible by some new and more daring route, will meet his fate on the higher snows, or leave his bones among the beetling crags of the great precipices. One can only express the hope that such a day may be long delayed, and that, for many years to come, the steep white slopes, the grim precipices, and the towering peaks will continue as a health-giving playground, and resound with the laughter born of the fun and frolic of the hardy mountaineer. And whatever the future history of these mountains may be, it can scarcely provide a tale of more absorbing interest than is furnished by the manly struggles of the pioneers who have climbed, with some fair measure of success, in a far country, Chapter E in the olden days the bed was made. The room was fit. By punctual leave the stars were lit. There was still. The water ran. No need was there for made or man. When we put up, my wife and I, at God's great caravanserini, from an old place lately altered, from the shoulder of the Hoxtetter dome down a long valley between the giant snow peaks of the Mount Cook range on the one hand, and the rocky buttresses of the Molt Brun and Liebe Granges on another, swollen at intervals by tributary asrines, flowing with imperceptible movement, comes the great Tasman Glacier, a veritable Mare de Glacier, ten miles in length. Some six miles from its terminal face, the Ball Glacier descends from the southeastern shoulder of Orangi, and pours its huge slabs of broken ice and a rubble of moraine into the parent stream. At the foot of this glacier, in a hollow between the moraine of the Tasman and the long southern arete of Mount Cook. The Rev. William Spotswood Green, with a meal boss in Dulwich Kaufman, pitched his fifth camp on the occasion of his memorable expedition in 1880 Thither, a somewhat young and inexperienced mountaineer, in company with his wife, wended his way a few years later. The proposed adventure caused much critical comment in the family circle and among our friends. Some said we were mad. Others envied us. Those were the delightful days of pioneering, when the mountains were a sealed book to all but a few faithful worshippers, and when adventures came, freely and fully. Without the seeking, there were no motor cars to run you up in a day from the confounds of civilization. There were no weltered sent tracks up the valleys. The turbulent rivers were unbridged. Guides were a genus altogether unknown. If, at the end of the long day's journey, there was no sheltering hut under which you could rest your weary limbs. You were your own guide, your own porter, 
your own tent put here, and your own cooked. There were days in which we accomplished little in the matter of real climbing, but there were days in which the blood was strong and hope flew ahead on swift wings days that are now gone, alas, never to return. Previous to our visit, no Englishwoman had ever attempted this journey. To a fourth ignore of Omland and Fendable, the hunter of being the first woman to traverse the great Esmond Glacier. Frye Lendefend, however, was a good mountaineer, and it is given to few women to do such pioneering as she did in the southern Alps. We were mere amateurs at the Dane. Still, we were not to be daunted by the croakings of friends who prophesied that our bones would soon be bleaching on the glaciers. Accordingly, after a good deal of correspondence, much planning and provisioning, and considerable consulting of maps and photographs, we started on our eventful journey. After a day in the train, we found ourselves at Fairley Creek. Next morning, having had an early breakfast, we were bawling along a good gravel road, behind four spanking greys, well driven, on our way to Mount Kick. Lunch at Lake de Caparana come summer's day, after hours of coaching. Was a delightful experience. Afterwards, with your pipe alight, you stepped out into the hotel garden. If a few paces in front of you, lapping a rocky shore, were the beautiful turquoise serene waters of the lake, reflecting the clouds in the mountains. Here horses were changed, and we started off again on our long journey through the dreary yellow tussock wastes of the Mackenzie Plains. Lake Pukaki was our Hilton Pass for the night. At sunset we sighted its waters, far up the valley, rising from the Tasman Flats, towered the great mass of Mount Cook, its final peak gleaming in the sunlight, and its snows reflected in the lake at our feather distinctly, and yonder more faintly, as the distant waters were ruffled by a passing breeze, after some time spent in a futile endeavor to get the dust out of our clothes and our rise and our rears, we dined on the rough fare of the country. No delicate viands here, only the oily mutton stuff. Fred, think of it. He later day disciples of Lucullus in Greece that boasted aloud of a long acquaintanceship with the pan and for drink you had your choice of the everlasting boil tea with all the tannin in it, of a cloudy and somewhat sour-trasty jail, or of an indifferent whiskey. I know there are Scotsmen who maintain that there may be good whiskey, and better whiskey, and better whiskey still, though there can be no such thing as bad whiskey. But such enthusiastic patriotism as this could never have extended to a backblick's New Zealand in in the days when we first went to punering. We had one dilapidation. Yet, truth to tell, we were uncertain whether it was stale strawberry or moldy gooseberry. My wife, after a microscopic examination, announced that it was raspberry made from turnips a diligent cross-examination of the hand medania. In the intervals of conversation with the coke driver in the kitchen, fairly hold the viands that you solicited the statement that it was gooseberry. She was rather unused when doubts were expressed as to her veracity, and we mildly suggested that it might be pineapple. No, she was confident it was gooseberry. How did she know? Sure, she saw it on the label. And if we didn't believe her, we could go into the back hoard, where she had thrown the tint, and see for ourselves an afterglow on Mount Cook, the glorious coloring of which was mirrored in the lake. Was some atonement for the want of delicacy in the viands, we were royally on the road again next morning, crossing the Pukaki River on a ferry boat, worked by the coint. We drove over the Tososki Downs of Roboro Station and entered what appeared to be the bed of an old river that had no doubt, at some distant date, cut its way through this ancient lateral moraine, when the glacier of the Tasman Valley was three or four times its present size. The road followed an old bulladrake track, through which moronic boulders reared their hard heads, and not altogether in vain. Once, on this very road, a thoughtful traveller, sorely bruised and battered after some miles of jolting, stopped the coach and got down to examine the wheels. The driver, a little puzzled, asked what was the matter, and received the laconic reply. Oat, 
deafing. I merely wished to see if your wheels were square. For the first mile or two we thought this story a joke. After a few more miles, we began to think there might be some truth in it. If, finally, we too found ourselves dubiously examining the wheels. It is all very well when you are nicely wedged in between a couple of really stout passengers. But when you have an angular tourist on your right and an iron railing bounding your hip jitten on the left, the wold seems a very grey wold indeed, and even scenery ceases to excite. On this particular day, however, our driver added to the excitement of the ride in very material degree. He had that morning received what is known in these parts as the sack. In other words, he had lost his job, and he had not taken the announcement with quite the grace of a Spanish grandee. He confided to us with many ejectus fave more forcible than politite he was out for a picnic, and he did not care if he killed a tourist or two. His main object in life now appeared to be to get to his destination pieces, if necessary ten hour before the proper time, and at one stage it seemed as if he might really kill a passenger, or, at least, a horse, in the accomplishment of this quite necessary feat. The crackings of his long whip were accompanied by a variety of herbs, and other comments, of a staccato but emphatic nature. The height of his enjoyment appeared to be reached on a steep incline leading towards the lake. Down this we rattled, over stones and around sharp herbs, at a pace that would have done credit to Yuba Bell, and we said never a word, but held our breath in the iron railing of the trap. Hill, with a sigh of relief, we reached the bottom safely and breathed freely again. To do him justice, he did know how to handle his team. If, finally, our admiration for the fellow as a driver began to overshadow our contempt for him as a man and a humanitarian. During the next day's drive there was no hostelry at which we could obtain food and drink. So soon after twelve o'clock we halted and had an al fresco luncheon at a place known as the Dog's Grave. There was a little patch of scrub on the flat, where fuel was obtainable, and a clear stream running past supplied good water. Near at hand was the Dog's Grave, with a little tombstone, the hole enclosed with a stout wooden railing. The dog belonged to the survey camp established there some months previously, and his master, grieving over his untimely demise, gave him a decent funeral and a tombstone with an inscription on it the latter part of the journey was over a very rough road. But the splendid views ahead were some compensation for the jolting we received. Our Jetton, true to his promise, landed us at the Hermitage an hour ahead of contract time. This said, prettily situated at the foot of an old lateral moraine of the Mueller Glacier, has since seen many vicissitudes. Hill, finally, it passed into the hands of the government. It is now about to be pulled down, and another building is being erected on a better sit and owned too soon either, because the bursting of the glacier water through the old moraine has flooded the rooms, and caused damage such as to make the situation quite unsafe, Next day the fine weather with which we had been favoured broke. High up in the heavens the storm clouds were being driven before the southwest wind, while a lower current from the northwest was reffing the rain clouds around the highest peaks of Orangi and Mount Sefton. It was a battle between the two winds, but at last the northwester triumphed. A momentary glimpse was obtained of the highest peaks of Mount Cook and then the torn mists wound themselves about it and hid it from view for the rest of the day. The northwest wind struck us with great force. If, as we peered over the edge of the hill down on to the rock of our surface of the Mueller Glacier, we could scarce bear up against it. The temperature quickly fell to fiftatio degrees. Then the rain came on. By next morning the storm had abated, and the sun shone out. I engaged on shepherd named Annan, with a pack horse, if, after arranging tents, as cases, and provisions, we started to fix a camp some fourteen miles up the Tasman Valley. There was an anxious moment with the pack horse in crossing the Hooker River, now swollen with the recent rains. If, 
as the animal struggled with loose boulders and floating blocks of ice in midstream we were quite prepared to see the expedition come to a premature and ignominious end and in, however riding his own horse managed to pallet the pack-horse in safety to the farther shore while i got into a small wooden cage that dangled high above the roaring torrent and laboriously pulled myself over to the other side the pack-horse was taken as far as the terminal moraine of that esmond glacier beyond this it was impossible to proceed with the horses and the packs had now to be transferred to our own backs they looked indeed a goodly pile illustration the hermitage twenty five pound of biscuits twelve pound of tinned meats two loaves weighing fourteen pound four pound of oatmeal eight pound of butter four pound of jam one shoulder of mutton two pound of onions two pound of two one pound of coker one pound of coffee four pound of sugar one pound of salt fortins of sardines and a few pots of libid constituted the bulk of our provisions in addition to this there were the two tents three sleeping bags one opossum rug one large sheet of old calico two ice cases one alpenstock one hundred feet of alpine rope billies spirit lamp lantern anero thermometers and several other smaller articles which all went to make up weight before us was the long moraine of the great desmond glacier and over this for a distance of seven or eight miles all these articles had to be carried on our backs it was no joke we knew that the undertaking was rather a difficult one but had no idea how difficult it would be and in selected from among the articles a swag weighing about fifty pound i made up one that would be probably ten pound lighter f covering up the remainder with the oil pluff sheet at three o'clock we started off hoping to reach green's fifth camp that evening profiting by the experience of the rev mr green and bride von lendefend we made no attempt to get on to the clear ice in the middle of the glacier but kept to the rocks on the side of the lateral moraine that runs four miles parallel with the great southern arete of mount cook there was fair walking for some little distance till we passed the group of tarns of a peculiar greenish color at the end of the moraine then the rocks got rougher and were piled in wilder confusion as we proceeded of this same route mr green says the lateral moraine standing up like some great battlement shattered in the war of the titans was composed of huge cubes of sandstone and jagged slabs of slate some over twenty feet aside and ready at any moment to topple over and crush our limbs we found scrambling over these rocks very hard work on such a hot afternoon but made good progress and soon found ourselves at the blue lake where mr green weather out a very severe storm on his first trip up the tasman just before reaching the lake there was a bad bit of travelling through thick scrub which Ennen had not looked forward to with any great degree of pleasure but on reaching the spot we found that a large slip had come down from the moraine exposing the clear ice of the glacier and completely covering the scrub for a distance of about one hundred yards with moroenic accumulation the ice was quite near from which it would appear that there was more live moraine than rive von lendefend imagined the slip gave us fairly good walking but we had some difficulty in getting through the last bit of scrub at the blue lake beyond this we had to cross the debris of a great talus fan that came down from the mountain side and then we came to a piece of level ground between the moraine and the mountain side which afforded the only real bit of easy walking in the whole journey this flat about a quarter of a mile long was covered with large tussocks spear grass boronicus and a wealth of cell messies ahead the moraine continued its course in the words of mr green looking like some great railway embankment in the symmetry of its outline here we made our first acquaintance with that strange curious impudent 
and interesting bird the keed. A number flew down from the lower slopes of the great mountain ridge and regarded us with a wandering curiosity. I took the precaution to bag a brace as a welcome addition to our larder, but with some considerable measure of regret. For though in the surrounding districts the keys kill the sheep in the most cruel manner, they are nevertheless fascinating and handsome birds. Our tent was pitched that evening in a lonely spot between the moraine and the great shoulder of Mount Cook. Here clothed with an interesting variety of Sioux plain vegetation. For this purpose we used the tent poles and the survey chain left here by some of the early alpine explorers. We spent a cold night. A next day, while I returned to the hermitage for my wife, Annan swagged up the rest of the provisions. On the morning of Sunday, the first April, rather late in the season, a wife and I said goodbye to our friends at the hermitage and started on foot for our camp at the Bull Glacier. It was hard work pulling the two of us across the river in the cage, as the pull to the other side was an upward one. But, after much exertion, and many splinters in my hands from the rough manila rope, the other side was reached in safety. As we landed, two young fellows from the hermitage approached and beckoned us to send the cage back across the river to them. This did not exactly suit our book, as and the event of their taking the cage back with them, we should be stranded on the Tasman side. So we tied it securely to the post on our side of the river, and continued on our journey. But before we had gone very far, we were astonished to see one of the young fellows commencing to scramble across the river on the wire rope to get the cage, so that he might take his companion over. One could not help admiring his nerve and daring, but we were more concerned about our own fairing should he leave the cage on the wrong side of the river for us. However, we proceeded on our journey, if, after an hour's march, reached a deserted shepherd's hut, where we found Anne and with a billy of refreshing tea awaiting our arrival. The hut was rather an uninviting place, being dirty, and having no door nor window, in addition to which it was inhabited by rats, a short council of war was held, if, as it was early in the day, and the walk up that as moraine on the morrow was rather a big undertaking. We decided not to stay at the hut, but to proceed as far as we could, and sleep out in one of the hollows between the glacier and the mountain. Accordingly we started for a point two miles distant, at the edge of the glacier, where Annan and I had left part of our stores on the way up, Having adjusted our swags, we were soon on the march, scrambling over the boulders of the moraine. Our progress was slow, both Annan and myself having heavy swags, while my wife, though displaying great pluck, had not yet got used to the acrobatic feats necessary to the keeping of one's balance on the unstable boulders of the moraine. We had a particularly lively time of it in the scrub at the Blue Lake and my wife's jacket, which was tied to my swag, had been torn off, and was lost among the bushes. It was a sweltering hot day, but we told down, and towards evening reached the Silmesia clap, where Mr. Green had pitched his furred camp. My wife was by this time very tired, and so, while I gathered some sticks and made the tea, she sat on a rock craft in the possum rug, and then decided to go on to the camp and come down again to have breakfast with a surly next morning. We were now close to the ice, and after tea, as it began to get very cold, I set about to look for a good spot for our bivouac. A hundred yards farther on some scrubby totara bushes and a stunted alpine pine grew close into the glacier, and under the latter, after a hurried inspection, we decided to camp, its branches would be some protection against the wind, should it come on to blow, if, in the event of rain, they would also keep us fairly dry. Some branches were cut for a mattress, and over that we put tussock brass. On top of that we spread the waterproof sheet, and lying down on it with our clothes on, a course apudal the possum rug over us and sought a weller in repose. We both dozed off, but presently were awakened by a shrill scream. It was only the call of a key far up the mountain side, 
over the cold white snows on the shoulder of Mount Cook. One solitary clod hummed, fringed with the gold of the setting sun. Later the moon shone brilliantly through the clear frosty air, and the peaks became silhouettes against the horizon. A rock avalanche rattled down the side of the glacier. From across the narrow flat came the cry of the mountain parrot, and a weka that had crept close to our heads under the branches startled us with a loud screech. Then again all was silent as the tomb. Presently two other visitors made a friendly call upon us, two tiny ransomed little things, with hardly the vestige of tails. They perched on the branches just over our heads, so close that we could have ruffled their feathers with our breath. They hopped about front with two twig, speaking to us in their soft, lowbird voices. If, having studied dust from every point of the compass, they decided to give us up and went off to roost in a totara butch. At last we also went to sleep, if, making due allowance for the hardness of our couch and the strange surroundings, managed to get a fairly good night's rest. When we awoke in the morning the frost lay white on the bushes around us, save within a radius of a foot or two, where the heat from our bodies had melted it, or prevented it from forming. The temperature had fallen to twenty skies far. On the way up we took down a reading of eighty in the chate, so that there was thus a drop of no less than fifty or in a few hours I was a steer before sunrise, and on going back to the Blue Lake for water to bowl the billy the garrulous paradise ducks gave me a vituperative reception, while the solitary mountain duck quacked a milder remonstrance. A shot from my pistol made them think discretion the better part of Velu, and while the paradise ducks took wing the grey ducks scuttled off downstream in a great hurry. After a short search, I found my wife's jacket frozen hard to the bushes. If, filling my billy, returned to the flat. On the way up I gave a jodel that was answered by Anne and far up the moraine, and in a few minutes he had rejoined us. We break spated together, and shortly after nine, Ferdy were once more on the march, all the way up the valley we had been getting glorious glimpses of the Mount Cook chain, and the Lobeck, with its sharp peak and minarets of spotless snow, seemed to be ever beckoning us onward, towering in the distance above the dull grey line of the great moraine, gleaming gloriously in the sunshine of early morn, tinted with the soft rose of the afterglow, or looming coldly in the mystic moonlight. This mountain seemed ever beautiful in outline, majestic in form. Even the moraine was interesting, clothed as it was, in places, with a great variety of alpine plants, while structurally it was always something to marvel at. If night to swear it, it is, says Drive, von Lendefend, larger than the moraine saw in the European Alps, the cause being the slower action of the New Zealand glaciers, and the peculiarity of the rocks which surround them, there are very few places to be found where the rocks are so jointed as they are here. They are split along the different joints into polyhertic masses by freezing water. They fall on the glacier and are carried down the valley. Ceteris paribus. The slower the glacier moves, the more moraine will accumulate. Four miles no part of the glacier is visible through the moraine. The glacier does not block up the whole valley there being quite a large space between it and the mountain side, except in places where great talus fans come down from the quarries to meet the live moraine of the glacier. Far away on the right were the rocky peaks and hanging glaciers of the Liebig and Moltbrunn ranges, and in between them the Murchison Glacier, once a tributary of the Tasman, but now shrunken up its own valley for a considerable distance. On our left we passed a high waterfall, if, nearing a spot known as the Cove, came across a small iron stove a relic of the Lendefend expedition, abandoned Dolly in the journey as being, no doubt, a luxury too heavy to be carried over this rough ground. We had a rest at the Cove, and whiled away half an hour with a shooting match, in which my wife proved herself a good markswoman. A little further on we had luncheon ribbon and sardines, with a pannikin of tea again being the bill of fare. After this, 
there was some difficult scrambling over great rocks, many of which were so loose that we dare not put our weight on them for more than a second. We told on in the heat of the afternoon, and reached the camp at half past three o'clock. While I pitched the second tent, Anna and my wife set about the camp cookery, the latter making a glorious stew from mutton and onions, with a few other ingredients, that was twenty four years ago. But the memory of the feast remains with us still. No French chef ever made rag out that was welcome so eagerly, or that disappeared so quickly. That night we piled on all the clothes we cowled in addition to those we had on. We could hear the rocks rattling down the face of the glacier just opposite tower tent a couple of hundred yards distant, but King Frost held the glaciers themselves in his cold grip, and there were no avalanches after nightfall, being too tired to pay much attention to the screaming of the keys. We soon fell asleep. Chapter Ewe in the Golden Day Skinlist we walked in the Great Hall of Life, looking up and around reverential. Nothing was despicable was meaningful. Nothing was small, but as part of a whole whose beginning and end we knew not. Carnal, next morning, though the barometer had fallen ominously, Anna and I set out to climb the Hoxteter Dome. We told across the crumbling moraines of the Tasman, the Bull, and the Hoxteter glaciers, and gained the clear, hummocky ice of the latter only of the finest sites in the southern Alps. It issues forth from the great ice plateau at the foot of the higher precipices of Mount Cook, descending in a wonderful cascade of broken ice for over three thousand feet. It cuts into that asmen at an angle of about forty wood degrees. F. The two glaciers flowing onward and not pressing very closely together. There remains a deep chasm between them. After proceeding a few miles, we find that there are two series of crevices seen formed by the pressure of the Hochstetter glacier causing the ice on the western side to move faster than that portion of the glacier abutting on the Maltbrunner range, while another series is caused by the bending round of the main ice stream in a grand sweep between Maltbrunner and De La Beck, forming long crevices which run across the glacier on its convex side. The sun shone out brightly and the glare from the white ice was so dazzling that we had to keep on our goggles to avoid snow blindness. A little beyond the Hoxteter ice fall we halted to admire the view. Down the valley we could see the lower part of the Bull Glacier. Right in front lay the gleaming ice slopes and dark precipices of Orangi, tiring up and culminating in the Tenship Tridge eight thousand feet above us, and down from the Great Ice Plateau, between the southeastern spur of Mount Cook and that Esmond spur, the Hoxteter rice fall poured its beautifully colored cascade of broken ice. In spires and cubes and pinnacles, a wonderful sight till it joined the Tasman, on which we now stood. Every few minutes, great masses of ice were broken off with the superconnexumbent pressure, and went thundering down with loud roar over a precipice on the left. Half a mile further on was the Freshfield Glacier and over the bold rocky spawn which it rested appeared the nice cap of Mount Tasman. Then came the glorious mass of the Hosp Glacier, in sunshine and shadow, and beyond this again other glaciers and peaks in bewildering number and variety. The ruddy buttresses of the Molt Brun Range bounded the view across the glacier on the right. Words fail to do justice to a scene of such exquisite beauty and grandeur. I tried vainly, says the Rev. Mr. Green, to recall the view in Switzerland on the Great Helt Glacier in front of the Concordia hut to establish some standard for comparison. Then I tried the Gorner Glacier on the way to Monte Rosa. But the present scene so completely asserted its own grandeur that we all felt compelled to confess in that instant that it surpassed anything we had ever battled while we were gazing the clods increased, and a chill wine sprang up. The higher peaks were becoming obscured in the clouds. It was evident that a storm was brewing. It would have been madness to tackle the Hoxteter Dome. So we left our swags behind. F, taking only the ice cases and the rope, made a bolt for De La Beck to see what we could of the upper portion of the glacier. We made good progress over hummocky ice, and at last, when opposite De La Beck, attained a glimpse of the Lendefin saddle. 
a fine and named glacier coming from the shoulder of Mount Spencer I named the Forest Glacier, after my wife, oh, by her pluck and dendrons, had conquered all the difficulties that lay between us and the enjoyment of this scene of alpine grandeur. Then we took a last longing look at the glorious amphitheatre of mountains, if, turning our faces campward, beat a hasty retreat. It was a pleasant surprise to my wife to see us back in camp that afternoon, but I had better let her tell her own story. And the morning, she writes, I was wakened by an instantorium verse giving vent to a poetic and sentimental ditty, of which the following is the only verse he ever favored us with. There is the lion in his lair, and the north polar bear, and the birds in the greenwood tree, and the pretty little rabbits, so engaging in their habits who've all got a mate but me to judge from the boaster a steerfulness of the singer his lonely condition did not trouble him much. Backwards and forwards he went, preparing breakfast, and various ditties furnished amusement to us for at least half an hour. Our breakfast menu differed little from that of any other meal. I always taking biscuit in preference to a stratum from the predomite loaf poor Annan had carried up with many groans, and coffee or tea always forming an adjunct to the meal. Whatever it might be, after breakfast, my husband and Annan made preparations for their tramp onward up the glacier. This I had dreaded, for it meant leaving me for two nights and two days alone in the camp. Many a moan was made over me by my friends before we had started on our trip. One had suggested that I should certainly stay, in preference to stopping in the camp by myself. At the nearest station, the Tasman Glacier does not, however, abound in stations, the nearest human habitation being the Hermitage. Fourteen miles away I had long ago come to the conclusion that investment in land on the moraine would not be a paying concern. Another timid soul had placed before me the horrible position I should be in were a tramp to walk into the camp and surprise me. We were tramps ourselves, I reflected, and other people as adventurous or as mad some may consider the adjective synonymism were not likely to encounter. As regards burglars and fire I was safe, and in fact there was absolutely no danger. But, for all that, I had a very uncomfortable feeling as I watched my two protectors packing up their traps. Beyond our camp there was no timber of any kind, so they could light no fire, and unfortunately the spirits of wine had been left behind. They would therefore have to make the best of cold victuals while they were away, and console themselves with the cheerful prospect of hot coffee and zavaries too on their return to camp. Then again, as they had a difficult road to travel, they had to take as few impedimenta as possible, so they limited themselves as to provisions, and carried in addition only their sleeping bags and the alpine roke. At about ten o'clock we passed round the stirrups up in the shape of a steaming billy of tea, and off they started. After having made everything as snug as possible for me, I watched them walking along the moraine and scrambling to the top of the ridge. There they stepped, turned round, waved their caps, gave a hearty fear, to which I feebly responded as I watched them disappear over the edge. I was now alone, and a key from the cliff above screamed derisively at me as I stood for a moment gazing at the place where I had last seen my companions. Work I decided was the best remedy for loneliness, on the principle that Saturn in this case taking the shape of melancholage and some mischief still for idle hands to do, so I tiddied up the two tents, piled more wood on the fire, and sat down in the sunny doorway of our tent with my fancy work. I could hardly help smiling. So incongruous did fancy work seem with the wonderful scene around me, but for a time it took my foots off my position. Although my hands lay often idle in my lap while my eyes feasted on the surroundings, it was about eleven and sunshine was pouring down on the level where our tents were pitched, making the glossy green leaves of the mountain lilies glisten, and turning the Dasoski flat into a golden plain. In front stretched the grey moraine walt, and on the other side the spur of Mount Cook, clothed near its base with luxuriant vegetation. As I cast my eyes up its steep face I caught sight of a totara butch, 
whose tiny red turpent pitinter berries had been my joy in happy rowers. Up I mounted, very gingerly, to where the bush hung between two great grey rocks. But somehow the berries had lost their flavour, and I did not endure them. So I set me down on one of the big stones and ruminated on my position. Three days seemed a lifetime, but two nights and eternity in vain I remonstrated with myself and reflected how much worse it would have been had I been cast on a desert tile and where tigers and snakes prevailed. And I tried to recall all the cases of lonely chiprocked maidens I had read about, for consolatory purposes, but it was of little use. I knew quite well that there was absolutely nothing to fear, but it was the horrible loneliness and silence that oppressed me, added to the fears I felt for my companion's safety, should one slip happened. I felt the rope would be of little avail, for one would not be able to bear the weight of another, especially if it came with a sudden jerk. And I remembered the warnings against only to going on alpine expeditions. Altogether my reflections were of no enviable character as I sat high upon the cliff, looking down on our to white tents and blazing campfire, and across at the Moltbrun range, towering over the grey battlement looking very black against the blue sky, except where the white glacier seemed its rugged sides. When I got down to the level I took a lonely meal, and again sat down to work. By this time a slight breeze had sprung up, and some ominian soding clouds were banking up towards the north. But I thought little of that at first. Then the weather grew more threatening. Some rain drops fell. The wind flapped the sides of the tents, and blew the dead ashes of my campfire across the tussocks. I had not the heart to relight it. Had I the matches to waste over the attempt, I possessed but eleven, for one box had got wet, and our supply was very scant, so I determined to let it remain out. Stronger and stronger blew the wind, darker and darker grew the spy, and by this the head of the glacier was closed up with mist and cloud. Evidently a storm was brewing, and in the direction in which the adventurers were going, I knew a snowstorm might come on quite suddenly in these parts, and I was not versed in the mysteries of tent pignage. Awful thoughts of my husband's return to find my prostrate form under the collapsed tent came before my mind as I retired inside and coiled myself up in the rub. Some time after, I went out to take another look at the weather, and I was standing forlorn regazing round, when, to my delight, I heard a cheery yell from the ridge, and so two tiny black figures silhouetted against the grey sky. You may be sure I bustled around after echoing a welcome, and by the time the two travellers had reached the camp the perennial Stu and Billy of tea were ready to be injured. We also were glad to be back in camp. It was well be turned back. For that same night there came on a terrible storm. The wind rose from the northwest and blew with such force that we thought every moment the tents would be torn to ribbons. We strengthened them with the spare rope and put heavy stones all round the canvas on the ground outside. Hour after hour the gale roared furiously. Sleep was out of the question. High up the mountains, for we could hear the wind howling and tearing the alpine foliage in its fury. Then it would swoop down on our tent and send the sides flapping with reports like pistol shots. Again, it would cease for a moment, as if to cut breath, only to come swooping down on us with even greater vengeance. After what seemed a very long time, I looked at my watch and found that only two hours had gone by. The barometer still gave a very lower eddying, and it was evident that we were in for a bad time. Soon after midnight the rain came on and the force of the wind beat it through the tent. I rigged up a hood over my wife's head with my waterproof coat and the tin in which the biscuits were. Then, tying our caps down over our ears, we called up in the possum rug and once more tried to sleep. But the wind howled and the rain beat on the tent, and sleep was out of the question. Twice during the night I had to get up, tighten the ropes, and put bigger stones on the sides of the tent to prevent its being blown clean away. For twelve hours we lay listening to the fury of the storm, and at last the dawn came. Never were we more pleased to see the first streaks of daylight. 
the weather gradually improved and though it was a showery afternoon we made a successful expedition up the glacier so that my wife might not go away without seeing the hockstetter ice fall and the beauties of the upper tasman wonderful as were the many sights close to us it was when we lifted our eyes to the hockstetter ice fall that the true grandeur of the scene impressed us from mount cook came a mass of broken ice gigantic cubes and pinnacles of the most exquisite and dainty colorings ethereal blues and greens down three thousand feet the great frozen cataracts poured its masses of ice ever moving yet to our rise in perpetual rest even while we looked a thundering roar that had grown familiar to our rears for the last two weeks rent the air as over a black taste of the cliff that breaks the cataracts and serves to heighten the beauty of its coloring a great mass of ice crashed to the foot of the mountain that evening we had a variety entertainment in our tent we started with a shooting match taking four hour target a smolt and fixed on a rock in front of the doorway when it got to dark to see our mark wheel at the lantern played spelling games told stories and talked over the feats of our illustrious predecessors on the tasman glacier as a great treat on our last evening in green's fifth camp we had all the onions left bold for supper with a little salt and they were delicious whether it was the effects of these or the fatigue of our walk i do not know but though it rained that night too we slept profoundly and he did not the elements morning came misty and gray but towards nine o'clock the sun came out brilliantly and the mist rose showing us the mountains covered with fresh white snow we determined to press on to the shepherd's hut at least that day as the weather was to unsettle to risk staying longer standing for a moment on the crest of the moraine we looked down on the little flat where we had spent such a jolly time the wet leaves of Selmesius, snizeros and mountain lilies were flashing back the glittering sunlight the dying smoke of our campfire drifted lazily across the face of the cliff and a key screamed a derisive farewell to us as we took a mental photograph of the scene then we reluctantly turned our backs upon it and our faces once more to the gray moraine the hut was reached wholly in the afternoon and we decided to continue our journey to the hermitage on arriving at the hooker we found that the cage had been left on the other side and could only be pulled over part of the way this was a sore disappointment there was nothing for it but to retrace our steps to the mount hook hut or for me to crawl along the rope and secure the cage we chose the latter alternative if while my wife averted her gaze i crawled along the wire rope and scrambled down into the cage which i managed to pallet across in safety both of us then got in and started across but we had a fearful time of it as the pulling rope had gotten to the current and it was only with the greatest exertion that we managed to extricate it we were half an hour in crossing the river and reached the hermitage in the darkness after what was for a woman in those days a wonderful journey down from green's fifth camp illustration crossing the hupper one morning soon after our return to the hermitage i found myself basking in the warm sunshine dividing my attention for the most part between a book and a cigar and occasionally gazing up at the nice cliffs of mount sefton from which every now and then great masses broke away and came tumbling over the precipices with thundering roar i was joined by mr huddleston the keeper of the hermitage who suggested a climb on the Seely range so next morning i started on a lovely mountain ramble it was a glorious day and the glaciers at the head of the hooker were gleaming in the sunlight while the long southern arete of mount cook right up to the summit was in shadow and there was one patch of glistening white on the top of street david's dome mount sefton with the broken ice of its hanging glaciers was resplendent in full sunshine and every now and then a great avalanche thundered down from the highest slopes 
the mockingbirds were singing in chorus to the two's liquid song, and the beat of the hammers on the roof of the new buildings at the hermitage was borne up through the still air, halting for a spell at a little lake late high on the shoulder of the mountain. I chanced to look up, and was surprised to find someone on the rocks above me. He turned out to be the lad who had so daringly crossed the Hooker River on the wire rope a few days before. He had been employed in connection with the new building at the Hermitage, F, lured by the beauty and the grandeur of these mountains, had climbed from the valley to get a better view. I offered to share my luncheon with him, and he was easily persuaded to accompany me on my scramble. And I, a tuttered climber that I was, made bold to give him his first lesson in mountaineering. He told me his name was Faf. It was a name destined to play no inconsiderable part in the history of New Zealand mountaineering. And I little knew then that in the years to come we two should be in many tight corners together on the giant peaks of these great ranges, and that there would arise situations in which the life of each would depend upon the skill, the coolness, and the courage of the other. Yet so it was, but in this day's work there was not much adventure, and all we did was to reach a point from which the view amply repaid us for our toil. Many fine peaks and glaciers were in sight, and the rivers lay in the great hollows between the ranges like thin threads of silver. In the midst of it all rose the buttresses of Orondi, Pijan Pile, to where its summit's nose gleamed in the setting sun. Far away, on the other hand, in the yellow tussock plains of the lower country, lay the lacus dwells in a setting of dull gold. One began to realize that there were sermons in stones, and that this was a cathedral in which one might hear them. Certainly no cathedral floor of marble was ever so white as the snowing sunlit floor on which we trod, and no cathedral dome so vast as the blue above it, while about us were the massive flying buttresses of the mountain ranges supporting the higher peaks and domes of snow, it required no stretch of the imagination to look back down the aisles of time to the days when greater glaciers carried their burden of grey moraine across the distant plains, and even to the sea itself to the days when still higher peaks towered vast to heaven. The mills of the gods were still grinding up here, and the mountains were crumbling before our rise. But, lower down, the beautiful Sioux Plain flora clothed their cytoselvid recel messias, and many other flowers and plants, with the golden-eyed ran in quassilis, wet with a passing shower, gazing up into the eye of the sun, perched up there, in the midst of it all, away from the hum of cities. The earth had ceased for us to be a weltering chaos. We walked in the great hole of life, looking up and around reverential. Nothing was despicable, was meaningful. Nothing was small but as a part of a whole whose beginning and end we knew not. From this reverie was I awakened by an avalanche crashing down from Sefton steep slopes. We turned and glissaded over the snow, lost our way in the dark, lower down, and eventually arrived at the hermitage and our after nightfall. My companion was thankful for the darkness, for some of his garments had been sorely tried in the descent, and he badly needed a cloak one other scramble, and an important first ascent, and my holiday was at an end. The spell I in love with those beautiful mountains, on whose great glaciers, steep ice slope seas, and grim precipices I was, in after years, to spend many jocund days in some bitter nights. There have been glorious mornings when we shouldered our packs and strode boldly and joyously out into the unknown, there have been days when success met us on the mountainside, if, grasping us warmly by the hand, led us to the almost inaccessible places, and persuaded the higher crags and snows to yield up their inmost secrets. And there have been other times when angry storms, resenting the intrusion, have chased us incontinently back to Tantor Bivouac. Days, though, when the higher snows, softly rounded as the breasts of Aphrodite, in return for all our wooing, have given us but a chill response. Yet this wheat has been very sweet, and the bitter never so sharp that it could not be endured with fortitude, if not altogether with indifference, if, 
throughout all our guideless wanderers and a sigh write it down here with some little predino accident has occurred to mar the happiness of a generation's climbing chapter of the conquering of orangi if at first you don't succeed try try again green's memorable visit in eighteen eighty twato in company with two swiss climbers emile boss and dulrich kaufman fired the enthusiasm of a number of young new zealanders who hoped to succeed where he had just failed in reaching the actual summit of mount cook or to give it its more romantic maori name rangi but rangi entrenched behind his ramparts of ice and frowning buttresses of rock bade defiance to these inexperienced though daring colonial pioneers in southern mountaineering however though we had to contend against many difficulties we were gradually learning the craft and there were several determined if possible to win for new zealand the hunter of the first ascent of new zealand's highest mountain some there were who swore not to raise the siege so long as orangi remained unconnerved and stout hearts and sturdy views remained to battle with the difficulties up to the time when the writer took a hand in the game some ten expeditions had been organized and the peak still remained in climb by in eighteen nine twisher after the failure of mannering's party in the previous season a solemn compact was entered into by three members of the new zealand alpine club to spend their summer holidays in making one more attempt to reach the summit of orangi F spurred into activity by the news that an english climber with the famous sir Bigren, was to leave england in october on an expedition to the southern alps a party was hurriedly organized and arrangements made by telegraph many members who were anxious to take part in the expedition could not however for one reason or another get away and dixon had no fewer than seven refusals from climbers who had at one time or another expressed their willingness to join him finally a party consisting of mr m late dixon mr kenneth wass and the writer decided to make the venture and arranged to meet at felly creek the terminus of the railway on the evening of monday november fifth on arrival at Demari, we were surprised to find there, awaiting our arrival, Mr. Ling So Fife, who we thought was at that moment with Mr. At Gold, Harper endeavoring to cross over from the west coast by way of the Franz Joseph and Kron Prinz Rudolf glaciers into the Tasman, Mr. Evanson, the manager of the Hermitage, was also there they greeted us with rather depressing news fife was doubtful if he could join our party and adamson assured us that we could look for neither provisions nor assistance at the hermitage which was practically closed pending reconstruction of the company on every hand though we were met with discouraging cries of much too early in the season for climbing but confident in our own judgment we kept on our way and daunted and at Fairley Creek, found Dixon awaiting us with a wagonet and three horses, which he had chartered for ten pounds to take us to Mount Cook and back. We waited only forty at Fairley, and proceeded at once on the first stage of our journey Futur and May Lester Burke's Pass, arriving there at ten. Thirty p. M. We compared notes as to provisions, equipment, etc and sorting out what we did not require each man packed his swab for the expedition on tuesday we were up at four up m and on the road freakters of an hour later there had been a garish red sky just after the dawn and now as they began to ascend the slopes of the pass a puff of warm wine met us and gave ominous warning that a nor'wester was brewing the nor'wester which is equivalent to the dreaded fond wind of the swiss alps is the bane of new zealand climbers as it generally ends in rain and often softens the snow and brings down innumerable avalanches from the higher slopes we could only hope that this was a false alarm or that if a nor'wester did come it would be a baby one and blow over before we reached our objective scarcely could be realized that the child would grow into the giant he subsequently did 
We reached Lake de Capo at nine. Ferbiv. M. F. After stopping to get a shoe on one of the horses, resumed our journey. At Bremer we intended to camp for the night, and the hope that the Tasman River would be fordable only next morning. Shortly after midday we halted at a mountain stream to feed the horses and bowl the billy for lunch. All around us were undeniable signs of the older glacial period, when the godly and the great Tasman glaciers met on the Mackenzie Plains, F. uniting, flowed on in one grand ice stream towards the Pacific. On either side were vestiges of old moraines, Nigress grimed, and great rocks that had come down on the ice from the higher mountains. Illustration, crossing the Tasman. Illustration, Camp Cokery. We arrived at the Tasman River only in the afternoon. F. Finding it low, decided to go on past Bremer and cross opposite Glentoner Station. The river bed he was some four miles across, and the water flows over it in several branches. We had some difficulty in finding a ford. F. At one spot, got into the treacherous quicksands in which the bed of this dreaded river abounds. In a moment the horses were up to their knees in it, and the trap wheels sank nearly to the axle. Having no desire to repeat Mr. Green's experience of leaving his wagonet in the river, the whip was vigorously applied. F. The horses willingly responding. We just succeeded in getting through to firm ground. Finally we managed to cross the Manny Anchold River without accident, and halted at Glentoner Sheiktation, where we were hospitably entertained. He inquiries were made as to whether we could obtain a porter to assist with this ragging, and were gratified to find that the manager was that day paying office station hand who would be likely to afford the necessary assistance. The manager was empowered to engage him in our behalf and to send him on after us. His wage is to be one pounds a day. We also added to our provisions here by purchasing half a sheep, and after a cup of tea and a spell of freighters of an hour, proceeded on our journey up the Tasman Valley, intending to camp that night near the wire rope that spans the Hooker River at the end of the southern spur of Mount Cook. By the time we got to Birch Hill the weather was so threatening that it was deemed wise to call a halt, and no sooner had we got the things out of the trap than the rain started to come down in torrents. Next morning by seven o'clock the storm had cleared sufficiently to allow us to proceed. So, after a hurried breakfast, we started off in the direction of the Hooker River, first taking the precaution of getting the shepherd to kill a sheep to take up to Green's fifth camp in case we should be delayed there by bad weather. The ground became rougher and rougher as the journey progressed. If, at last, we were brought to a dead stop through breaking the pole of our wagonet. This caused a vexatious delay, as every iron now was valuable. Seeing that it was our intention to push on past the hermitage in the hut at Green's fifth camp, fourteen miles farther on, and pitch our tent some miles up the glacier at the foot of the spot, below the Mount Cook bivouac. However, there was nothing for it but to set to at once and repair the damage, and pack our belongings on one of the horses, to the cage on the wire rope that spanned the Hooker River. Accordingly, the horses were quickly in harnessed, and Dixon and Dower Jettel, another two horses, galloped up to the hermitage for material to splice the pole, while Kenneth and I, with our portware who had joined us the night before at Birchill picked it all our things up to the Hooker River. Arrived here, however, we found the manila rope, with which the cages worked, broken, and one end jammed amongst the boulders in the bed of the river on the other side. Kenneth and I, however, got into the cage, pulled ourselves across, handing Rand on the cable, and secured the broken rope, which we spliced to the one on the other side. In this way we restored communication, though, owing to the ropes being single instead of double, the cage could be pulled across only with great exertion. All these, however, were minor difficulties, which we brushed lightly aside, determined that no ordinary obstacle should hinder our ultimate progress. 
just as we were preparing to get the swags across by means of the cage, we sp Dixon leading the old pack horse from the hermitage in our direction. F. As we could trust this animal in the river, we waited. F. Transferring the swags to her, I got one of the other horses and led her across the river. Kenneth and our porter crossed in the cage, the latter being so frightened that he was not able to pull a pound on the rope. Dixon returned to the trap to mend the broken pole, and he and the driver followed us. Mater, on the other two horses, the rough journey up to the hut at Green's fifth Kempra's uneventful. The weather was fine, and the views ahead were strikingly beautiful. Dixon hurried ahead to make a pair of speed, which he fashioned in a most ingenious manner out of a couple of long palings and two short pieces of zinc. We were depending on these ski to take us safely and expeditiously over the dreaded deep snow of the great plateau above the Hoxditter Ice Fall. They were simply snowshoes made of wood four inches wide and six feet long, and similar to those used by Nansen in his expedition across Greenland. Fixen had, the previous year, left two pairs on the rocks of the Hostridge above the plateau, and these we hoped to find the third pair being required for Kenneth. A halt was called at the hut for Teague. If, late in the evening, we started with the intention of crossing the Ball and Hoxtetter glaciers and camping at the foot of the Tesman Spur. It was a fine night, but no sooner had we shouldered our swags than ominous clouds were seen swirling over the shoulder of Orangi. Dixon doubted the wisdom of proceeding, and our porter said he would much sooner wait till morning. But after a little deliberation I urged an advance. On slowly, in single file, the expedition trooped over the rough moraine hillocks of the Bull Glacier. The clear ice of the Hoxtetter Glacier was soon reached. If, crossing this obliquely, we encountered another moraine, over the loose stones of which we slowly toiled with our heavy swags. We arrived at the Tesmans for in a couple of hours. If, in a little hollow of the old moraine of the glacier, where grew some snow grass, veronica, and alpine plants. We pitched our tent, after first removing the larger stones so that we might have a fairly comfortable bed. It was a fine night, and the snow ped mountains on the left towering steeply above, with D. Lubeck far up the glacier in front of us, formed a picture of exquisite loveliness in the brilliant moonlight. Opposite, Across the valley, frowned the gaunt, rock buttresses of the Moltbrun range. We spent our first night comfortably enough under canvas, and slept soundly till daylight. Next morning the weather was again fine, and our spirits rose with the thermometer. If we could only cache the upper snows in good order, our chances of climbing the peak were excellent. We were, however, soon to meet with our first disappointment, as we were preparing breakfast, our porter, oh, like Falstaff, was somewhat fat and scanto breath, and who had been sitting apart on a boulder on the old moraine, having finished his meditations, rose, and approaching me with some degree of deference, explained that he had come to the conclusion that he would not be of much more use to us. He was all over pains, and he had a bad itaki, assuming for the moment, a cheerful outward manner, though being inwardly somewhat indignant and said at heart. I assured him that if he but came with us a few thousand feet higher, with a good swab on his back, his pains would quickly vanish. If, moreover, that the rarefied air in the region of the Mount Cook bivouac was an infallible cure for Redeki, and indeed for all the other ills that flesh is heir too, but my pleading was in vain. He cast one scared look at the frowning crags above, and incontinently fled. He even refused breakfast. Like another historical person, it for quite a different reason, he stayed not for break, and he stopped not for stone. With his blanket on his back, he made a beeline for the hut, whence he hoped to get the company of our driver back to the hermitage. The driver, however, had already started on his journey. A less determined man might now have paused a moment in his onward flight. But not so our falsification, Burdenber, 
with all his pains and aches forgotten he now continued his headlong retreat down the valley eventually he caught sight of the driver whereupon he began to shout and bellow to attract his attention the latter good man thinking some terrible accident had happened stopped and drove back to meet the messenger of supposed evil report and in the caritables of his heart gave the deserter one of our horses wherewith to continue his flight the escriver which the historical personage already referred to swam is but a minor obstacle as compared with the turbulent hucker and our porter though he had a good horse under him was nearly washed away in the foaming torrent next day he continued his journey down that asmin valley in our wagonet and arrived at the hotel at lake pekaki a setter and a quieter man above falling in with two station hands who primed him with bad liquor <clears throat> once more waxed eloquent and even claimed for himself the scent of mount cook for a time he was quite the hero of the countryside but each glass of whiskey that he swallowed added some more munchikinsly adventure to his tale till the sutmotal became so overwhelmingly great that even his boon companions though they could swallow the whiskey could not swallow the story it was indeed a terrible tale of privation and adventure that he had to tell but finally he contradicted himself to such an extent that he had reluctantly to admit that he had not even set foot on the mountain but he had his revenge the men he had been engaged by were mad sir mid as atters they were going up a place as steep as the side of nows and there was a young fellow named ross among them who was the maddest of the lot later i reported with his swag on his back a bottle of whiskey in his pocket and a liberal supply of the fiery beverage inside him wandered out into the night lost his way on the tussock plains if having slept off the potion returned next day minus all his belongings then he disappeared altogether and history does not record whether he ever returned again to those dread alpine regions but the chances are that he preferred the delights of civilized wainer the flesh pots of the country putbo the joys of alpine climbing we had many a laugh afterwards over our adventure with the bully porter but but as we looked somewhat ruefully at the extra pack he had left behind him and thought of the added burden that would soon be upon our own shoulders we began to realize the magnitude of our undertaking and to curse his craven heart we did not however let this little adventure spurl our breakfast and congratulated ourselves that in three days from dunavin we had established a camp at the foot of the slopes from which green after many difficulties and much delay commenced his climb the feat not easy of accomplishment in those days but the hardest toll yet lay before us and the memory of that first climb to the bivouac encumbered as we were with packs weighing close upon fifty pound <laughs> does not fade with the passing years occasionally there would be a bit of crag work and at last we entered a long snow couloir up which we kicked steps in the direction of the bivouac this couloir got steeper at the top and dixon thinking to make better progress took to the rocks on the right while kenneth and i tried the rocks on the left preferring the snow work we were soon back in the couloir and lost sight of dixon a quarter of an hour later a jode bell from us brought forth an answering shout from below and presently dixon's head appeared above a pinnacle of rock on our right the spare rope which he had in his swag had been taken out and was now coiled round his shoulder so we knew he had been in difficulties making a traverse of the snow slope he was soon in our steps and we learned that he had got into rather an awkward corner from which he had to descend by means of the alpine rope the snow slope above grew steeper and then eased off on two steep rocks up which lay the route fix and levin kennet followed but was quickly in difficulties for the long ski which were attached to his swab would in spite of everything catch in the rocks rendering the situation risky and the language even more so it will perhaps be well to draw a veil over the various acrobatic feats that we performed 
and round off the story by stating that we reached the bivouac rock at Fapine. M. Under the lee of this rock we found a little flat place, about six feet square, on the crest of a narrow, exposed ridge, on the one side a snow cooler, some two thousand feet long, sloped steeply down between the precipices to the foot of the Hochstetter ice fall. Northwards the ridge fell away toward the Tasman glacier. The scenery was magnificent. Immediately above our camp were some splintered towers of rock, from which is obtained a glorious view of the upper slopes of Orangi, Northward Host and Hatinger, clothed with Serican Dice Fall, Tower High in Heaven, and thence the eye wanders round to de la Beke, most beautiful of mountain de Beaumont, and the magnificent sweep of the upper Tasman, leading to the Lendefin Saddle and the Hoxteter Dome. Across the valley were the giant rock peaks of the Maltbrun Range, catching the rosy tint of dying day, and the low hour bivouac the battlements of the long rocky ridge leading down to the deep valley in which the middle portion of the great Esmond Glacier, with its streams of moraine and white ice, stretched itself in the deepening gloom of evening. Dixon expected to find the bivouac snowed up so early in the season, and he had carried up a short-handled shovel with a view to digging out the cache of provisions left there the previous season. To my urge, however, it was found almost entirely free from snow, and the tinned meats, fish, etc., to all appearance, in good order. Kenneth and I now divided the swags and got out some provisions for a snack, while Dixon went up over the rocks in an unsuccessful search for water. We had arrived rather late in the day, and no rock could be found retaining sufficient heat from the sun's rays to melt the snow we spread on it. The result was that Dixon returned with only about an inch of water in the billy. This we apportioned F at seven thirty p m once more shouldered Dower's wags and started on the climb to the glacier dome. But it was now found that the snow was frozen so hard that we should have to cut steps in it all the way to the dome. And as we saw no prospect of being able to do this with swags on our backs, and to come back for the rest of our burdens in time to make a camp on the great plateau beyond the dome, we decided to camp for the night at the bivouac. It was well we did so decide. As the evening wore on it began to grow cold, so Kenneth and I set about pitching the whimper tent, while Dixon went on cutting steps up to the dome to make the ascent the easier in the morning, owing to the limited space at our disposal. It was rather a difficult matter to pitch the tent satisfactorily, but we made a fairly good job of it. F. Getting inside, set about melting some snow over the aurora lamp to make a cup of Liebig for Dixon. This was rather unpleasant work. As the lamp was out of order and smoked badly, the Primus stove used so effectively in after years in our Ralphs, and also by my friends Scott and Shackleton in the Antarctic, were not then on the market in end. So, our lamp smoked and went out, and was relit, and smoked and went out again. The one thing it seemed incapable of was the generation of heat finally. The whole thing caught fire and in order to avoid an explosion we threw it outside and extinguished the flames in the snow. Luckily I had with me a small spirit lamp, if, though it was not made for burning kerosene. We managed, by the aid of this, to melt some snow and brew three small pannikins in of Liebib. Then we sat down and waited patiently for Dixon's return. About half-past nine we began to feel a little anxious and I was just getting on my boots to go out and look for him when we heard the clink of his ice case on the rocks above the tent. He had been gone two and a half hours, and had done foot work. He was rewarded with the Liebig that had been kept warm for him for three quarters of an hour, and then we, all three, turned into our sleeping bags, intending to make a very early start in the morning. We talked over our plans, and arranged, finally, to carry heavy swags up over the glacier dome and on to the plateau, camping eventually on the ice of the Linda Glacier at an altitude of about ten, zero feet above Sealville, should there be any danger of avalanches from Mount Tasman in crossing the plateau, 
we decided to travel by night and select a safe camp in the daytime. The mountain was, however, singularly free from avalanches, and we began to think our chances of scaling the peak were of the rosiest. Chapter V The Conquering of Irontage in Psychonet Funders, and the wind rushes screaming through the void. The night is black as a black stone. Rabindra Tagore, a high bivouac in the southern Alps, across which sweep the great summer ocean air currents, may, at any time, and without much warning, lend a spice of adventure to a big climb. And so it now happened, before we could get comfortably warm in our bags, and settle down for the night, ominous busts of wine began to flap the sides of our tent, and to send the snows whirling down the gullies. The wine gradually increased, and by half-past ten it was howling round our bivouac with the force of a gale. The sides of our tent flapped wildly, and at last it became evident that it could not stand against such a gale, but would be blown to shreds if left standing. So I got up and leveled it to the ground, hanging on to the rope to avoid being blown away. I took a glance round. The soft snow from the tops of Host and Hadinger, caught by the wind, was blown like a great Clyde banner halfway across that Asmund Valley, while the moon went plunging into the storm clouds that came sailing in torn masses overhead. It was evident that we were in for a bad nor'wester, and as I crawled back under the folds of the tent and into my sleeping bag beside my recumbent companions I could hold out little hope for the morrow. Hour after hour the wind raged. There was no improvement till morning. Then the wind seemed to abate somewhat, and we pitched the tent again. It was bitterly cold, and snow was beginning to fall. It looked as if we were going to be caught in a trap, but we were loath to retreat, and stuck to our guns in the hope that before the day was over the gale would have blown itself out. But matters began to get worse instead of better. The wind once more increased in violence, and was now accompanied by driving rain, hail, and snow. We could do nothing but wait patiently in our sleeping bags and hope for the best. Towards evening we broached it in of sardines, and managed to get enough water from the floor of the tent to allay our first. Then night closed round our storm toasts bivouac, and the driving rain beat through the canvas, and formed pools on the waterproof floor inside. Several times we bailed the tent out with pannikins in, but there was no keeping it dry, and at last we were content to lie in our sleeping bags in the water. About 10 p. m. there was a vivid flash of lightning followed by a loud peal of thunder, and this was succeeded by another and yet another, each peal coming nearer than the one preceding it. The hours went slowly by, and at midnight the storm was at its height. The lightning came like balls of fire, and while the wind howled round the crags, the thunder crashed incessantly, making the bivouac rock, and even the ridge itself, tremble. Sleep was out of the question. But we huddled up in our sleeping bags, and occasionally told a story or sang a song. Some one quoted ironically illustration. The man, cuck bivouac, there is beauty in the bellow of the blast. There is grandeur in the growling of the gale, but to him who's scientific there is nothing that's terrific in the falling of a flight of thunderbolts and Dixon sang a song about a juvenile celestial who had caught a bumblebee, if, taking it for a melican butterfly, put it in the pocket of his pantaloons with disastrous results as the night wore on there was no abatement of the storm, but rather it seemed to increase in fury. The lightning was wonderfully vivid the balls of fire being succeeded by a bluish light. The incessant thunder, at each crash, drowned the noise of the storm. It was grand in the extreme. Each moment I expected the rock under which we lay would be splintered by an explosion. Is this blessed rock quite safe? I inquired of Dixon, who had spent many nights under it, but never such a one as this. Not it very, was the answer. So we pondered quietly and put our trust in Providence, and he laws of chance sleep was out of the question. After some time I looked at my watch by a flash of lightning, and found it was free. 
M. Snow was falling heavily, and weighing down the weather side and end of the tent, I had magnanimous stake in the outside berth, and now I could feel the snow calling up over my head in the slack of the tent outside. I beat it down repeatedly, but, like the pain caused by the peach of emerald hue, it grew it grew till it was once more arching overhead, and I had to sit up and plant my back defiantly against it. Long before morning it had formed a bank outside the tent four feet high, if, when the welcome dawn appeared, though I was still in a sitting posture. It was once more curling over my head, while Kenneth, who was next the rock, had a small cornice arching over his recumbent form. By this time the water in which we were lying had by some means or other got through into our sleeping bags, and this made matters still more uncomfortable. Peering out through the tent door in the early dawn, we saw the snow still falling, if below us, an apparently bottomless cauldron of swirling drift. The wind had moderated somewhat and the thunder had ceased, but the situation was anything but reassuring. So we decided to be to retreat to the lower regions. We break spaded on cold plum pudding. F. Creeping out of our bags, hurriedly packed our swags and got ready for a start. The tent had to be abandoned, as it was frozen to the rocks and the stones to which the Biwapros were attached were buried deep in the snow. We were soon roped together and at the top of a steep cool or leading down some three or four thousand feet to the Desmond Valley below us. Attaching the swags to the rope, we attempted to tow them behind us, but, as the snow was soft and the slope steep, this became dangerous work, and we decided to let them slide down the cooler before us. They went off with great rapidity for some one hundred feet or so, then bounded over a huge tower of rock that jutted out from the middle of the couloir, and disappeared from view. Relieved of the swags, we proceeded cautiously, going with our faces to the slope as one would come down a ladder, making good anchorage with our ice cases at every step in case we should start an avalanche. There were one or two nasty places, but nothing happened getting on to easier slopes lower down we were able to turn round and practically walk down the remainder of the bully we could find no trace of the swags and came to the conclusion that they must either have been arrested on the crags above or buried in the soft snow below we decided to hunt for them on the following day and wended our way back across the hocks to turn and bowl glaciers to the lonely hut defeated but not altogether disheartened arrived at the hut. The first thing we did was to get out of our wet clothes, but, as our spare garments were in the lost wags, a new problem presented itself for solution. We made shift with what was at hand, Dixon attired in a bath towel, to which he subsequently added a Macintosh, Kenneth gracefully clad in a grey blanket, myself in an airy costume composed of a short serge frock discarded by a former lady climber, made a fashionable trio such as had never before graced the ball hut, and that aroused many of a longing for my lost camera, which, like our spare clothing, was in the buried wags. Breakfast hurt a rower long spell of thirty hours at the bivouac, with little to drink, and that little knot of the best was very welcome. At midday we turned into our bunks, and dozed away the afternoon. The weather continued bad and towards evening we were startled by a large rock which came crashing down the mountainside in close proximity to the hut, warning us that what with falling stones and the danger of a break in the ball glacier a few hundred yards higher up the valley, the said hut wasn't anything but a safe position. They closed in, if, one by one, we dozed off again till at about nine. Foodie P. M. We were roused by a further nose outside and in our half soupy condition imagined we were going to be bombarded by another rock avalanche. Presently, however, the door opened, and in walked three men with ice cases, alpine rope, and other climbing paraphernalia. They proved to be Fife and George Graham members of the Nen, Zol, Ep, Sol, and Matheson a runholder who had come up to see something of the great Desmond Glacier, 
There were now six of us in camp, and it became necessary to modify our arrangements, so we discussed plans, and resolved to make a very early start as soon as the weather cleared. Sunday was occupied mainly as a day of rest. Some necessary preparations in the way of cooking, etc., only being made. Graham constituted himself chef of the Hotel de Ball, and it was not long before the smell of a savoury stew was wafted in through the hut door. Alas for the hopes thus engendered when we came to eat the stew we found that our cook with the best of good intentions. No doubt Bod dozed the dish liberally with what he believed to be salt, but which he afterwards ascertained to be tartaric acid some one suggested that if we now what it certain would counteract the effect of the acid. But we were not in a mood for experiments we gave the whole lot to Matheson's dog and at the end of the day the dog was still alive we then made the further distressing discovery that there was no salt in the camp and for the next three days we had to cook our meat and bake our bread without it this was not so bad as long as we had soda and acid with which to bake scones but at last the acid likewise gave out and we were in a quandary dixon suggested citrate of magnesia as a substitute but i prevailed upon matheson whom we made baker and cheap, to try fruit salts, a bottle of which we found in the hut, and this he did with excellent results. The weather cleared gradually, and by eight, Ferbiv, M, the peaks of the Maltbrun range were standing out above the top of the moraine, grander than ever, in their terracier of newly fallen new fear grim precipices, which had slipped their mantle of white being accentuated by the deep snow in the quarries. The barometer had risen a tenth, the wind was from the south, and everything seemed to make for success at last, as the weather was apparently clear down country. This seemed a fitting opportunity to liberate one of the carrier pigeons lent me by Messrs. Well, and deaf, Hashkins before leaving Dunedin, attaching a message written at the bivouac, to the bird's lead. We liberated him at Tenna, M. all hands turning out to give him a send-off. It was an interesting experiment, as the bird had been taken right into the heart of the southern Alps, and had to rise from a valley surrounded by mountains of from ten to twelve thousand feet in altitude. He rose gradually to a great height, making ten gyrations in one direction, and then with a sweep round in the opposite direction he seemed to suddenly make up his mind, F, taking a beeline over the Liebig Range, disappeared in the direction of the coast at Timar. He reached home at 4, 30 p. m. having accomplished the journey in six hours and a half. It may be worth while remarking that when the bird reached Dunedin he was still flying at a very high elevation. We now waited only for settled weather, as we were a very strong party, and had every confidence in our ability to conquer more than ordinary difficulties. Matheson, our newly formed acquaintance, was ready to join us, and to go with us to the summit if need be. So Dixon nailed up his boots with hobs and clinkers for the ice walk. We went early to bed, and pondered over the chances of success, there was one thing that made our minds unisif amount of newly fallen snow on the higher slopes. This would render climbing difficult, if not dangerous. Still, we could but try, and if there should be any danger we decided to travel at night and camp in the daytime. By this means we should also avoid the terrible glare and heat from the snow slopes of the Upper Linda Glacier. The people of Australia were maybe taken as able to judge a see there are three hot place hay, Hab and Bulligod, and that in the matter of temperature these should be put in the order named on a cloudless summer day, when the sun beats through the stagnant air and is reflected from the snow and the surrounding slopes. The Linda, in any reliable classification, would probably come in after hay and before the other place. It was decided that we should rise on the morrow at two. Furby, M. But slumber held the hut till four o'clock and it was five before we were ready for another start. We had not gone four before the storm descended upon us again, and there was nothing for it but to retreat to the shelter of the hut. Clyde's obscured the mountain tops, 
and it was snowing at the bivouac. Disconsolity we marched back, and by the time we had regained our habitation the wind, accompanied by driving hail and snow, was once more sweeping down the valley. It now became a game of patience, but though all this gloomy weather and lack of sunshine was very depressing, we kept up our spirits and determined to set out again on the first opportunity. There was some chance of our running short of provisions, as we were now a march party, and it was arranged that Fife should walk down to the Hermitage for bread and tin meats, while Dixon, Matheson, Brain, and I went to look for the swags, leaving Kenneth in charge of the camp. Accordingly, we proceeded once more across the Ball and Hoxteter glaciers, and on past our lower camp. By the time we got near the Tasman's per the snow was driving round us in blinding gusts, and we had frequently to crouch under a crag, and hold on all we knew to prevent our being blown away, owing to the heavy snowfall. The whole aspect of the lower portion of the mountain was changed, and we had some difficulty in finding the exact cool ore down which we had sent the swags. But at last we reached what we thought was it, and Dixon and Graham proceeded with some difficulty right up to the spot where the swags were seen to disappear over the middle rock, owing to the great depth of snow. However, no trace of them could be found. Matheson and I searched another cool ore to the right, but not liking the look of it, and knowing there was danger from my blocks that occasionally fell from the edge of a glacier at its head. Fully a thousand feet above, we beat a retreat to our camp. We halted at our cache at the foot of the Tasman Spur, and Matheson knocked over a key with his ice case, simply stunning it and subsequently catching it alive. We afterwards caught another at Green's fifth camp, on our way down the glacier the wind was so violent that we could not stand against it, and it simply blew us before it over the smooth ice, while the driving rain that had now set in drenched us once more to the skin. We got back to camp at half-past one, and Dixon and Graham came in an hour after Waldkitz. Hungry and wet, Kenneth had cooked us a hot dinner, which we thoroughly enjoyed, and once more we turned in to wait for fine weather, that night there was another thunderstorm almost as violent as the one we had experienced at the bivouac. But the lightning was not so vivid, and the thunder for one or two peals shook the hut was not quite so close. Tuesday, the 13th, was spent in camp, but the bad weather continuing, we could not get our clothes dry, and again the costumes worn were at all events original, if not conventional, Next morning the ground about the hut was covered to a depth of several inches with snow. Fife made his appearance shortly after breakfast, and the result of his foraging expedition was regarded as highly satisfactory, especially as he had brought up a fresh supply of bread and a quantity of salt. We were getting tired of eating mutton without salt, and though the scones that Matheson had baked with fruit salts in place of certain and acid, which had run short, were excellent. Still we welcomed the new supply of bread. My holiday being at an end, I had to return to Dunedin, and reluctantly took leave of my companions on the Thursday morning, leaving them patiently waiting to give the weather a final chance of clearing. This was my one and only attempt to climb Mount Cook before making the traverse of it some years later. Mr. Turner in his book says that I had tried to climb Mount Cook for twenty years and was grateful that the author's expedition gave me success at last. This is on a par with several other extraordinary statements that his book contains. Illustration The Hooker River. Matheson accompanied me on my fourteen mile tramp in the driving rain down to the Hermitage. We got wet crossing the glacier streams, which were all so high that we had doubts about being able to ford the Hooker River. However, we managed to get across safely on the old gray mare. The blocks of ice were coming down by the score in the ever-increasing and rapidly flowing point. In the evening we drove another fourteen miles to Glentoner Station, which was reached with difficulty, as the mountain torrents that crossed the road had torn up their channels so that there were no good fords, while in one place the road was almost completely washed away. 
in another cutting a great slit that had come right across the road almost capsized the trap though we went very carefully over it in order to get to dunedin up to time it was necessary for me to cross the dasmin next day and make a rapid passage down to fairley creek but to our dismay we were told that we could not possibly cross the river in the trap i then decided to ford the stream with one of the horses and walk the many weary miles to lake Decapa that night but on arriving at glentoner the manager said it would not be safe even to attempt to ford the river on horseback here was of a lemon. the alternative was to catch the coach at lake pukaki next morning and young ross the station manager generously offering to provide me with a saddle horse i got up at two m and started on my lonely twenty fill and ride along the lakeside it was clear overhead but our raid wards the moon cut through the breaking fringe of storm clyde occasionally a startled rabbit crossed my wreck in the moonlight or a pair of paradise ducks trumpeted forth a defiant note from a safe distance in the lone lagoons of the tasman flats in front was the changing eastern sky tinted with the rose of morning F. behind the depressing gloom of the great mist brudged Tasman Valley, where my climbing companions were no doubt still waiting and scheming to conquer the monarch of the Southern Alps, I reached the Pukaki River at six m, and was rowed across in time for breakfast before the coach left. That evening I was in Felly Creek, having accomplished this event of fight miles in the one day. From an upland plain I got my last glimpse of the Southern Alps. The weather had cleared and the mountains stood up gloriously in the noonday sunsily. Sefton, the footstool, Stokes, and Tasman vying with one another. Above, above them all, the mighty ridge of Rondi. They were like old friends. It was with a sad heart I saw them one by one disappear. And once again I came to the conclusion that, for the man with a limited holiday, mountaineering is a game of chance with the weather, and that the weather generally holds at least three aces and a long suit. Chapter by the conquering of Irontage and Psychonomy it was a toilsome hill, with storms as black as night. Yet up its slopes of gleaming white that little band of men went climbing up, and up, until they just climbed down again a fragment. While Matheson and myself were proceeding down that Asmin Valley in the rain, the others stayed on at the hut, hoping for fine weather to enable them to renew the tack on Orangi. For a little exercise and pastime they paved the earthen floor of the hut with flat stones. Next day the weather cleared sufficiently to allow of their making an excursion on that Esmond Glacier, where they got further exercise and some good practice in stepped aft. On the following day, the barometer having been steady for some time, they break spated at three, thirty, and started once more with fairly heavy swags for the bivouac arrived at the foot of the tasman ridge graham was deputed to fry some chops left there on a previous visit while the others went ahead f spreading out over the snow and formed by the avalanches from the colors above began another search for the swags they soon found that they should have to exercise some caution in the scent of the spow for as the sun began to rise in the heavens the fresh snow responded to its influence in avalanches but i must let my brother kenneth tell the rest of the story not finding any trace of the swags he writes dixon and i crossed the large cool or to the north to gain the more accessible and safer one down which we had from the swags he stayed to watch the head of it and give warning in case of danger while i crossed and then came over himself he had hardly gained the rocks on the opposite side when a grand snow avalanche came sweeping down the couloir, literally bounding along in its rocky bed like sheep going through a race. Deeming the rocks the safer, we kept along a narrow ridge until we came to where vegetation terminated. F. Gathering some dry scrub and roots, we agreed to boil the billy and carry on some fuel to the bivouac in order to save our kerosene for the cooking lamp after a delay of about two hours through having to melt snow and after experiencing great difficulty in burling the billy through the scrub being rather damp we started for the bivouac which we reached about five o'clock 
having previously left the tent here in a snowstorm. We had now to set to work and to get out of the frozen snow in order to have it dried before carrying it on to the plateau. While litten the wet biscuits were spread out to dry. We made a good pot of porridge in the fin side, so as to answer as a drink and a meal and filled a can with soup to carry on with us. At seven o'clock we made a start for the plateau. If, after about two hours hard going through soft snow, we made the top of the dome where we were met by a stiff breeze, accompanied by a light sleet, descending the dome halfway to the foot of the plateau. We decided to pitch camp, excavating a hole three feet deep in the snow and building it up round the edges two feet more. With a shovel we had carried up for the purpose, we seemed to have a tolerably snug little yard of snow walls to protect our tent from the unmerciful northwester. At Tent Peak, M. We had the tent well pitched, with the rope and the nice cases, and the four pairs of ski for pegging stakes. A bolster of snow was left running along one side of the tent under the floor for our heads to rest upon. About eleven o'clock we turned in, but found to our sorrow that the heat of our bodies inside caused the lights lead outside to fall and trickle through the tent, making things all the more unpleasant now that we had no sleeping bags. On getting up next morning, we found our blankets quite wet, and pools of water on the floor of the tent. Still worse, we were convinced that in a very short time everything would be enveloped in a dense mist, which gradually crept up the Hoxteter ice fall, obliterating everything in its slow and stealthy advance. F. Finally, reffing the giant Orongi in an impenetrable, dense white mantle from head to foot. After having breakfast and adjusting our ski, as the snow was sopped, we took the compass bearing of a hot plate on the side of the mountain above the crevices at the head of the Hoxteter ice fall, and made a start about six o'clock. But before we had got halfway across the plateau, we could not see a chain ahead. Dixon, getting in the rear with compass in hand, kept us in a straight line while we advanced, endeavoring to make the Linda and the hope that the fog might clear with the advancing day. However, it was not to be. After keeping on for half an hour in this manner, we encountered some crevices on our left, while we heard avalanches ahead and to our right from the sides of Cook and Hasmond. If not being able to judge our distance, we came to the conclusion that prudence was the better part of Velu and decided to return. About 7 p. M. We turned in to have a good rest for an early start about one o'clock next morning. The man lying nearest to the door was instructed to keep one eye open and give the alarm should the weather clear. At eleven, thirty-five had a peep out and found the night to be clear and starry, with not a clyde in the sky. The lamp was at once lit, and the operation of melting snow begun. It takes a considerable time to melt a supply for four men, for it is impossible to sufficiently concentrate the heat with any ordinary lamp or stove. At Toon, M. On the 18th, we again got our ski adjusted and made good progress down the gentle slope of the plateau, assisted by the light of the moon in avoiding the crevices. On gaining the lower slopes of the Linda, we found our position none too secure from avalanches, and were, so to speak, between the devil and the deep sea. At the Tasman corner, we crossed the track of an avalanche, while farther on to the left, it was evident there was also danger from mice cliffs on the Cook side. However, taking turn about at breaking step slopes, being now too steep for sky, we made fair progress. Though in places of drift the snow was almost fat peak, we were well up the Linda when the dawn began to tint the eastern sky with a pale blue light, which gradually deepened into the ruddy glow of morning. The sun rose, and with it a bank of cloud made its appearance above the horizon, while the long, winding valley of the Tasman, below, was obscured in a sea of mist, across the valley the dark, Frowning peaks of molt brun seemed grander than ever in the dusky light of early morn, towering high above their dense white base of mist, 
About eight o'clock we were at the head of the Linda, opposite a saddle in the northern Arete. He Reholt was called for lunch, and we had a consultation as to what route we ought to take. Fife considered, from the look of the ice cliffs above the first cooler on Green's route, that it was very unsafe to attempt an ascent from that direction, and guaranteed to take us up the northern areat of rock. He considered it would be all the more creditable if we succeeded by that route. Dixon and myself held firm in favour of Green's route, and argued that, as it had been proved a practicable one, it would be wasting time and a good day to attempt other. However, after some discussion it was decided to try the reet. If, about eight o'clock, the scent was begun, rounding a corner of projecting rock, a small couloir was entered, where we had to use the greatest caution, as the snow was not in good order, there being only it in coating on the surface of the rocks and the perpendicular cliff of the lower part of the ridge falling two thousand feet below on to the lower slopes of the Linda Glacier, one man moving at a time, while the others kept a good anchorage with their axes, we climbed the last bit of the snow slope, and the first of the rock work was begun. Fife, taking the lead, did not keep us waiting. In fact, I had not been more than five minutes in his company on the rocks before I came to the conclusion that he was exceptionally good at rockwalk, apparently being capable of detecting the safest and slightest foothold or hendropping with wonderful rapidity, at being in the rear, soon found that I was to have the benefit of any loose stones dislodged above. However, I must say, in justice to the leaders, that they proved themselves to be no novices at rockwork, and only on one occasion had I tooed up my head to prevent my being scalped a piece of rock passing within two inches of my head. At eleven, thirty we got on to a flat ledge of rock, where we were able to sit down with safety, and enjoy a hunk of bread, tinned beef, and preserved fruit, which we vowed was the greatest delicacy we had ever endured. All agreed that the climb was worth doing for the enjoyment derived from that meal. After waiting for a drink of water from snow spread on the rocks to melt, we again commenced the climb. On ascending a bit of a snow slope, two routes presented Femsel Seven leading to the left and eastward side of the top of the reet, over good reddish rock, and the other leading to the right and westward side, over a slaty, bray rook, the latter being more in our direct line for the peak, we decided to take it. But soon, to our sorrow, we found we had taken the worse and more and safe of the two, the rock being so broken that it was almost impossible to get a safe foothold or hand ripping, that most caution had to be exercised to prevent the starting of stones or loose fragments of rock. Keeping to the left, we were not long in regaining the good rock and in feeling much safer. From the commencement of the climb, Fife had frequently been interrogated by those in the rear as to the possibility of advancement, when we would be assured that it looked much easier ahead. But the easy part never seemed to get any nearer. And at Tuki, M, we were brought to a standstill by a great wall of rock. The possibility of its ascent was discussed, and each one had a look at the barrier, and was asked his opinion. Fife declared he could get up, but might not, he thought, be able to come down again. So, not knowing what was beyond, or whether it was possible to gain the reet from the saddle for which we were making, we came to the conclusion that there was nothing left for us but to return halfway by the track we had come. When we would be able to get on to his no slope running almost at right angles and leading in a more direct line on to Green's track. This snow slope we had noticed when we were lunching on our way. We concluded it would save a good hour, and so enable us to get on to Green's track and climb by moonlight. Accordingly we put about shipped, descending in the opposite order to which we had made the scent, we had not been long on the downward track before I was warned by a voice from above calling, Look out, look out, look out below, and before I had time to realize what had happened, or what was going to happen. Five sex went whizzing past and stuck erect in a small patch of snow two hundred feet below. 
exactly in our upward marks. At three o'clock we got to the head of the snow slope before mentioned, and found it to be in a most dangerous condition. With hard ice eight inches from the surface, we now decided to take advantage of the warm rocks, on which we might have a spell, and perhaps a sleep, until the snow became firmer, when we would be able to proceed with greater ease as the sun went down. Graham and I volunteered to cut steps down the slope, while others, who complained of not having had enough sleep, might stay on the rocks, and enjoy a spell, and join us at the bottom. We had not proceeded far when Graham was seized with cramp, and said he would have to return. For some time we tried to struggle on, but every time he stooped to clean out a stick he had another seizure, until, finally, we were compelled to return to our mates, whom we found enjoying his news on small ledges of rock, with hats and comforters drawn about their heads to protect them from the glare of the sun. At five o'clock, after the shadows of western peaks had gradually crept across the linda, and the sun began to disappear behind Mount Tasman, we once more awoke to activity, if, after having something to eat, began the descent of the snow slog, the condition of which had now slightly improved. We decided to keep along the upper part of the slope until we cleared a precipice of rock below, when we would be able to glissade to the bottom and gain the linda. On reaching the place from whence we intended to glissade, we found the ice destitute of snow, and also hard and rough, but nevertheless, in order to save time, we preferred to glissade it to cutting steps down, and coupling ourselves from the rope. Dixon went first, turning a somersault before reaching the bottom and skinning his nose, but fortunately shooting the small bergschrind at the bottom in safety. Graham went next, while I followed, and succeeded in giving the same acrobatic performance as the first man, to the amusement of the others, and also to the detriment of my unfortunate knuckles. Fife came last, if halfway down, struck a stone that had been frozen to the knives, slightly straining the tendons of his heel. An hour more and we were at the Bergshorn below Green's rocks, where we were compelled to cut steps, there being only a slight coating of snow on the top of the ice. At 7 p. m. we stood on the other side of Green's rocks, testing the hard clear ice of the bottom cool ore of the route chosen by Kaufman. A consultation was held, and the advisability of advancing discussed. So far as we knew, it would take about seven hours at least to cut to the top from where we stood, this meant two m, and as the thermometer read twenty skies, too cold for standing out all night, we decided to return to camp and make another attempt on the following day, when we could take advantage of the steps already cut. Just after crossing the Berkshire and below Green's rocks, before mentioned, and while we were plodding along the face of the upper slope of the Linda, we were aroused from our reverie at being defeated in speculations on the chances of success on the morrow by the alarm of danger from some cause, while at the same time Fife, who was in the lead, began to traverse the slope at a record pace, the rest of us giving him a hard run for first place. On looking up at the source of the alarm, we betled a huge block of ice tearing down in our direction accompanied by a small one. These had broken away from the nice glyphs above Green's rocks. Fortunately for us, the snow on the Linda was not sufficiently hard to bear the weight of this monster disturber of the public peace, and so we were allowed a little more time to escape from its clutches. The large block, weighing about six tons as we judged from the dimensions of it taken on passing it partly embedded in the snow below passed close on one side, while the small piece which I had not noticed, seemed to was past my eyes on the opposite side. Within a few feet, a fragment from one of the blocks struck me on the temple, raised a new pharaonologic bump, and caused a slightly dizzy sensation for a minute. Getting on to the tracks we had made coming up in the morning, we started off down the linda at the double quick, and soon reached the place where we had deposited our ski on the way up, 
Graham and Dixon decided to put theirs on, but Fife and I preferred to carry ours, as they agreed that the snow was to harden the slope too steep for us to be able to use them to any advantage. But the gentle art of skilling is not altogether without its amusing features, and a man with ski on a hardened steep snow slope is sometimes pretty much as helpless as a fish out of water. However, the two pairs of ski having, on this occasion, been properly adjusted to the respective feet of Dixon and Graham, we once more started off, quite unconscious of impending disaster. Suddenly there was a tug on the rope from behind, and on looking round, much to my amusement, I betled some twelve feet of timber being aimlessly brandished about in the air with Dixon's legs as the motive power than Graham, who was on the rope in front of me, would fall prostrate, embrace the merciless, hard with sounds no with a suddenness that was disconcerting, and experience the greatest difficulty in adjusting his lengthy feet for further advancement in such a predicament, until the ski are brought parallel. It seems almost an impossibility to prevent their crossing, one over the other, either in front or behind, this making them to appear the most awkward things a man could possibly put on his feet, yet in soft snow they are indispensable, and enable one to slide along almost without effort over the soft snow where otherwise he would have to plough away stiff and it would be an impossibility to proceed. After a few tumbles and the use of quite a number of forcible adjectives, the ski were dispensed with for the time being. If Following our marks up by the light of an Austrian Klimbentolent, we reached camp about ten, thirty p. m., having been about twenty and a half hours on the gar, pretty well all the time, after turning in, and while we were discussing what day of the week it might be, I discovered it to be my birthday, and with seeming mockery from my half laspy companions, while I lay shivering with cold, I was wished many happy returns of the day, and I now wish the same to any poor mortal who may spend his birthday on this same plateau or at the same altitude of about eight thousand feet above Sealveal in the New Zealand Alps, with no better prospect before him than being put on halfaloos and for breakfast the following morning. Next morning on getting up we found the snow falling gently. We had a talk over matters as to whether or not we ought to wait and give Cook another trial. Although our provisions were now all but done, finally it was decided that three should go down to the bivouac for some meat and biscuits that had been left there, while I should stay in camp and spread out the blankets to dry, should the weather clear. I had spent rather a miserable night in the cold damp blankets, having been an outside man, and was rather pleased to see, shortly after the departure of the others, the snow gradually becoming heavier and heavier. For this guaranteed my being able to have a sleep now that I had monopolized all the blankets, for I should not be able to spread them out to dry. The three who went to the bivouac were to boil a quantity of rice, make some porridge, and breakfast there, bringing back all the spare food they could muster. At who stayed behind, was left a sumptuous breakfast in the form of one sardine about one o'clock, Having got warm and having enjoyed a good sleep, I was awakened by a yell at the door of the tent and a call from Fife's scrum out of that old man, and so my peaceful slumbers were brought to rather an abrupt termination. Upon entering the tent he appeared clothed in a mantle of white, having glissaded down the slope from the summit of the dome. About twenty minutes later the other two put in an appearance with a kettle of rice, but had not brought on any other provisions, as they decided we should have to pack up and go back until the weather took up again. I now ate my breakfast and dinner together on sardine for the first course, with the rice and the scrapings from a marmalade jammed in as dessert. It was rather an awkward business getting the rice out of the small kettle, but we soon had spoons of all designs at work, fashioned out of empty tins, etc. A council of war was held and it was unanimously decided to stick to our guns, and not abandon the siege, though the combined efforts of all the demons of wind, hail, rained, and snow seemed anxious to drive us from out their stronghold. 
the elements had repulsed us again and again but still like true britons we lingered on expecting yet to accomplish the task we had set ourselves the last of our bread was gone so we agreed to return to the hut to replenish our larder leaving behind us the tent and all that we did not actually require illustration campomplato illustration crossing the mochison fife was dispatched without his wad so that he could hurry on and get to the hermitage that night a long journey while we stayed behind to carry on the blankets and wet clothing to be dried at the hut about three o'clock we got a start f at the bivouac on the way down had some porridge which the others had made in the morning on arriving at the head of the cool or down which the swags had been front and days previously graham and i were to search it while dixon searched one to the south of it having an idea that it was possible they might by some means or other have bounded out of the main cool or about whitehurst down our cool or i came to a sudden declivity in the snow and had to take to the rocks to avoid it coming into the cool or again below it on looking backward i could just see part of a swag showing through the snow divvying it out with my axe i discovered it to be the lighter of the two i thought i had now a good chance of finding the other as it must be farther down so taking up the one i had found i gave it a start concluding that the other heavier one and not having been stopped by the same obstruction would probably be close to where this one would now land on overtaking it on the snow from below the mouth of the Coolor, and looking forward about sixty yards i saw what appeared to be a slab of rock lying in the snow but which i was delighted to find proved to be the other swag resting on the top of some avalanche snow giving them both a start on the slope i set them going again quickly overtook them f keeping them before my feet soon glissaded to the bottom where i was joined by my mates we then decided to take them on to a shingle fan to the right there to unpack and spread the contents out to dry on reaching the hut we found a note left by fife warning us to be careful of the provisions as he understood the hermitage was very sparingly stocked next morning wednesday we were up at eight o'clock after a good night's rest to spread out the blankets and clothing to dry expecting fife to turn up in the afternoon when we should make another start for the plateau the afternoon came round but with no sign of fife and as there was no bread and meat left at the hut we felt anything but amicably disposed towards him however as long as we had a little flour we were not going to starve if as i said i had seen such a dish as flour porridge my mates prevailed upon me to attempt the making of some after dishing out a reasonable portion for any three white men i found i had still a plateful left and began to censure myself for having used too much flour to us no so precious however i was soon relieved from any anxiety on that score by inquiries as to whom the other plate was for saying it was a supposed surplus i soon had volunteers for its consumptions to prevent its going to waste after finishing the last of our cigarettes that had been wet and dried and indulging in the perusal of some of the hut literature we retired for the night about nine o'clock it began to blaw gradually increasing to a howling nor'wester which threatened to carry off the roof of the hut rendering sleep almost an impossibility until there came a lull towards morning when we managed to drop off it was late when we awoke next morning our breakfast of maizena being at eleven it m at three o'clock i took up the field gases and started off to see if i could find trace of fife who had not yet put in an appearance we were now becoming very anxious lest an accident had befallen him in the hooker river i had not gone more than a mile when i saw him in the distance wending his way along the moraine following closely in the footsteps of the old gray mare on his arrival at the hut we learned that the pigeon we had liberated had arrived safely and duneted with his message and that a newspaper fife had seen told of rough weather having been prevalent all over the country during the last week this was consoling news to us 
as they were now justified in expecting a spell of fine weather he also told us how he had met adamson coming to look for us the day we had come down to the hut failing to find any trace of us he was to have returned to light a fire on the moraine opposite the hut which was to have been the signal for two men to join him from glentoner and form a search party my brother on his way down had told adamson that we had only provisions to last until saturday or sunday at the latest if, if we did not put in an appearance by that time he might consider that there was something wrong it was tuesday evening when he arrived at the hut and there was still no sign of us hence his alarm for our safety after partaking of a stew which graham had volunteered to build from a little of all the different ingredients he could lay hands on in our replenished locker we retired with renewed hopes of getting a fine day and an early start in the morning for our fourth departure from this point for the summit of horiorangi the morning of friday went witterfee saw us up at four frodi the barometer had kept steady through the night so we had a good breakfast and at six thirty m we began to file out of camp once more there were some ominous clouds drifting about overhead but as the wind was from the south we hoped it might keep fine at nine o'clock after drying the things left on the shingle fan we began to ascend the tasman spur and reached the bivouac at twelve thirty p m where we boiled the billy with some scrub that we had carried up and had dinner three p m source on the top of the glacier dome where we were again met by a gusty wind carrying with it clouds of snow drift which coming in contact with the hands and face stung like needles on descending to the site of our previous encampment we found the excavation filled up with fresh snow so we had to set to work to clear the foundation and get the tent out the tent having been pitched some porridge was made in order to sieve our bread and meat in case we should again be weather bound we lay down intending to make a start any time between eleven and six o'clock should the weather show any signs of clearing eleven o'clock came but the wind and haze increased though not to any great extent on waking at six o'clock we found a small cornice hanging over our heads and feet and the tent almost collapsing from the weight of snow upon it a quantity had accumulated inside having drifted through a hole at the door and grain on awaking found himself being embraced by a reef of the beautiful snow eventually he had to turn out to shove a little way from round the tent and brush it off his blankets without stopping in the act you may be sure to bestow one glance of admiration upon it for either its beauty or its purity the weather cleared a little and we had a fair breakfast of cold roast mutton and scone crumbs with a cup of tea dixon spent most of the afternoon in clearing a space round the tent and about four o'clock we had our dinner of porridge during the afternoon the weather had cleared sufficiently to allow us to get a few shots with the camera at the surrounding peaks and our tent in the snow at six o'clock the wine began to abate and as the sun disappeared over it as our tent was almost instantaneously frozen as hard as a board the wine gradually died away as the dark mantle of night spread over us and at eight o'clock after having lain for a considerable time counting my breaths between the gusts to prove that the said squalls were becoming fewer the last feeble effort of the nor'wester exhausted itself in a vain endeavor to flap the sides of our now frozen tent intending to make an early start and not being able to sleep owing to the cold frosty air we lay chatting singing and discussing the possibility of our success on the morrow wine fife to retain as near as possible the normal heat of his body weren't a candle under his blankets about nine thirty p M. the lamp was lit and a kettle of snow put on so that we might have a good substantial meal before leaving as we had been economizing as much as for silver to previous meals that day consisted principally of porridge and a little meat minus bread about twelve o'clock midnight we crept out of the tent one man staying inside to pack all the spare clothing etc 
and to a sleeping bag, and to pass out such articles as we required, while the others set to work to unfasten the ski and ice cases that were holding up the tent. At one of M, we were roped together, ready for another attack upon the ice walled fort of Orondi. The night was clear and starry, not a cloud being visible, and we climbed in a dead calm. The great avalanche king himself seemed hushed to rest in the awful stillness of the midnight hours as we four mortals, like demons of the night, roped together, filed out of camp, the only visible sign of which was now a small square excavation in that great ice plateau of about one thousand acres in area, guarded and fed by the stupendous cliffs of Orangi, Tasman, Past, and the glacier demigenates of the ice regions, whose seemingly inaccessible peaks towered far above us. The broken, rugged flow of the Hochstetter ice fall stretched away thousands of feet below, forming a grand safeguard against mortal intrusion to this great ice field. And yet, Plaudine, as we climbed slowly down the gentle slope of the plateau in the gloom of the eternal hills at the midnight hour, people wonder what there is in mountaineering. I am used. Let the most unintecklechatel or the most an absurdan mortal step into our place lead him see and feel, and he will believe that there is a something here which awakens the dormant faculties of the mind and inspires one with thoughts profound, marching silently onward for some time, each one busy with his own thoughts. We soon found ourselves at the lowest part of the plateau. If, half an hour later, beginning to ascend the lower slope of the linda. The snow was quite hard, but we had carried our ski up in case of might set in and they should be required on our return. By the ferdy we had gained the broken ice of the linda, and a halt was called to light the climbent and and deposit the ski. We stuck them in the snow in the form of a triangle and lashed them together to prevent their being blown away, not being able to judge accurately. In the night time, the distance between Mount Stasman and Cook, we soon found we had kept a little too much to the left, and had struck the track of an avalanche from the side of Mount Cook, that we had on the former attempt avoided. However, preferring to cross it being early in the morning to retreating down a slope, we wended our way among the huge eye blocks and reached the other side in safety. The remnant of the waning moon was now about the horizon and soon the grey morning made its appearance in the east, enabling us to proceed without the use of the lantern. Good progress was made now, without any difficulty in avoiding the crevices. If, without sunrise, we reached the Bertrand, from which point to Green's rocks we had previously cut steps, we found them still in good order, only requiring a slight cleaning out. After entering there, as if in objection to our intrusion. We were greeted by a sharp crack, the ice evidently breaking under our feet. On nearing Green's rocks, Graham complained of feeling ill. A slice of lemon was prescribed first, and then a little brandy. But neither had the desired effect. We cautioned him to give warning if he felt himself becoming incapable. While we proceeded, keeping a good hold with our axes at each step, Occasionally we had to stop to give him time to revive, but succeeded in gaining Green's rocks in safety. The sun had not yet reached this part, and his feet, he said, felt as if they were frost-bitten. Leaving him in Dixon's charge, Fife and I proceeded to cut steps up the cooler until the sun should reach them, when we were to go back for lunch. In half an hour we returned and found Graham recovering. The provisions were handed out, above our supply of jam having given out, and it being too early to melt any snow on the rocks. The bread seemed to object to being eaten with meat alone. I managed to get to my fist down, but the third positively refused to be swallowed, and I was compelled to give it best. A few photographs were taken here with my brother's Kodak, which we had recovered with the swags and Fife was adjusting the legs of his camera to take some half a paid views, when they suddenly came asunder and two of them slid away down over the ice clefts on to the Linda. He threw the remaining one after them. A few seconds later the cap of the lens fell from his numbed fingers, 
and he was with difficulty restrained from adding the rest of the camera to the downward procession. About eight o'clock another start was made, and on reaching the termination of the steps I had cut, Fife took the lead and we made good progress. At last we took to the rocks, having hugged the cool or all the way for shelter from falling blocks of ice that might start from ice cliffs above, the rocks we found in bad and dangerous condition, being coated in places with ice, and consequently we made very little more headway than if we had had to cut every step. On getting up a steep piece of rock at the head of the first cool or the rope behind me got foul, we were compelled to carry our axes for use on the ice-covered rocks. Instead of having them slung on our wrists, and in order to clear the rope, I put mine down on what I thought to be a safe ledge, while I stooped to clear the rope. However, my ex slipped off, and was last seen hurrying off in the direction of Fife's canner legs, some hundreds of feet below. This was a bad job for me, but I had to be reconciled to the position, and accept the assistance of a wand about three feet in length and one inch thick, which Dixon was carrying for a flag stack. At eleven, thirty we had gained the foot of the second and upper couloir, where a halt was called for dinner. Here we discovered a splendid hollow reef struck, with a pool of water, apparently fashioned by nature for the purpose of quenching the first of weary travellers like ourselves, putting some oatmeal and sugar and a lemon into the water where it rested. We partook of as refreshing a drink as I had ever tasted, taking turn about. We soon drank the fountain dry, but had only to spread some snow on the rock to replenish the supply. Having enjoyed our midday meal, Dixon and Graham volunteered to cut up this couloir, while Fife and I, after our arduous morning's work, have a spell. I had a shot or two with the Kodak, while Fife adjusted his camera on some flat pieces of rock, one man holding its teddy while the other made the exposure as it was to call for a long stay of enforced idleness. We soon hailed the others above, requesting them to stop cutting until we had overtaken them. The ice chips which they dislodged acquired a great velocity before reaching us, making a humming sound in their descent. In a short time we had overtaken them, and when halfway up the cool or we again took to the rocks to avoid the steep ice at the top. Then, getting on to a more gentle slope, we cut steps up it to some serapice, preferring to chance the possibility of getting over this, as it seemed quite feasible. We kept slightly to the right in preference to going direct on to the reet, where we should have to cut every step, while here we were able to proceed by cutting only a few in places for about a hundred feet. The Bergschrind and final Lyscap were now in sight close at hand and borrowing Dixon's axe I once more relieved Fife of the step duft. In half an hour we had reached the Shrund, and found no difficulty in crossing it at the eastern side close to the reet. Here we discovered a curious formation, of which Green says nothing in describing his ascent. Instead of finding the nice cup hard clear ice, as we had expected, we found it to consist of a covering of horizontal icicles, giving it a perfect honeycomb appearance and rendering stepped off to very easy matter. This slope and the one above it was at an angle of only thirty degrees. On returning we found that this formation had its disadvantage, as the broken icicles had almost obliterated our steps. I was here relieved by Graham, and he and I made rapid progress up the first slope above the Berkshire and for half an hour, the other two having stayed behind for a short spell, we were working hardened willingly, congratulating ourselves that we should have the summit of our Angi under our feet in an hour at the latest, when we were hailed by Faf, asking if we did not think it was time to turn. It was now five o'clock. The time he said Green had turned, we found afterwards he had not turned till an hour later, and he had, we all know, to spend an anxious night on a narrow walk ledge below the bottom couloir, to make things worse, we had left our lantern at Green's Rocks, as we had expected to be back there in daylight, but we had now little time to spare to gain that point before darkness set in. 
deferring to those who had called out from below. As we understood they, the older and more experienced climbers, had decided to retreat. We halted in our steps and discontinued the ascent. I am of opinion now that we should have gone on. The hardest and most difficult work had been safely accomplished, and there only remained about an hour's step off to a fairly easy slope of some thirty degrees or less. However, we thought it well then to act on the advice of others. We stopped a few minutes to admire the great panorama of mountain, glacier, lake, river, forest, and sea below us. From the point of turning a marvelous panorama of alpine grandeur merged in two distant forests, whose dark shadows loomed in strong contrast to the ice-clad mountains and the ocean to the westward. To the north along vista of snow-pad mountains was visible until lost in extreme distance. The higher peaks stood in bold relief against a dark blue and cloudless spot, rearing their skull-lad summits far above the dense mist that rolled in the valleys at their base. The silver sheen of the river Esmond enabled us to trace the windings of its numerous branches four miles. We could see lakes Picapi and Ticapo, but the greater part of the Mackenzie country was invisible below a dense rolling mist that made us conjure up visions of the Arctic regions. The higher peaks at the head of Lake Ticapo were clearly visible, which we took to be Mount Jukes, being particularly prominent. The Franning Maltbrun Range, to which we had so often looked up, was now below us, nearer at hand. Host and the Askliff Tusman of Glory is peak from this point rittered their snowy heads aloft. Far down below in the gloom of evening lay the great Desmond Glacier, guarded by the everlasting hills. The beautiful Lely de Beaumont and de la Beck, near its head, half hidden in the clouds, westward was the ocean, visible four miles and miles, more than twelve, zero feet below us, soon after five p. m. The descent was commenced, down the long isle door, roped together, we slowly went in single file, the axes of my companions clinking into the ice at every step. At, unfortunately, was now without an axe, and I had often to grip the steps with my hands till the skin was pretty well worn from off my knuckles, and there was risk from frostbite. Well, however, made good progress down to Green's Rocks, and got out of the last of our steps at P. M. Just as it was getting dark, half an hour afterwards we lit the lantern and made a quick passage down to the foot of the Linda. We then crossed the plateau once more and reached our camp to tired to discuss future plans till the morning. Illustration. Elegy moment. It was too cold to sleep, but we rested till daybreak. A cold wind was blowing, and there were signs of more bad weather. Our provisions were at an end, and as it meant a long delay to get a further supply, and both Dixon and I had now to return, we decided to accept defeat for the present. We accordingly set to work to pack up the swags. Wine Fife, taking only his camera, started off ahead. By the time we had reached the top of the dome with our swags, the wind had increased to a gale, and it was with the greatest difficulty that we managed to get to the top of the dome. It was only by making a rush every now and then between the strong gusts of wind that we succeeded at all. A gust of wind would cat the swags, and we had continually to crouch low down in order to prevent ourselves from being blown away. It was very difficult work for me, who had now no ice case, and before long my knees as well as my knuckles were skinned through coming into frequent contact with the frozen neve, arriving at the top of the dome. We were just in time to see Fife disappearing down below in the direction of the bivouac, en route to the hut. The start he had got enabled him, as he had nothing but the camera to carry, to get down to the sheltered side of the rig before the full force of the gale could strike him. We climbed down from the dome on rocks and snow. The snow slopes were frozen hard, and we had to cut steps and descend backwards on the rope because of the strong wind and the heavy swags we were carrying. The light driving snow and the force of the wind made it difficult for us to open our eyes. After about six hours' continuous hard work we got under the shelter of a rock, 
we were shivering with the cold and presented rather a strange appearance with the icicles hanging from our hair our nostaxis and even our eyebrows fife and i had lost our heads he had been blown away and a handkerchief that i had tied round my head had also been blown away we waited a while in hope of the winds moderating and then as it was getting late we decided to push on about two chains further on was another rock and here we stopped and had a further consultation we were all pretty well exhausted by this time through our long battle with the wind and i especially was very tired as i had come down all the way without an ice case so we decided to camp and pitch the tent in the shelter of the rock the storm that night was something awful the snow and the wind in a howling blizzard jacanty and the prospect was dolorous in the extreme the tent was pitched on the snow after we had scraped a level place for it we then divided what little food we had left some oatmeal and sugar which we mixed with a little snow and partakov and retired for the night sleep was out of the question we simply lay and shivered all night though gray among the inside was not so badly off we afterwards learned from fife that the gale was so severe in that esmin valley that the end wall of the hut sagged in several inches if being rather afraid of a collapse he got up and shifted his quarters to the leeward compartment we were astir at seven o'clock next morning and having packed the swags we started off in what we thought to be the right direction but what with the snow and the drift we could not see many yards ahead and soon found ourselves on the verge of the precipices above the hoxteter ice fall we had to retrace our steps for some distance and in order to shorten our journey we then took to a steep snow slope a little to the right of the track we had come down here we found the slope in such bad or dare layer of soft snow superimpsuings the clear ice that we had again to cut steps almost right up to the rock we had camped under we then found that we had been only about two chains from the top of the ridge leading to the bivouac rock to get to the latter we had now to keep to the rocks as the snow was dangerous it was not till about midday that we reached the bivouac it was then beginning to clear and the wind was not strong so we spent some time trying to melt snow on the rocks but with very poor results here we got some tinned meat that had been previously opened but dixon's hands were so cold that he let the tin slip and it went sliding down the swag cool or bon recall after a halt of about an hour we started for the hut and finding the snow in the long cool or better than any we had traversed that day we took to it we decided to throw the swags down once more but first got into a position from which we could watch their entire descent the two heaviest swags went right down the cool or bringing up on the snow within a few feet of each other the lightest swag however stopped some two chains higher up no damage was done and a few things that came out of the lightest swag we were able to pick up on the way down we made rapid progress down the couloir and were soon surprised to see fife coming up in search of us we shouted to let him know we were still alive and he waited while we came down we learnt that he had spent a very anxious night throughout the storm at the hut and had upbraided himself a good deal for having left us on the following morning he was undecided what to do he thought of going down to the hermitage for assistance but finally concluded that if anything had happened to us we would not by that time be alive so he decided to start off and see for himself before giving any alarm his heart was in his mouth as he wended his way up the hasman's spur and so at the bottom of the cool or the swags but no sign of the climbers he was actually afraid for a time to go near them he expected to get some clue by closer examination but when he reached them he could not tell from the shoulder traps whether they had been sent down intentionally or not he saw however that they had come down that morning if placing them together he started up the slope hoping for the best and soon was overjoyed to hear our shouts above recognizing that we were all in the flesh and concluding that it must take a good deal in the way of exposure to kill an average mountaineer he retraced his steps if sitting down on the srags 
patiently awaited our arrival. Here my narrative may as well end. I need say nothing about our journey back to civilization. Dixon and I had reluctantly to return. Fife and Graham remained to try again. Since then Dixon has gone back once more from Christchurch. And at the moment of writing, for all I know, he may be shivering in storm under the bivouac rock, or frizzling in the glare of a fierce noonday sun on the remorseless white slopes of the upper linda, looking back in our battles with wind and weather, on a mountain in such vile condition, thinking of all our hardships and privations, and looking, though, at my slowly healing knuckles, which I nearly lost altogether in contact with ice desps of the upper colours. My only regret is that I am not with them. Chapter by the conquering of a round and acted at length. Upon a sunny day, they started off once more, and climbed as they had climbed before. Phil, all their troubles passed, with scarce a halt upon their way. They reached the top at last, another fragment. All the attempts by Green's route having ended in failure. Fife and George Graham now decided to try the western side of the mountain for a more direct route to the summit. Fife had always held the opinion that a practical way to the summit might be found from the upper part of the Hooker Glacier. On December 11th, about a month after our first arrival at the Hermitage, they started off one day to explore the Hooker side of Mount Cook. Fife eagerly scanned the mountain. If on the way up, had picked out two routes by which he rightly thought the summit of the mountain might be reached. One was by way of the western spur of the lowest or most southerly peak, and thence along the ridge over the middle peak to the northern or highest point. The other route was from the head of the Hooker Glacier and up an astral conic cool or leading to Green Saddle and thence by the reet direct to the highest peak. The latter was the route by which they were eventually successful. They left the Hermitage on December 16th with a tent and five days' provisions. On the 18th, after camping for a couple of days in the valley, they made their way up the Hooker Glacier through badly broken and creviced ice. In one place they found a white crevice where a snow bridge had fallen in and wedged itself lower down. It was so wide that their six to fights rope would not reach across it. If, to make matters worse, Steps had to be cut on the perface of the crevice. Campras pitched on a rib of rock above the glacier on the right, and a reconnaissance made. On the following day, taking with them only blankets, provisions, and a little firewood, a second camp was made farther up the glacier. First the ground was leveled alongside a big rock, and all the larger stones were carefully picked out. Then a rubble wall was built at each end and the remaining side was sheltered by a mound of snow scraped up with a billy. All was snug by 7 p. m. And as the two climbers lay in their blankets, they chatted over the chances of the morrow or groped underneath for some particularly prominent stone that was likely to disturb their repose. For the elevation 6,400 feet the night was not cold, and they rested fairly well. They were a steer at one. Fervium. m for their first attempt by the middle peak, Don appeared at two. Fortive wood. F. Roping up. They started on their climb. They had to cross several crevices on snow bridges before reaching the true western spur, an offshoot of which runs in a more northerly direction. The Narit, however, was so difficult and irregular that they were forced on to the snow slope again. Mr. Fyth. In an account published in the Otago Daily Times, gives the following account of the climb. On coming to its head, some slight difficulty was experienced in finding a place to get on to the spur. But once gained, it proved good, and for about five hundred feet an easy grade. After this, it became much steeper and gradually narrowed into a sharp ridge. After some two thousand feet of rocks, liking the lowest peak came in sight. And at ten, Fervium, M, we stood on the true western reach running up to the same. We had now the choice of cutting steps up onto the crest of the retour, by keeping down a little on the northern side, of skirting along the rocks. We chose the latter, and found that, 
although owing to their being partly buried in snow they were difficult still they were much easier and quicker than stepped aft we had now been in the sun some time and a short halt was cried for tucker they efforts were made by one of the party to melt some snow but even the sultry language he indulged in had no effect on its icy coldness it is a strange sensation this being surrounded by snow and ice if though dying for a drink unable to obtain a mouthful skirting along these partly buried rocks and cutting a few steps here and there across slippery patches nothing stopped us and at eleven at m we stood on the highest rocks we were now at an altitude of eleven seven hundred feet and our prospects of doing the remaining six hundred odd feet looked rosy from here it was necessary to descend about four hundred feet to reach the saddle which separates the first and second peaks this we had little difficulty in doing good rocks running right down the sun was no very powerful and we took advantage of it to melt the snow and drink to our heart's content step tuft commenced at a cool ore which runs from the empress glacier right up to this coal and the axe was kept steadily going until the summit of the middle peak was reached on nearing the crest of the reet we soon had ample evidence that it was heavily corniced the axe going right through when we were several feet from the edge keeping about twenty feet away from the true crest we cut steps along the face of the ice cop thus practically making a long traverse at one peak m we stood on the top of the second peak only one hundred seventy vist feet lower than the actual summit of the mountain a glance and we saw that our chances of doing the remainder were remote although only so little in actual height above us it was still a long way off and the reet was so corniced and took so many turns that to do the summit would require a long traverse involving many hours work having the other route to fall back on we decided not to expend our energies further on this one and so again calmly accepted defeat the view from the second or middle peak was exceedingly grand the descent was quickly accomplished and they had some splendid glistening back to the bivouac where the slopes were not steep enough for glistening ploughing through the snow was the order of the day and the man coming last on the rope had a rough time if he made a false step for he involuntarily received from his companion plunging on in front a jerk that generally pulled him off his feet and caused him to take an unwilling header into the snow fife had a vivid recollection of graham's legs on one occasion waving in mute supplication whilst he for a few moments vainly endeavoured to extricate his head and shoulders from the snow all the smaller crevices were shot plissiting while shooting one of these crevices the rope somehow became entangled and pulled one of the climbers up with a sudden jerk fairly across the fissure his feet resting on one edge and the back of his neck on the other he was however equal to the occasion if stiffening himself he lay there in perfect composure until assisted across by his companion the hardy climbers now returned to the hermitage after twenty own hours constant going and were glad to get into comfortable beds again at the hermitage they fell in with jack clark and he readily agreed to join them in an attack on the highest peak by the other route clark had climbed with them the previous season and his enthusiasm gave new life to the whole affair finally these three left the hotel with six days supplies and made their first camp on the evening of december twenty Xedic. next day continues fike's account we toned painfully swadladen through the ever widened crevices to a second bivouac further up the glacier narrowly escaping a fall of rocks that came bounding from the morehouse range we arrived sore and tired although the actual distance covered and height gained were trifling little inclined as we were for another day's swagging tenet m next day found us again warily plodding on our upward course we pitched the tent under the lee of a huge block of ice that had apparently fallen from street david's dome at a height of about eight thousand feet an arch was cut into this block a breek went built round and so sheltered were we that i believe we could have weathered a severe storm 
Leaving Clark in camp, Graham and I proceeded up the glacier with the double object of breaking steps and of exploring the large berg shrint at its head. We kept to the true right of the glacier going up, but found it very much creviced and swept by avalanches from Street, David's Dome and Mount Hector. We passed some enormous crevices, some we estimated as being fully two hundred feet across and of great depth, another and common thing so high up was a vertical shaft descending into the glacier. Graham anchoring. I crawled to its edge and peered down, but could see no bottom, its blue sides shading away until lost in impenetrable darkness. Two hours brought us to the Bergschrind, and our worst fears were fully confirmed. No bridge of any description spanned its gaping depths. Our only chance was to find a passage where it ran out against the rock face of Rangi. Traversing to this, we saw that it was possible to descend right into the Bergschrind and reach the rocks at its scent. These looked barely practicable. We kept to the left side of the glacier going back, and found it much simpler. Only one crevice of any consequence having to be dealt with. Our bleak bivouac was regained just as the sun sank behind Mount Stokes. After some food and a refreshing drink of hot tea, we lay down on our raspold couch, fondly hoping to snatch a few hours sleep. Dane hope on going to rest at these high camps. The usual plan is not to undress, but to crowd on everything obtainable. And anyone leaving an article of clothing lying about is sometimes greatly surprised at the mysterious manner in which it disappears at night, but always religiously turns up again in the morning in time to be rolled into the owner's swag. At Toon, M. Brain, shivering and growling, arose to prepare breakfast. We had brought a good supply of dry firewood from our first camp, and breakfast was ready much too soon for Clark and I who were making the most of the blankets, getting on our boots with great difficulty being turned, apparently, into something akin to castor one packed up everything we were likely to require, if, roping together, moved upwards at three. Fifteen. M. The snow was very hard, but the steps we had broken the previous day were of great assistance, and an hour's climbing sore standing on the lower lip of the Bergschrind, letting out the rope to its full length. One of the party descended into the Bergschrind and squirmed along the ledge of rocks as far as the rope would reach. Then the others crossed on to the rocks, clinging as we were to a narrow ledge, with scarcely any hand or foothold, and with an almost perpendicular drop into the chasm below. Our position was far from enviable. If, as the leader slowly and with great difficulty made his way upwards, a slip seemed, to say the least, not altogether improbable. Some snow lying on the ledge had to be shifted, and caused a little delay, and for forty minutes the excitement and suspense were too intense to be pleasant. However, we managed to get across in safety. Above we found the snow hard, and we kept well against the rock's four handholds. This slope gradually converges into a deep ravine formed by the frowning crags of Orangi on the one side and by Mount Hector on the other, beginning at Green Saddle and running out in the slope just above the Bergschrind. A rib of rocks divides this ravine into two narrow ice-field couloirs. As we got higher up, the amount of snow lying on the slope became less and less, and at last the clear blue ice was reached, cutting steps across a little branch couloir. We decided to cross the cool or lying between us and the rib of rocks, and to endeavor to keep along its ridge. At first these rocks proved difficult, a rotten slaty rock having to be dealt with, but they improved towards their top end. As we neared green saddle the reet of these rocks became very sharp, with precipitous sides, and in two places was capped with ice. We had two cut steps up these places and without further bother reached a point a few feet below Green Saddle at Atam. Here we were stopped by a break in the rib which completely barred direct access to the saddle. Turning a little to the left, we climbed up over what was perhaps the worst rock of the whole ascent, on to the southern reet of Hector, and from thence descended to the saddle. The reet which runs from here to the summit of Orangi is, with the exception of one slaty stratum, 
composed of gov, sound rocks, this slaty stratum, about thirty feet in height, was most difficult. Halfway up the leading man got into difficulties, all holes being just beyond his reach, causing him to make an awkward traverse by and holds only to a little chimney, up which he rid his way. Above this, the going was good, and we rapidly rose. Looking back at ten, thirty, m, we could see that we were far above all the surrounding peaks. F, although the top of Arandi could not be seen, we knew it could not be far distant. One wall of slate brought us to a standstill, and we had to descend a few feet, leave the ridge, and work our way round the obstacle. The wind was now purchingly cold, and we were glad to muffle our faces in anything to protect them. A few minutes' respite from its bitter blast and a slight snack were now very acceptable, and we climbed down to shelter on the sunny side. What with consulting maps and sketching, the few minutes were prolonged into an hour and a half, and it was just midday as we filed off upwards. At twelve, thirty the slope of the reet became easier and shortly afterwards the final top appeared about four hundred feet above us. I am afraid that the reckless way in which we romped over those last rocks was very foolhardy, but one would indeed need to be phlegmatic not to get a little excited on such an occasion. The slope of the final lascop was easy, and only required about a hundred steps, which were quickly cut. And at one, thirty p, m, on Christmas Day we exultantly stepped on to the highest pinnacle of the monarch of the southern Alps. They stayed only twenty minutes on the summit, and then commenced the descent. The first rocks were soon reached, and there they built a cairn, underneath which they left it in upon which they had scratched their names and the date. They left these rocks shortly after two p. m. and Green's saddle was passed at five. Twenty p. m just as they got a few feet below it. A rock avalanche shot past, making the ridge tremble as the blocks recocketed from crag to crag down the mountain side. During the whole time they were on this ridge, stones were continually clattering down on either side. Going down some slaty rocks, Graham lost his eye space. He thus describes the incident we were just getting on to the snow to cross the cool or when a handhold broke with me and the sling of my axe slipping over my wrist the axe slid away down the slope, stopping above a small shrund. Going down the rocks to the lowest point, Fap secured himself and paid out all the rope one hundred feet, and then I, holding on to the rope, slid down to the end. F, scrambling across the slope, was just able to reach the adventurous axe. This incident caused a delay of nearly an hour, a delay that could be ill-afforded, as it would soon be dark. Fife, continuing his account of the descent, writes, when nearing the Bergshrind and ominous, Nakam Stakenstawiz above warned us that danger was coming. Crouching close into the rocks, several pieces of stone went pinging over us at a pace that rendered them invisible and buried themselves feet deep in the soft snow. This particular place is, in my estimation, the only dangerous part of the whole route, but fortunately only so in the afternoon. All the way down I had been anxious to get across the Berkshire before dark. If, but for the dropping of Graham's axe, we would have done so. It was with great uneasiness I saw that we should have to stand out all night or risk climbing down in the dark. The latter was preferred, to dark to see either hand or footholds. Our sense of touch was all we had to rely on. One at a time we moved down, the other two endeavouring to anchor. But, judging from the holds that I myself could obtain, a slip by one would have done for assault. However, the shrund was left behind, and with it the greatest difficulties of the descent. Now for the first time we gravely congratulated each other on the scent and descent of Mount Cook. We reached the bivouac tired and wet, only to find that one side of our snow breek wind had fallen on to the tent, if melting, had soaked everything. It was very cold, and it is not all joy pishing a tent with the thermometer down to about twenty degrees. We turned in Sapolis, 
no one volunteered to face the cold and melt some snow so cold did we become that at last we were forced to burn a candle in a tin can underneath the blankets while the hours of darkness passed wearily away day dawned at last f hastily packing up we plunged away down the glacier we reached our first camp at seven at m and were glad to rest till ten frodi meanwhile basking in the sun and making great inroads into a bag of oatmeal as we lay idly watching the northwest cloud swirling overhead our trials were all forgotten and i regretfully thought here is but one orangi illustration that put from upper tasman thus was the conquering of orangi after many heroic struggles accomplished by the pluck endurance and initiative of the young new zealanders who oh, in a far country had taught themselves the craft of mountaineering chapter v above the plains high hills that bathed themselves in rain f having bathed loom yet again more glorious or the smiling plain and in, in the southern corner of the north island westward of the Werripara plains there rises a mountain mass of considerable height and boldness of formation known as the Tararu range in some of the moistly urine strayed winds from the south pacific ocean wrap its five thousand and its summits in grace whirling mist and rain and in winter the keen blustering squalls from the frozen south clove its peaks and ridges with snow between times there are bright dicing narrowly during the passing of a crest of anticollision if the upper air is gloriously fresh and clear for this region at the invitation of an unknown hearst we set out from the capital one fine summer's afternoon leaving the beautiful valley of the upper hut behind our train with its engines puffing and snorting and belching forth great clouds of maladorous smoke begins to crawl up the steep incline towards the summit there the fell engines take charge and we start to move cautiously down the steep windings of the remuta incline with the strong steel brakes striking fire from the central rail for many years this railway was thought to be a somewhat wonderful engineering feat now it is more generally regarded as an engineering blunder and a costly one at that down the steep ravine and its transverse quarries the northwesterly winds howl and screech making the carriages rike on the rails once the train was actually blown from the metals and there was loss of life the spot is marked by a wooden palisading that acts as a breek wind nearing the end of the narrow deep treeless valley down one side of which the line winds we get our first glimpse of the sunlit plains of the vara prat a splash of yellow with the sombre shade of the ravine for foreground frame F in the distance the thin soft greys of farwo low-lying hills on the right the lake somewhat half for it lead reflects the light of the dying day from its murky waters half an hour later we are clank clanking across the plains in the darkness towards our destination pondering upon what might be the physical characteristics and mental attributes of our known host oh on the strength of our being mountaineers had sent us a cordial invitation to climb the Tararu ranges with him as a general rule it is little use indulging in speculation about the unknown the captain my wife and myself full pictured our host in different ways and we were all wrong the name beto can to scottish ancestry for the rest when we had picked him out from the slowly melting crowd on the platform we found him well up in years but still alert in mind and brisk in body and for all his years he promised to let us a merry dance over the hills the which he did he was waiting for us with a wug on it driven by himself and a dog cart driven by one of his daughters in these two vehicles we distributed ourselves and our lovevich captain had lost high and drove across the upper plain to a commodious farmhouse and a hospitable welcome our host had a great love for the mountains inherited no doubt from the wild northerners who were his ancestors and he was loud in his praises of the views and plants and flowers to be seen above the plains as our objective mount holdsworth 
was a hill of only some five thousand feet. We did not expect real climbing. But Yortro Mountaineer does not measure mountains altogether by altitude. Neither does he regard them with that smug insensibility to mountain beauty that Mark Johnson and his Boswell, as has been pointed out by Professor Ramsey in quoting that paragraph about the Highland Hills, in which, as the professor says, the stephical side of the learned doctor's soul is laid bare, they exhibit little variety, being wholly covered with dark heath, and even that seems to be checked in its growth. What is not heath is Nacton's is, a little diversified by now and then a stream rushing down the steep, and I accustomed to flowery pastures and waving harvests is astonished and repelled by this wide extent of hopeless sterility. The appearance is that of matter incapable of form more usefulness, dismissed by nature from her care, and disinherited of her favors, left in its original elemental state, or quickened only with one sullen power of useless vegetation. Thus, as Professor Ramsey adds, presents an exact parallel to the sentiment of a West Highland sea captain who could understand people admiring the beauty of Green Accord Warp, with their trim villas and straight paths, but could see not to admire on Loch Fine where there was nothing but rocks and woods, and the Lyco that, therefore let us thank God that we are not like Drive, Johnson, or even the West Highland sea captain, and that we can see form and even beauty in the hills, Indeed, as Douglas Freshfield has well said, that nothing that is mountainous is alien to us, that we are addicted to all high places, wherever man has not forked out nature, holding these sentiments, need I apologize to the reader for introducing him to this mountain range on whose summits one may commune with nature. But see conveying for hazardous adventure the reader will decide the question according to his own tastes and inclinations. That night it was decided that our Harst, his son, and his eldest daughter should accompany us on the climb. If, early in the morning, we expected a minister of the church to join us, with the captain, my wife, and myself reworked. Thus, a large party, we intended to retire early to rest, but supper and conversation kept us late. At last, we said good night. The Lugdulus is scapped and disappearing with a brobdigation sleepings which left over, unsold, from some church bazaar, and brought to light only upon such occasions to clothe the fair form of summit on us like. Pigenalee's visitor, every preparation had been made for an early start, and, of course, we all slept in. It seemed as if I had only been asleep half an hour when I heard the parson whistling a tune to the clatter of his horse's hoofs as he cantered up the road. I threw open my window and gave him early greeting. He had the most certain and insistent of all alarm clocks in his house, a three minute hold babby, and he was the only one of the party on time. The dawn was just breaking above the distant hills, and the dawns and the sunrises of these plains produce pageantries that, once seen, will be remembered. Our plan was to drive across the plain, ford the Wabnoha River, and go some little distance up the Mongeration tributary. At the last farmhouse we cried a halt, if, from this point, for the remaining seven miles, which is mostly over steep ascents, we had to depend upon Shank's pony. The Mongeration with its prescalier water drains the eastern slopes of Mount Holdsworth, and as it races over its rocky bed, through the heart of the forest, it is a beautiful stream. Its special at murmuring blending with the rustling of the Bicarti leaves so that both together form a fitting accompaniment to the plaintive notes of the birds in these solitary glades. Leaving this stream behind, we plod of along a well-rodkin path, fringed with beautiful ferns, between the tall forest trees. The grade, easy at first, soon became steep, so that the cold shade was welcome. The forest that clothes the lower slopes of our great mountain ranges is frequently of beech trees, erroneously called by the settlers birch. On the slopes of the Tararas, the magnificent, straight trunks of these stately trees, their spreading branches, and their beautiful tarsier of foliage that more than half hides the blue above are a constant source of wonder and delight. 
one is reminded of the forest between Milford Sound and Tianu, or of that on the sides of Mount Ernst Lake Wakatapia. There is not much undergrowth in a beech forest, if often, scarcely any sign or sound of bird life. On Onslow, for instance, one hears little but the rustle of the leaves in the wind. On a still day at an altitude of a few thousand feet the woods seem as silent as the grave, but in the North Island, at a similar altitude, there is more variety of vegetation and more life. Beetles and butterflies are more plentiful. And words, though not many, are in sufficient number and variety to add interest to our journeyings. The coo of the wood pigeons and the low woo woo of its wings cleaving the still air make music among the whispering beeches as we follow the winding path to the first steep brae. A red admiral Vanessagon rill arises from beside a brooklet, his wings of black and gold and red flashing in the sunlight, as, with erratic flight, he hurries away, fearing disaster and seeking the shade rather than the sunshine. Down beside that brooklet he has been reared from the largest stage on the New Zealand nettle, where, in the lowly hours of his life's history, he folds himself a little tent of leaves wherein he can grow, secure from all his enemies. At a later stage, when he is thinking of emerging in all his gloriousness of gay colour as a full-folded butterfly, he spins a little patch of silk from which he hangs on the underside of a leaf. Then, before one brief day is over, he has burst his skin and wriggled out of it as a dark or brown quilt or pupa with spots of gold or silver, a premonition of the coming glory that delights that alike of the naturalist and of the casual woodland rover. After we have climbed a thousand feet or so, the giant beeches give place to more stunted trees and scrub. If presently we emerge upon an eminence from whence we look out across the plains, toward which the rivers run in silver threads, thence the pathway wanders through an upland swamp before taking a downward plunge once more into the forest primeval, at the foot of this declivity, close to a spring, is the camp in place from which the final ascent is usually made. A government had has since been built in place of the two tents that now sheltered the wearied bodies of walled mountaineers. We found a billy of water simmering on a dying fire, left by one of the trackmakers, and soon we were drinking most delicious bushman's tea with our second breakfast, the cawing of the pigeons the harsh crotty cry of the cockle, and the note of the now early seen parakeet were among the sounds that fell upon our ears in our woodland break fatchel. The plaintive, sibilant whistle of the long-tailed cuckacurporia of the Maori and the Udinimacete tensis of the ornithalacia it's the forest from the thick bushes on our left. He is a shy bird, and when you stalk for a sight of him of ten unsuccessfully come to the conclusion that he is a ventral lavachal, for one moment his seek-seek comes loud and clear as if he were just behind that bare stump a dozen yards away, while in the next minute it will be sounding faint and low, and thus giving you the impression that he has flown afar, and all the time our long-tailed, brown visitor has not shifted from his perch, but has simply been fooling you with a modulation of his verse. Both the long-tailed cuckoo and the shining cuckoo come to New Zealand every year in the summer from the Pacific Islands of higher latitudes. If late in autumn, they go back to those warmer climes. Meantime, Mistress Kerporia has made the little grey warbler do duty as foster before, and she takes her young back with her to the islands of the coral seas. The setting insult to injury for she has previously eaten the eggs or even the young found in the pretty pencil nest of the warbler. In 1890, Sir Walter Buller secured two specimens of the cocko, both of which were gored with young birds, and thirty-six years ago he found in the stomach of one of them a small fledgling robbed from another nest. Once again he surprised a cuckoo carrying off in his beak a two's egg. I am afraid, therefore, that we cannot give our distinguished visitor a certificate for fine feeling, gentlemanly instincts, or epicurean delicacy. Illustration, Mount Darwin, near the upper camp, where we have been eating our second breakfast, and listening to these birds. The forest has, at one time, 
been swept by a great fire, and the scar left is only now being slowly healed. From the camp we begin the final steep ascent. As we climb, the trees grow more gnarled and stunted, many of them festooned with long, pendant mosses, seem to have the ghostly pallor of death already about them. Others are mere bleached skeletons, rearing their gaunt trunks and leafless arms above the living foliage. We emerged from this stunted forest on to a narrow, rocky ridge, and betled above and around us a wonderful variety of subplane vegetation. The beautiful yellow ran in quassalus and cygnus grew in profusion, dotting the subplane carpet with shining gold, Salmesias were here in some variety, and that strange product of the New Zealand hill, the Rallier, or vegetable sheep, a connecting link between the alpine vegetation of the North and So Islands, was to be found over a wide area. Here also we came upon quantities of the fragrant and quaint-looking Rallia rubra, with its embricketing leaves and tiny, dark crimson flowers forming dense hemispheracial patches on the ground. But finer than all these, and most surprising to me, was the wonderful profusion of Edelweiss, in full flower, that starred the mountainside. In all our travels in the southern Alps we had never seen such a sight in itself sufficient to repay us for the toil of the climb. It was evident that it was a different species from the Halyahem grandesis of the southern Alps, F on subsequently comparing it, on my return, with grand and with the Swiss Edelweissli and Topidum Alpinen, I found it was much more closely allied to the latter, but with flower heads of different structure. It was, formerly, the Nahaliatum Colenso of Hooker, but is now, I believe, classed as Halishriumli and Topidin. One could continue to expatiate at some length on this botanical paradise but we must hurry on to the mountain top. The final bit of the climb is easy, and we are soon enjoying a magnificent and extensive view from the summit. Looking from below, one regards the range as narrow, but on the summit one is undeceived, for the eye wanders over a broad expanse of rolling hilltop and deep ravine, with scarred quarry and forced last slope leading down to the depths, and here and there silver bends of river flowing gracefully plain birds, Southwards the forests on Alpha and Omega and the lesser heights loom dark and mysterious. Northward the Mitri lifts himself above the bush line, and cleaves the clouds with his sharper five thousand at peak. Further on, still, the range slopes towards Mount Dundas four thousand nine hundred forty four feet, and practically ends with Ankavuktoyu three thousand five hundred eighty feet, the last mountain in the range worthy of a name on our map more to the west, through a gap in the chain. On a fine day, is the Sioux, gray and mysterious in the haze of distance, but now hidden by the swirling clouds that come down on the wings of the northwest wind, gathering up moster as they go, only to be torn asunder and robbed of the rain on these serried mountain peaks. Turin, together with the hot summer suns of the higher latitude, lies the secret of this belt of glorious sioux plain vegetation, the fringes of which only, as yet, have been touched by the botanist and the entomologist. And yonder, below us, far down, is the plain, stretched like a map at our feet. One conjures up digions of it in the long ago, when, perchance, the ice streams and rivers of a post plocean period were bringing down the gravels and clays of which it is composed. If, if we go back to original causes, it is not two governments, nor two stupid parliaments with their fetish of few falding legislation, but to the mills of those old gods, which grind exceeding small, that we must attribute the prosperity of the farmer on the plain below, one can almost hear this vast expanse of level land prying. From out the mists of antiquity, I am the plain, barren since time began. Yet do I dream of motherhood, when man one day at last shall look upon my charms, and give me towns, like children, for my arms, if, sitting up here on the hilltop, amidst driving mists and gleams of fitful sunshine, 
one pursues this train of fought down the centuries, past the time of the Mo and the Mari, and the advent of the Pikehar, and the fortified pond the old stockade. The red blood of tribal war has dyed the soul below, and those mounds, which we ourselves have seen upon the level plain, were dug from Mother Rith to make ovens in which the flesh of the slain was cooked for human food. Not all was peace. We travelled in the print of old and wars, yet all the land was green, and love we found, and peace, where fire and war had been. They pass and smile. The children of the sword no more the sword they wield, and oh how deep the corn along the battlefield it was a quick transition from the spear to the plough. First the pioneer, squatting on his inbounded run. Next, the road and the railway, and then more settlers, and more settlers still, but never enough settlers. For this fair land shall hold many millions where now it holds one, but these musings on the plain below and its past are disturbed by a chance remark from our genial host, with frosted head, sitting beside his fair daughter on the hilltop. Thirty years ago he climbed these mountains, and he knows the history of the plain as only the pioneer knows it. He is the typical colonist in his garden. In that delightful poem of William Pember Reeves, So, I have poured o'er plain and hill gold, up and handed, Wealth that will win children's children's smiles, autumnal glories, glowing leaves, under reedy flowers and warmth of sheaves, midweary pastoral miles, yonder my poplars, burning gold, flaring tall rows of torches burled, spire beyond kindling spire, then, raining gold round silver stem, soft birches gleam, outflanking them, my oak stay pretty your fire and with my flowers about her spread none brighter than her chining head. The lady of my close, my daughter, walks in goldhood fair. Friend, could I rear in England's heiress sweeter English rose chapter ix down in the valleys I know avail where I would go one day, where snows gleam bright above the vast moraine, a mighty cleft in the great bosoming hills, a great grey gateway to the mountain's heart, after bliss Carmen, a bacon climbing may be supposed to deal mainly with peaks, passes, and glaciers, of perhaps, in these days of the rock experts, one should add, precipices, it is supposed to be, very largely, a matter of victories of ascent, and looking down on all that has looked down on us, and in that phase of it, no doubt, lies the great joy of climbing, Yet the days of defeat are not altogether to be despised. For one thing they have a chastening influence upon the soul of the perhaps, over Mabius's mountaineer, beside his winter fire, though when he sees the great valleys and the high peaks taking form, once more, in the smoke or fees of his evening pap, the days spent in the valleys days when he never climbed at all will mean for him a flood of precious memories that he will have no desire to stay. This perhaps applies with greater force to the climber in a new country, for he cannot like his brother in the older land stake his ease along the level road. Four, in a moment of temporary mental aberration, be tempted by a mountain railway for myself I have got great enjoyment in those days, when, having loitered in the vale too long, I have gazed, a belated worshipper, and even out of days when the rain clouds hung low on the mountains with their burden of unhid showers. Such days give one time to indulge in a little quite philosophy to study his brother humans under the lens of adversity, to see his own mind through the rays of introspection, if, perchance, to concern himself with the minor matters of birds and beetles, butterflies and flyers. I may therefore be pardoned by the general rhetoric, not by the mountaineerin and writing this chapter. I climb no higher than a mountain hut or a low bivouac, one sunny December day, when I was rather tired of work, and thinking of some sort of holiday, a letter arrived from my friend and former climbing companion drive, Norman Cox. He asked me to join him in an expedition to the Mount Cook district. There were several obstacles in the way of my going, but the talk of mountaineering is as the whiff of battle in the nostrils of an old war-house. 
and then once the conquering of virgin peaks and the making of new passes into unexplored country begins to loom on the climber's horizon not all the golden golconda will keep him back therefore the difficulties were brushed aside and one finding my friend my wife and i found ourselves with ice cases tent sleeping bags alpine rope and provisions on board the mount cook coach bound once more for that goal of new zealand climbers the hermitage we were to be joined there by mr Ling, so fashioned later on by mr w late old hodgkins oh my tight had climbed with a son other expeditions the weather had been bad at the hermitage but it now showed signs of clearing if after waiting two days my wife and i decided on a trip up the Mueller valley we started one fine morning she carrying the camera a night three days provisions and the sleeping bags for some miles from the hermitage the ice of the Mueller glacier is covered with great rocks and scree fallen from the mountains on both sides of the valley many of these rocks are in a position of unstable equilibrium if consequently very difficult to walk over as it was a hot day and we were not yet in form we took matters somewhat easily if leaving our packs after half a day's march returned to the hermitage illustration mount sefton next day we started off again intending to make a bivouac halfway up the glacier the weather was again fine and a fierce sun beat down in the valley making the rocks quite hot we made many halts and glacier pools here few and four between were in request we lunched where the glacier curved round a bend in the valley near two pretty waterfalls a bluff of peculiar green selka rock and some very fine ice cliffs a glacier stream ran purling past a strong jet of water from which we filled our drinking cups pouring through an immense block of ice that was jammed in the bed of the stream and every now and then an avalanche thundered down from the great ice cliffs that gleamed in the noonday sun high upon the shoulders of sefton one magnificent fall of ice arrested our attention and held us for a time spellbound it broke from a gigantic cliff far up the mountain and thousands of tons poured over the grim precipices with a roar as of loud thunder the blocks were shattered into millions of pieces and a great cloud of ice did strows into the air and slowly disappeared as the seething mass of ice reached the bottom of the valley and spread itself out like some great living moving monster on the side of the glacier the Mueller appeared to be much altered since our former visit some years ago and in one place the debris of an enormous rock avalanche covered the ice where before it was easy walking making our way up the ice cliffs to the right of the waterfalls and then rounding a sharp bend in the glacier we got amongst some very rough moranic boulders that had apparently tumbled from a rock and precipice on the left thence we climbed an old moraine and got a good view of our surroundings down below on a narrow strip of level moraine lay some huge rocks that promised us a good bivouac under one we found a little firewood and beneath the lee of another a quantity of dried snowgrass that afterwards served us for bedding while i went to look for water my wife walked to the farthest point of moraine we could see to look round the corner corners are always peculiarly tantalizing to her we had no billy deafing in fact except the little pannikin of our spirit lamp and the four be separated we held a council as to the best method of carrying the water when found the brilliant idea struck us of testing the Meshubton waterproof capabilities of our rucksack and off i started with it down to the glacier where after some time i discovered a pill on returning i found my wife back and huddled up in a blanket for the sunshine had gone from the valley and it was intensely cold probably we felt it more so after the great heat of the day lighting my spirit lamp i started tea-making but under difficulties the tiniest little breeze wafted the almost invisible flame from one side to the other and prevented the heat from reaching the pannikin the snowgrass got fire 
I bought my fingers, I almost lost my temper, and felt inclined to book the whole inadequate contraption over the moraine. It seemed hours before we got that tea, and then it had a smoky flavor with which it would not have passed muster in the regions of civilization. Nevertheless, in this place, it was nectar to our parched throats, and we enjoyed it, sitting there under the shadow of that great rack, looking over towards the huge bulk of Sefton, cold against the amber spike. It was really too cold to sit up late that night, so it was decided to gather our mattresses. F. Knives in hand, we clambered up the hillside to cut Snogris and the Idlewees and small Somesia. Here we found some flowers of the ran and quashionless most perfect we had yet seen. The rock under which we had to sleep only partially covered us. But the evening, so far, was beautifully fine. Everything promised well for the morrow. If already, the first ascent of Mount Seely seemed an accomplished fact. But in the muttons, as elsewhere, hopes that are cherished as the evening fires die down are apt to vanish before the morning fires are lit. So was it now. Our first blow, on turning out our packs, was the discovery that the alpine rope had been left behind our hearts sank and our plans fell to the ground. But we were so eager over our proposed climb that we collected all our straps, fastened them together, and decided to climb with their aid rather than give it a pull together. Then we wormed ourselves into our bags and endeavoured to sleep, but it was only a little after six o'clock, and since our infancy we had seldom gone to bed at such a preposterous time, as we lay watching the shoulder of Sefton. There came, creeping up behind it, a reef of fleecy cloud, that gradually grew, and moved until it reached the summit. Puffs of warm wine stole across our faces. We feared a nor'wester was coming up, as I lay there, an awful thought came into my mind. The rucksack was a fine pea green color, and we had noticed a peculiar taste about the water it had held. It was not merely a waterproof flavor. What if arsenic were employed in the preparation of the knapsack horrible thought I instantly felt as ill as if I had been reading a medical encyclopedia, and was positive that, already, I exhibited all the symptoms of arsenical poisoning, then my wife, who had dropped off into a doze, woke up in great excitement to tell me what she had just dreamt. She thought we were climbing up a steep snow slope by means of the foresaid straps. Suddenly I disappeared down a crevice, leaving her with all the straps dangling at her feet. She went as near to the great lip as she dared, but could only see down a short distance into its horrible blue depths. A good idea struck her hastily grasping the straps. She lowered the end into the crevice. To her delight, she felt a pull on the improvised rope. She put forth all her strength and stood firm. Judge of her horror when the head of another man appeared, quite old, and bearded like Crypt and Winkle. I've been down there four years. You certainly haven't hurried yourself, he remarked, as his head rose above the edge of the crevice. With the shock of this strange apparition my wife awoke, and as she retailed her rolled ream to me we both laughed so loudly that sleep flew out of our cavern door, and seemed in no hurry to come back again, for a mountain bivouac. However, our bed was not at all an uncomfortable one, and we did manage to sleep, though we were not at all reassured in our minds about the weather. One long, narrow streak of Clyde, lit by the moon, trailed right across the heavens from the northwest, and Beauville. The barometer, though, began to fall, and it was evident that we were to have a change of weather. Adieu, Ferbiv. M. We were awakened by the first gusts of the approaching storm, and by the pattering of the rain on such portion of our sleeping bags as did not come within the shelter of the rock. This was the final blow to our plans. We had intended to rise early and start on our climb by candle weight. But now all we could do was to huddle as far under the rock as possible, in order to keep ourselves dry, and wait for daylight to enable us to be to retreat to the more friendly shelter of the hermitage. At five, 
m we riddled out of our sleeping bags f and the pouring rain walked down the glacier dripping wet from head to foot we sneaked quietly into the house f after a wash we scarcely needed and a change of clothes we appeared at the breaks fabled much to the surprise of other inhabitants who had been wasting their sympathy on the two mad mountaineers whom they thought to be storm-bound on the Mueller glacier on the following day the weather was again fine so i started for the hut on the tasman glacier distant some fourteen miles from the hermitage next day drive cox and i carries wags of provisions and alpine appliances some eight miles farther up the glacier to our rolled bivouac at the foot of mount de la Bec. cox returned to the hut the same day and i waited at the bivouac intending on the morrow to gather some alpine scrub for firewood from the sunny slopes of the Moltbrun range across the valley in crossing the glacier next day i found the ice very much creviced f not taking a good rook had to resort to step tuft in more than one place before gaining the other side firewood was very scarce but i got a small bundle of fin to boil the billy two or three times and returned to the bivouac thence making my way down the glacier to the ball hut here i found drive cox enjoying a well sever dressed after the unwanted exercise of swagging an abrupt change from the surgery or the office stool to the swag enables the victim to make quite a number of new discoveries in the science of anatomy the amateur porter may begin gaily in the morning with a full stomach and a light heart and the quill bracing air that succeeds the chilly on his fifty or six pordons burden may seem almost as light as his own heart but a couple of hours experience of a new zealand moraine with a mile or so of hummocky ice from it will convince him that neither his pack nor the important part of his anatomy already mentioned is quite the featherweight of his early morning imagination if while he has become aware that he is the possessor of an organ that can pump at quite an alarming rate he is prepared to take oath that his pack is rapidly increasing in weight at the rate of from three to five pounds per mile according to the instability or the steepness of the moraine over which it is his ill for ton to be scrambling but of these two steepnesses the more wearing because instability gives only a momentary shock and there is generally recompense in the exhilaration of a quick though not always graceful recovery whereas steep is sir worse still the combination of steepness and instamitable is before you like a long nightmare and depresses even after it is conquered by noon the straps are cutting into one's aching shoulders and it seems only a matter of time until the friction caused by the juxtaposition of swag and vertebra has done irreparable damage to certain garments that need not be mentioned and all this time the amateur porter has been performing acrobatic feats on slippery ice and the measure that he has been treading over the unstable live moraine has been remarkable not so much for the dignity of its movement as for the language that has accompanied it finally when hungry accurate and they wary he crawls up to his cold and lonely bivouac at the close of a grilling sweltering day he will tell you with much forcible detail that his pack weighs over a hundred pounds and that swagging is the most matured and well-considered invention of the devil and all his angels next morning as he rises cold and stiff in every joint and limb from the road metal mattress upon which he has been trying to keep warm and snatch some weller in repose his outlook may be philosophic though it will certainly not be optimistic but breakfast and the bracing mountain air which is like a vintage wine and a glorious summer sun and further exercise will gradually dispel the miasma of initial trouble while a week of this kind of work with a minor peak or pass thrown in will send him forth as a giant refreshed ready to oppose all the ills that flesh is heir to and eager to conquer the long icy slopes and grim precipices that guard the way to the virgin summits of his native land before long even his inconchable first will have vanished if with forty or fifty pounds weight on his back he will be able to hop from a moving rock on the live moraine to more solid footing without barking his shins in the endeavour 
or to bound like a kangaroo across the rounded hummocks of the great glacier at sedatus tress german scientist to me on one occasion when i was setting the pace down the great desmond glacier in a bitter rainstorm you are like a glacier flame take such jumps he had himself followed twice on the hard slippery ice hummocks and his hand was freely bleeding from a cut but he spoke more in sorrow than in anger and at the end of the march he produced a couple of bottles of alayano for himself and one for me then the two rival nations fraternized beneath the southern cross f under the soothing influence of the beverage discussed the question of compulsory arbitration in labour disputes and other abstruse economic problems so dear to the german mind on arrival at the hut i found that fife and mrs ross had walked the fourteen miles from the hermitage f in the evening hodgkins surprised us by strolling into the hut after dark he having left the coach near the hooker cage and tramped up the track the same evening we were now ready to try the scent of one of the higher peaks but the barometer had fallen and there were indications of a storm which duly came to hand so we stayed in the hut amusing ourselves with a variety of games cooking on the fife run outside and studying the habits of Mr. Nestor Notables, famed throughout New Zealand, and the Walt, as the most cruel of all sheep killers, this bird a mountain parrot of beautiful plumage, and quaint and curious ways is probably the most interesting of all the feather drivers left on the ramparts of civilization. His home is amongst the hills and valleys of the southern Alps. In most districts he is an outlaw, with a price on his head, at mount cook he is protected because here there are few sheep to kill and a few tourists to be pleased originally he must have waxed fat or grown lean in a diet largely vegetary when he had perhaps an odd worm or a grub or two thrown in by way of very date in the question of how he came to acquire carnivorous habits has been much discussed before the advent of the white man there were no forfeited animals in new zealand except perhaps a native rat and it is doubtful if the key touched him my own idea is that it was his inordinate inquisitists that led to the change and that the change was brought about in quite an accidental manner just as that glorious and more famous discovery of roast sikipsi was made thus when the early settlers in the muttons killed a sheep they spread the skin woolly side down on the stockport fence the key ever curious swooped down upon it and began to tear it to pieces with his strong sharp wig hollow he said to himself this is a great sport and then after a few pecks he stopped and began to think for there was a new taste in his mouth and the taste was good it was the taste of mutton fat if from that day to this the key has never forgotten it then one cold hard winter when all the berries were done and he was idly pecking at another skin upon the stockport fence there was set up in his brain a train of reasoning till it suddenly dawned upon him that the sheepskin must have something to do with the cheek if next day being hard put to it for a dinner he flew down into the valley if there being no sheepskins about he went back to the mountain side and settled upon a live sheep there he got his dinner in that same evening leather keys seeing him satisfied and replete while they were cold and hungry asked him where he had got such a good dinner and he being in a good mood after such a dinner for keys are very much like men in this matter told them and next day and for many days afterwards they all dined well but the poor sheep could not understand why these hitherto innocent and friendly birds had suddenly become possessed of devils and the owner of the sheep could not understand why so many of his sheep were dead on the hillside but one day the owner of the sheep through his spyglass saw a key alight on the back of a sheep and began to dip with his cruel beak into the lung so that he might bet some nice warm kidnap it out for his dinner and the silly sheep not knowing how to ward off the attack simply ran and ran till it fell down exhausted and then while the key finished his dinner 
the poor sheep died in great agony but the next day the owner of the sheep got his gun and all the shepherds got their guns and there was woe and lamentation in many a key family before the shadows of evening came down from that day onward a price was upon the head of the key till now more keys are killed by men than there are sheep killed by keys for the key cannot get the taste of mutton fat out of his mouth any more than an aboriginal for the matter of that his civilized brother can forget the taste of roasts a kixity yet in spite of all his wikis quite a true story and sympathies are with the key for after all this was the key's country and the man should not have brought his silly sheep into it if when i see the flatching scarlet of his underwings against the blue of an alpine sky or note the metallic green and blue of his overdress contrasted against some snowy slope or dome a feeling of deep regret about his ultimate destruction comes over me my wife oh during my absences from camp and bivouac on the higher climes has had frequent opportunities of studying his character does him more justice than any other writer i know of he reminds her of one of those highland chieftains whose greatest glory was their being put to the horn with what impudence the key struts fancies or flutters past your very feet how he poses himself on an ear rock and lets you come up boldly and miss him and how condescending he waits for another shot encouraging you with a cheeky kiki i have seen a man inversed in the ways of the key steal along holding his missile carefully behind him but there is no need for concealment you can go boldly up and have your shot knitting to pay either and probably no result for even if you stun him he recovers quickly and is off to his heights unless you are very smart indeed i have had a dozen round me while i have been baking interchanging confidential and probably contemptuous remarks on my method and results they hardly troubled to get out of my way as i passed from hut to fire i am not a good shot and i feel sure they knew it any tins or rags thrown out are carefully inspected by them generally in committee and i have even seen them burn themselves picking coals out of the fire illustration cooking spoons illustration mm. so fife once in the days before the luxury attendant upon huts and chimneys had crept into the dasman valley i was cooking scones on an improvised oven made out of an old nail can when a number of keys flew down from the great shoulder of mount cook above the ball glacier they watched the culinary operations for a time at a respectful distance and it was quite evident that some of them had never before seen a fire one more daring or more inquisitive than the rest came closer and closer to it and i watch him from an adjacent rocky seat cocking his head first on one side and then on the other as he eyed the glowing embers finally he walked right up to the fire and picked out a live coal with his beak the result was startling he dropped it with a loud scream F. after a few seconds of viticuturation flew away to the moraine there he was joined by all other keys F. judging from their chatter they held a committee meeting and carried a condemnatory resolution about the cook who exhibited to the eye of an often dinkies a beautiful red thing that made the beak so sore and that filled the mouth with anger but it is at the first streak of dawn they are liveliest we came to the conclusion that the fenders were young birds out all night on the spree and coming home with the milk on occasions at the ball glacier hut their antics were the cause of much bad language in various tongues for it was impossible to sleep during the entertainment they held a sort of circus or gymnastic performance but it lacked variety about a dozen sat in a row on the ridge of the corrugated iron roof of our hut one of them said often they glissaded down scratching and clawing with their feet all the way amid the great applause of the audience outside and the curses loud and deep of the victims inside the intervals were filled up with a whole troop prowling round the hut yelping like puppies with now and then a cry like that of a very fractious baby and so it went on four hours unless some one was willing to get up and out and chase them off the premises and then there would be heard more strong language 
as the shivering Pajamade individual, groping about in the dust for some suitable missile, would tread on a mutant, or knock his big toe against one of the many rocks that surrounded the hut. One day, during our enforced idleness in the hut, a serviceman engaged on the track came up to consult our doctor. He had been suffering dreadfully from toothish. After a careful diagnosis, it was resolved that the tooth must come out. But how that was a question to puzzle a layman, for there were no dentist's instruments within ninety miles of the Tasman Glacier. Nevertheless, it was decided to operate, and the doctor and I and the patient filed out of the hut to do the dreadful deed. We set the victim down on a boulder, and while I held his head the doctor, with the blade of his pank knife, skillfully dug out a much decayed molar after it was all over the victim gave a sigh of relief, but did not seem quite satisfied. He felt around amongst the remaining caverns with the tip of his tongue, and at last found speech. Thank you very much. Dr. Cax was too sure you've bet the right one I confess I had my doubts on the point. But the doctor assured him it was all right, and he went away satisfied. Verily faith is a great thing, however. The little bloodletting had a soothing influence for the time being, and the real cause of the trouble was afterwards extracted at the hermitage, with a more suitable instrument than a pank knife. The weather continuing bad. Drive. Cox decided to walk down to the hermitage. After two or three days the weather cleared, and Hodgkins and I did a little rocks liking on one of the spurs of Mount Cook, and some stepped off on the ice cliffs of the Bull Glacier. On Saturday the twenty the weather had cleared. We devoted the morning to photography, and at two p. m. as there was still no sign of drive, Cox or Fife from the Hermitage, we left with swags for the Delabic bivouac, some eight miles farther up the glacier. The journey up over rough moraine and hummocky ice took us four hours and twenty minutes. My shoulders ached with the swag straps, and the old felt a little tired with the unwanted exercise of swagging over the loose rocks of the moraines, and with the jumping a lock angaroo from hummock to hummock of the white ice. At eight, thirty p. m. The three of us turned into our sleeping bags under the rock. It was a glorious evening. If, through the entrance of our cabedrum, we looked far down the valley to the cold gray snows on the summit of Orangi, which, an hour or so before, had been bathed in the golden splendid hour of evening. The morrow promised to be fine. If, thinking it a pity to waste a day, we decided to make the ascent of the Hoxteter Dome hoping that Cox and Faff would have arrived by the time we got back. Alas, Cox climbed no more with us that year. On an ordinary level path near the hermitage he sprained his ankle badly, and it was not healed for months. Chapter X and Ascent of hating or swinging there over the world, and not high enough to get a hold on heaven. It makes you feel as if things was dropping away from you like. Gilbert Parker Faff arrived at the bivouac rock in due course, and we began to think of other plans. It was decided to attempt the ascent of Hadinger by the eastern face. We were not yet in sufficiently good training to do ourselves justice on difficult climbs, and were moreover somewhat tired with the previous day's exertions. Once more the good resolutions formed at nightfall were dispersed with the dome, and instead of starting at three, thirty, M. It was a quarter past five before we got under way, crossing the lateral moraines of the Rudolph Glacier. We hurried over the clear ice to the foot of our mountain at a speed that was too fast to be pleasant. I began to wish myself back in my comfortable sleeping bag under the bivouac rock. Fife was cutting out the pace at an unusual rate, but I set my teeth, followed doggedly in his footsteps, and answered his remarks with the briefest of monosyllables. Thus, ultimately, had the effect of stifling conversation altogether. In any case, it was too early for talk, but in an hour's time we had made such excellent progress that we were on the ridge and scrambling up the first rocks, which offered no serious bar to our progress. The sunrise was splendid. Rocks soon gave place to snow, 
which rose in a gentle curve to a continuation of the rocky arete two or three hundred yards above climbing along this ridge we at length found ourselves face to face with two enormous slabs of rocks rearing themselves on end above the softer strata and recognized in them the well connor penguin rocks so plainly visible from the hut at the ball glacier the summit of de la Bec, and many other points miles away the close view that we now obtained of them was decidedly interesting they completely blocked our passage along the crest of the ridge but we found a way round f gaining a safe spot on the other side where there was room to sit down we basked a while in the warm morning sun and enjoyed our second breakfast on the right the ridge fell away in a great precipice to the forest ross glacier here very steep and raked by falling rocks and blocks of ice waterfalls shot from the edge of the clear ice above and tumbled with continuous roar over the black buttresses of wet rock the thunder of avalanches also rose on the clear morning air from the depths below immediately on our left another glacier flowed down the steep slope and poured its tribute into the great tasman from the highest drops on this ridge a hummock of ice rose and curved over our heads and through a great crack close beside us we peered down into the awesome depths of a berg schrind in the glacier on our left at the end of this there was a beautiful grotto where the white of the snow and the tender blues and greens of the ice melted away into the gloom that shrouded the depths of the crevice and seemed as if it had been transported and sullied through the purier from fairyland all the same it was asim i drew fife's attention to it if, after we had duly admired its wondrous beauty he remarked that it would be awkward if we dropped through where eight we took another look if, sitting on a flat slab of slate placed on top of the snow began once more to munch our second breakfast water was trickling from the ice block above we caught it in the crowns of our hats if, squeezing the juice of a lemon into it enjoyed a delightfully cool and refreshing drink then the fragrant incense of tobacco was wafted abroad for abroad on this fantastic ridge for the first time since the world began and we two sat there in the sunshine watching the smoke wreaths caught up in the gentle morning airs and carried over the white snow to the base of those two giants that frowned disdaphnially upon us hitherto no one had dared to pass over the ramparts of rock and beyond the portals of ice that guarded their domain on top of one of the pinnacles was a weather-worn and lichen hoder of boulder that forcibly brought home to our minds the wear and tear of the ages clearly at one time the ridge had been as high as the top of these rocks but had bit by bit crumbled away leaving the harder pinnacles with their solitary copenstone poised aloft to tell to the first explorers the tale of the ceaseless warring elements and perhaps the time may arrive when mountaineering shall have become a lost art and some highly developed mortal in the due process of evolution sailing by in his airship will halt a while on this same ridge to find these adamantine giants gone in a even a time when these great glaciers shall be no more and the very ridge itself shall have crumbled into dust such has happened before in the world's history such will happen again i am writing this chapter on a blazing hot day on board a p boat liner in the arabian sea and priestly returning from scutzel fated antarctic expedition has just been telling me that they found the fossil wood of furt reason that land where to-day there is no tree nor flower nor robe and i doubt not that in this same arabian sea where but ice is in much request there were at one time great glaciers flowing down from the mainland and huge bergs drifting aimlessly out to sea so it may be again through some change in solar heat or in the earth's axis but these problems did not greatly concern us on the ridge of hadinger that morning we had got our second wind now and the sunrise and the beautiful surroundings found us once more in high spirits and ready neither to pit ourselves against the opposing forces of nature is it not quillercow who says 
if he were to draw up a hierarchy of sports he would rank them as they oblige a man to pit himself and take his chances against opposing forces such sports have helped to make britons brave and if our new zeal and youth engage in themis a pastime but not as a business debt will be well and danger when it comes will not grin suddenly upon them with an unfamiliar face we looked anxiously ahead at the two turreted ridges that came down from the summit of our mountain the one on the right seemed as if it might give an easy route but the tracks of falling stones on the glacier below were indicative of danger if even as we looked a great mass of rock broke away with a loud report from the higher crags and came thundering down to the glacier the whole face of the rocky buttress was raked with a fire of falling stones more deadly than the most destructive artillery the chances were a thousand to one that had we chosen that route we should have met with swift and certain death without giving this route another thought we bore away to the left over the ice on the plateau and made for the ridge on the left we decided to keep to the crest so that we should be safe from falling stones and blocks of ice but we were still in doubt as to whether we could cross the plateau and gain the rocks on the foot of the ridge a snow covered bergschrin met us at the outset and we crawled cautiously across it distributing our weight over as great an area as possible below us the ice was broken into enormous serics and one peak like pinnacle towered aloft above the surrounding masses some of the shrums were exceptionally large and the colouring in their depths was margellus with beautiful it was as if they had been made in some ferial and factory in which the manufacturer had mastered all the arts of delicate colouring and blending of tints having arrived at a comparatively level bit of the plateau where there were some tremendous cliffs of ice poised above we ran as fast as possible on to safer ground two great shrunds gaped before us at the farther edge of the plateau but we dodged one and crossed the other gingerly on a frail snow bridge one man anchoring till the other was safely over then we saw that we should have difficulty in getting on to the main ridge but a secondary ridge farther down promised success we turned towards set and clambering up a soft snow slope found ourselves once more on solid rocks these rocks gave us some interesting climbing and the main ridge ahead looked practicable we began to see the west coast peaks away beyond the lendefin saddle and the hoxteter dome at the head of the tasman glacier the view up and down that asmin with the startling peaks and precipices of the molt brun range right opposite across the glacier was one that we could not help every now and then halting to admire having climbed over this first ridge we found ourselves on a very narrow snow reet there was just room for a man to walk on it it sloped down steeply on either side and we agreed that in the event of either slipping another would immediately throw himself bodily over on the opposite side in which case we should find ourselves dangling one at each end of the rope in perhaps a not very elegant pose but at all events in safety however there was no need for any such gymnastic performance and we walked along the snowy ridge without a slip and gained a rock reet this ridge was still narrow for declared it was sharp enough to cut bread with the rocks were moreover very rotten and the crumbling masses that they sometimes dislodged went clattering down on to the glaciers on either side we were now quite on the main ridge but it was evident our peak was going to die hard it was even doubtful if we should succeed a short ice lips intervened and the axes were brought into play the splintered ice went down the slope with a swish swish at every blow of the axe as we hacked the steps till at length the slope was vanquished then a series of rocky teeth blocked the way but we climbed over them one after another and commenced to storm a dark precipice that was beyond a doubt in places absolutely perpendicular this precipice is plainly seen from the hut far down the tasman glacier and it was a moot point whether it could be scaled however at it we went with a defiant jodel and inch by inch foot by foot we pulled ourselves up it was certainly a glorious climb and whether we succeeded in reaching the summit ridge or not 
we felt that this bit of rock work was worth coming up for but the rocks were very rotten and we had to exercise the greatest caution in some places one man had to assist other and the ice cases were handed up after the leader had gained a secure stand only one man moved at a time and there was a constant cry of have you a good hold before the climbing of any difficult bit was undertaken by either of us my axe weighed heavily on my mind when passing through christ for chai had asked mr kinzitul and me an ice case and he generously gave me zerbe grins when a mountaineer gives away the trusty axe that has stood him in good stead on many an arduous expedition it is like a soldier giving away his sword Zerbigrin had presented his axe to mr kinsey it was an axe with a history and prized accordingly it had accompanied the famous guide to the top of some twenty peaks in the european alpshek gable horn dent blanche monte rosa matterhorn waschen rothener jundrug silverhorn schrechtern dom navaler mont blanc finsteraren a galdi charmis five peaks kunflarn a galdi drew and a galdi gintrally a goodly array on top of the nadeler which is higher than mount cook the axe in zerbigrin spent the night it was also with him on the summit of mont blanc for eight days and nights subsequently in new zealand he carried this same ice case on mount cook and to the summits of tasman sefton havinger and seely also over fitzgerald's pass to the west coast and back over graham's saddle later on it did good work with me on the scent of Haydinger, big Ibeck, the two minarets the descent of the pass from the head of the great desmond glacier to the water rava and the first crossing of fitzgerald's pass from the west coast an axe with such a record had never before been seen in new zealand and it was naturally greatly prized by its new owner therefore it was that though light enough in my hand as s cases go it weighed heavily on my mind and i was as careful for its safety as for my own but there was always a haunting dread lest i should let it slip and never see it again i was then half sorry i had brought it but when we came to a slope up which steps had to be cut in the hard ice we prized it highly for it was cunningly made and of excellent design for that kind of work the storming of the great buttress put us thoroughly on our metal, and so long as there was an obtube rip or chink into which we could bet our fingers we advanced slowly. In places the rocks were very rotten, and in places they were glazed, so that our progress was painfully slow. The mountain was certainly not in good condition, and this glazing of the rocks, which is a thing all mountaineers abhor, gave us much trouble the rocks were so steep that often the leader's feet were just above the other man's head at last however we got over the worst of it and paused a while to see what was ahead things looked more promising and it seemed as if we should top the peak after all the slope eased off considerably but then there came another long stretch of bad rocks liking with bits of ice work and our spirits sank verily this was a regular twofold and the devil and all his angels must have been present at the making of it on two or three occasions we asked each other if it was worth going on and i am free to confess that a very little excuse would have tempted me to turn at this point but neither would give the word to retreat i am inclined to think now that the modern rocks leakers might not think it at all difficult but as the route has not again been attempted one cannot speak for certain a snow slope intervened and we went bravely at it picking steps in the half frozen in snow but soon we found that the snow thinned out and that there was glazed ice underneath one felt in no mood for step tuft at this stage of the climb but nevertheless began to chip away at the hard ice then fife took a hand it was hard work on slog the snow had to be scraped off the slope and each step carefully cut with the pick end of the axe chips of ice came rattling down hitting me on the head and hands and filling up the steps that had been cut 
I employed my time in clearing out the ice from the steps with one hand and throwing it athwart the slope, so that it would not fall in the line of steps below me. When one hand got half prison and I gave the other one a share of the work. But my labour was mostly in vain, for such showers of ice and snow came down that most of the steps were completely filled up again as soon as they were cleaned out. I was not sorry when we gained the rocks above, though they were in places rather difficult. We made fair progress for a while, but at length were brought to a complete standstill by a smooth sloping slab of rock that offered neither hand nor foothold. We could have cut up on the shady side of the ridge and avoided this obstacle, but there was now no time for difficult step tuft. It was the rocks or nothing. We had brought with us a pair of rubber shoes for such an emergency as this. Having on former expeditions proved their efficacy in warming up smooth rocks, Fife having taken off his boots and put on the rubber soled shoes, I got on firmst entering down and gave him a leg up. The rope went out slowly and then stopped. It was now that my turn came. Have you a good stand? Fife I asked. No, not at all good, came the reply. F not daring to put any great strain on the rope under such circumstances, I scrambled up as best I could with only its moral support. It now seemed a short distance of the top, and we determined to push ahead as quickly as possible, for the afternoon was wearing on, and the descent began to weigh a little heavily on our minds. There appeared to be some likelihood of our spending the night out on the mountain, especially as there were still one or two bits of bad rock look ahead of us. At one place Fife left his axe behind, in order the better to grapple with the difficult rock work. At last we gained the highest rocks in what seemed, from the De La Bec bivouac, to be the highest point of the ridge. We found, however, that there was a snow slope beyond this leading to the end of the summit ridge, and up this I cut till we gained the crest, Fitzgerald's rocks were a long way off at the other end of the ridge, and much as we should have liked to have visited his cairn, there was no time to do so, even if we could have surmounted the cornice that seemed to bar the way. We were some twenty-seven feet, according to the Mac, below the highest point of the mountain, so we did not claim its complete ascent. From the summit ridge of Haidinger, over ten thousand feet above the sea, we had an alpine view at once extensive and imposing. We were on the main divide, and we looked northward along its snowy crests and jagged pinnacles of rock to where a long snow reed led up to the dazzling summit of Glacier Peak. Beyond that again, stretching away towards the north, he asked, was a grand array of peaks and glaciers, several of the mountains rising to altitudes of over ten, zero feet, the magnificent sweep of the mighty Tasman lay bellow of feet down and, on its eastern boundary, rose the gaunt precipices of the Moltbrunn range, culminating in a splendid peak ten, four hundred twenty on feet high. We looked eastward across the island to the dim sea haze beyond Mara. Westward the lazy swell of ocean broke in a white line along the indented coast. Near at hand, on our left, the giant mountains of Cook and Tasman reared their hoary summits, and the children of these mighty monarchs stood around at respectful distance. But grand as all these were in their serene and stately loveliness, it was ever the West that held our gaze. Westward, ho, oh, what magic is there in these words? We felt their influence upon us once more as we gazed down at the broad expanse of spotless snow that fed the Fox and Victoria glaciers at the dark lakes embossed in the darker forests that climbed upwards from the sea, and at the white line of the Pacific breakers, that, up where we were perched, seemed to fall with noiseless beat along the western shore, and the glorious sunshiny weather, with such marvellous views all around. Our stay was all too short, but we had to think of the descent, which promised to engage all our attention and require a like nerve and skill, so, reluctantly, we turned our faces eastward and went down the snowy crest to the highest rocks at this end of the ridge, where, under a flat stone, I left a card. There were not enough loose rocks to build a cairn. Returning to the ridge, we made our way down in the ice tests, 
exercising the greatest caution, as we had now only one axe. The steps were for the most part filled up, and Fife had to feel for them with his feet after cleaning out those on a level with his face so that he could get a grip in them with his hands. The rope was kept taut, and I took good hold above, going down with my face to the slope, and using my axe as an anchor, digging the handle in where there was snow and the pick and where there was hard ice. With my face turned to the wall I could look between my legs and see Fife immediately below me, cautiously feeling his way down. When we got to his axe we were able to progress more rapidly. We wasted no time, but climbed steadily without a halt, for that grim precipice still lay below. Just above it the rocks were terribly rotten. It was almost impossible to avoid dislodging them. And I, who was nigh leading, was, for a time, subjected to a regular bombardment. First of all I was nearly knocked out of my steps by a blow on the leg. Then I was struck on the shoulder. A few minutes later, a flat chunk of rock that lay hat buried in a bit of soft snow was dislodged by Fife and hit me fair on top of the head. This half stint me for the moment, and Fife was warned to keep a good hold while I leaned against the rock to recover. Luckily I have a good thick skull, and the rock struck me with the flat, and not in ways on so there was little damage done. At length we reached the precipice. The descent was quite a work of acrobatic art, and the attitudes we sometimes got into would have been the envy of a contortionist. Could he have seen them? Swinging there over the wall, writes Gilbert Parker, in one of his graphic bits of description, and not high enough to get a hold on heaven. It makes you feel as if things was dropping away from you like and that was somewhat like the feeling we had in descending this cliff. After a good deal of slow and careful climbing, we reached the plateau, and knew that our difficulties were over. We went down the final slope at a good case, bedding some fine glistening on two or three snow slopes. Below these, we took off the rope and hurried down over the final rocks. Some of the slates were very sharp and cut like a knife. One long cut on my head bled profusely, and the handle of Zerbegrin's axe was dyed a brilliant crimson. Fife was still more unlucky, for he knocked his leg on a projecting slate which cut a hole in his stocking and took a bit out of the leg just over the shin bone. Spartan-like. However, he said no word about it until we reached the bivouac. In the gathering dusk of evening to tired mountaineers, battered and bleeding, but victorious and triumphant, sought the shelter of the bivouac rock, where Hodgkins and my wife were kept busy for the next half for in the preparation of supper. We began with a steaming billy of porridge. Then we had stewed tinned peaches, followed by malignant auntie soup, and tea made in the same billy as the porridge that he was not quite a success. But in those days we did not stick at trifles, and the mixture quickly vanished. Chapter she and interludum and may feel thankful. Heartily thankful over a dish of plain mutton with turnips, and have no leisure to reflect upon the ordinance and institution of eating. When he shall confess a perturbation of mind, inconsistent with the purposes of the grace, at the presence of venison or total. Charles Lamb. On January the third I first we went down to the hut, photographing on the way. Next day Fife had to go over the ball pass with a government official from Wellington and Hodgkins returned down the Tasman Valley to the Hermitage, leaving my wife and me alone in the hut. Bad weather came in, and one night a howling nor'wester, accompanied by heavy rain and the crashing of thunder, shook the hut till we feared for its safety. Then it cleared, and one fine day two sun boffin to young lady she Mrs. Williams, of Welling took men up from the Hermitage with Fife, a relative of the late Lord Randolph Churchill, a geologist and a tribal acero, made his appearance, and we showed him round. He was charmed with the surroundings, and intensely interested in the keys, who happened to be in rare form. Then we have more bad weather, and were all cooped up in the hut for two or three days. But these days were among the jolliest we had ever spent in camp. The old tin hut rang with laughter till far into the night, 
illustration the sunbonnet brigade illustration on the upper tasman when first we saw those to sunbound to slooming large above to immaculate's blouses invading our domain we were not at all assured as to how we with our rough rindy camp ways would get on with them the owners of the sunbounties however proved to be real sports and all went merry as a marriage bell camp is just about the best place possible for ascertaining in a minimum space of time the character of a man or of a woman and the ball hut in those proluxcurious days was especially a test we had been mates with some queer characters under that tin roof there were times when the milk of human kindness had to take the place of tin milk and when a man pretended that he was not hungry in order that his mate might get a bigger helping there were other times so frere occurrence lupial wan selfishness got the upper hand and one had to trust one's indignation in the keeping of a grim silence but of all the parties with whom we had camped there never had we seen a jollier nor a more kindly one than that which met around the rickety old deal table in the first days of february eighteen ninetivson the hut on that asman lies at the foot of a spur of the mighty orangi above it far up the hillside grow masses of mountain lines and daisies and little thickets of the most exquisite tribunoff the very ideal flower for a new zeal and bridal bouquet in front of the hut towers the great moraine above whose stony ridge and far beyond rise the liebig and the maltbrun ranges at sunset the delicate colors of these mountains are indescribably lovely at land as they often are against a primrose sky deepening into amber round the hut lie multitudes of tinstons once containing all sorts of comestibles from the humble boiled mutton to stewer tile and oyster stand bottles of all sizes and shapes these afford great amusement to the keys who go poking about them incessantly and hold great crobiers over any new discovery the hut was of corrugated iron land in those days with willis and roof and parent and paved with large flat stones from the moraine this was done by some members of our party years before on a wet day and we noticed in the visitors book a special vote of thanks for the same proposed by harper seconded by fitzgerald and carried nem zerbigrin being in the chair on these stones the table rested somewhat on stadilaby and had to be carefully humoured unless you wished to empty your pennikin of tea over your neighbour or yourself for seats there were a narrow crossledge stool which ticked up on the slightest provocation on the locker in which all the provisions were kept if you ever go to the hut sit on the stool it is maddening when you have finally settled down on the locker and are waging the pangs of hunger for some unfeeling person to ask you to get up and let them open the locker as the pepper is not on the table four webs rev monks four of them in the larger room and the same number in the smaller which was the ladies bedroom boudoir drubrin and anything else necessary a canvas curtain divided the two rooms it was weighted with a heavy piece of wood which had a nasty habit of banging against a new chum's ankles and causing naughty words to be spoken people came and went in an erratic way one had often neither a feast or a famine of company there have been times when i a solitary occupant have fled from the lonely hut to the hermitage craving for the company of my fellow beings there have been other occasions upon which the housing problem could only be solved by an overflow from the men's into the ladies quarters such predicaments awkward in civilization are of little moment in the more primitive existence that one leads in the unexplored wilds one incident i well remember recalling stevenson's experience at the oberg of bichette street nicholas where after uncorking his bottle of beaujolais and partaking of a frugal meal he found the sleeping room furnished with two beds if, while he got into the one he was abashed to find a young man and his wife and child in the act of climbing into the other however he kept his eyes to himself 
and knew nothing of the woman except that she had beautiful arms and seemed no whit embarrassed by his appearance one can easily imagine that to the sensitive stevenson the situation was more trying than to the care for as he truly says a pair keep each another countenance it is the single gentleman who has to blush in my own particular experience i knew not even if the woman had beautiful arms i let the pair get into their bunks before i climbed into mine and next morning crept out again in the cold grey dawn before they were yet astir in the olden days there were no patent oil stops in the bowl hut there was not even a chimney to it and the cooking was done outside over an old nail can with little squares cunningly cut out of it to give a sufficient draught and at the same time to conserve the fuel firewood consisting of the green stunted alpine vegetation was rather scarce and it was never wasted all sorts of dishes used to be produced from toffee to stewed keys we had a capital breakfast one morning in which some of our inquisitive friends formed the piece de resistance and to every meal what appetites we brought born of the keen pure air and free life even on the dull days when there was a clearing in the mist we were rottened about the girls were gone on the listening and used to toil up the two hundred feet out of moraine in front of the hut for the pleasure of coming down again and they did the descent in style ice cases rubber and anchor and wild cries of delight accompanying the performance one day especially is a red-letter day in our memories the rum of boiled mud and even now rises as i recall the fun we managed to squeeze into those fourteen hours when we opened our eyes that morning there was a persistent drizzle on the roof that meant a wet day so we decided to have a late breakfast and turned over like the sligarto sleep again breakfast was laid at half past ten and after a light luncheon at three so as not to interfere with the serious matter of dinner we sallied out in a pause between the show arts or do a little climbing rain drove us back to the hut in company with a number of keys who followed in our wake hopping over the ice hummocks in a delightfully comical way on regaining the hut we had afternoon tea at half past six then we all sat in committee on the leg of mutton the length of time it should be cooked the manner of cooking and the utensil to be used were all eagerly discussed at last about half past seven the mutton was duly consigned to our largest billy and in a little while it was boiling merrily outside over the nail kind that formed our stove fife who was appointed cook in fact donned his waterproof and went out every now and then to stoke up and report progress to the committee to do hunter to our feast the ladies had dressed for dinner and their gay dressing gowns over their ordinary costumes looked quite festive in the light of all the candles we could muster meanwhile we played whist in various other games we even descended to pocker but whatever he may be able to do in london or new york man cannot live by cards alone on the great esmond glacier and there came a time when we craved for something more satisfying it was half past ten however before five after a momentary dash into the darkness and the driving rain returned to inform us it felt soft there was only one it in our minds at that hour many hens made light work f there is soon the steaming leg of mutton and it in plate much too small for its ample proportions was being carved with a very blunt knife and handed round and how we endured that supper had any one told those girls a week or two before that they would dispose of two helpings of boiled mutton off colton plates at half past ten o'clock at night he would have been laughed to scorn but we all agreed that it was the very nicest mutton we had ever tasted and after our living so long on tinned meats it was good i am afraid we did not take time as we should have done etto say grace before that meal for as charles lamb has well said the plainest diet seems the fittest to be preceded by a grace i once attended one of the old london company's annual dinners at which we had turtle soups and fine fishes and game and wines old and of rare vintage and an archbishop said a grace before meat and a singer sang a grace after meat 
but the taste of these churis viands has long since been forgotten while the flavor of our simple mutton supper does not fade but rather is intensified with the passing years and the latter was surely the more worthy of the graces than the former after supper we played poker in the most reckless way for matches and the ladies novices in the game lost in one in the most charmingly responsible way and fen after midnight it suddenly occurred to us that we ought to go to bed loath to depart we lingered until there was no excuse to stay longer i fancy we all felt sorry to write finis to such a happy day but at last the lights were out and in spite of the mutton all slept soundly till morning when the young bloods of the key household came home with the milk as was their wont and roused us from our peaceful slumbers chapter g e d labeck and the minarets the mountains in their overwhelming might moved me to sadness when i saw them first and afterwards they moved me to delight christina rossetti in the days when we first visited the mount cook region we thought de labeck would be an easy mountain to climb but our youthful eagerness and inexperience led us into some difficult situations and then we began to think it was a difficult mountain to climb in after years one was apt to smile at the recollection of those early attempts which try we ever so bravely always ended in failure and moved us to sadness yet if they had to be made over again one would not have it otherwise for notwithstanding our disappointments we had great fun and we really could climb it was our knowledge of root fiendus that was at fault that knowledge has to be learned slowly in the hard school of experience Tyfe was the first to acquire it and after that the rest was comparatively easy the great peaks went down one by one ecoke Begobek, the minarets maltbrunt darwin and the footstool fitzgerald bagged three of the fine systems sefton and havinger if later on the small band of west coast climbertians teichelman and lokenbrud others it was in eighteen ninety three that we first turned our steps towards de Laubeck and the minarets de Laubeck had attracted the attention of the rev mr green and as far back as eighteen eighty nine mannering dixon and johnston had had a shot at it and all some four attempts to scale it had been made before our arrival on the scene only in january of the year named fife and ice wagged bedding and provisions up to the bibwak rock this rock is a historic spot in connection with new zealand mountaineering many of the bully climbers have starved and shivered there but seldom have they waxed fat on a plethora of provisions i recall especially one jolly expedition when my wife and i and four others used it as an habitation for some days and i can still see wilson of glasgow and my wife vainly endeavouring to cook something hot for supper with what remained of our methylated spirit in the bowl from a tin of sardines that supper was not quite a success but later on one warm summer's night after a jolly meal we sat up singing songs and telling stories till midnight when we saw the new year in and then crept reluctantly into our sleeping bags for the rest of the night illustration de libeck bivouac here oh it was that mr r s low was found in nineteen o eight almost unconscious after his accident on the descent from graham's saddle and after one of the most marvellous feats of physical endurance in the history of alpine climbing while descending the cool or near the crown prince rudolf ice fall he slipped and fell he succeeded in riving his ice case into the slope and it held but a heavy knapsack that he was carrying threw him off his balance at the critical moment with the result that he shot down the cool or for some twenty or thirty feet on to some jagged rocks the shock was so severe that he rebounded on to the most dangerous part of the couloir with a clear slide of two hundred feet leading down to a bergschrund about twenty feet widened of a known depth his knapsack apparently gripped against the slope and he was able to get a handhold on an isolated strip of rock jutting out from the snow he dragged himself on to these rocks with a badly dislocated ankle 
a lacerated knee, and minor wounds, and lay there four hours in a Seminkasi state, late in the afternoon, when the snow slopes were soft, with the boot removed from his injured and now swollen foot. Mr. Lo started on what was the most perilous part of the whole descent, unable to ascend to get his eyes case. He used his left knee on the slope, and kicked steps in the snow with his right foot, in this way he made two traverses down the slope and crossed two snow bridges and the bergschrund at the foot of the couloir. He then crawled to a piece of light moraine on the lower portion of the glacier. Here he passed the first night, endeavoring to stanch the bleeding and to cover his wounds with adhesive plaster. On the following day Thursday he decided to make for the bivouac rock. He expected to reach it before nightfall, tying a tifed piece of rope to his knapsack. He lay on his back on the snow and used his hands and his sound foot to propel himself to the rope limit. Having gone so far, he would drag the knapsack up to him and then proceed as before. This mode of progression was fairly satisfactory so long as the smooth going lasted. But on reaching the hummocky ice and the rough moraine lower down the glacier, he was again forced to crawl on his hands and knees. Towards evening, he crawled to the lee side of the biggest rock he could find. Next day Friday it rained and hailed, and finally snowed to a depth of two feet, making it impossible for him to move on the Saturday. However, he started off again and accomplished the most marvelous performance of crawling on his hands and knees through newly fallen snow over the rough and broken surface of the Moran Avacard Glacier, between crevices and over ice bridges, thence four three hundred feet up the steep face of the lateral moraine, and finally down a ridge of broken loose rocks to the bivouac. Here he remained for six days. His dislocated ankle was much swollen and very painful, and the skin and flesh were considerably worn from his knees. Each day he became weaker for want of food, as the one day's food that he carried had to last him ten days. At last he had reduced himself to two pinches of cocoa a day. Fortunately there were a few pieces of shortboard at the bivouac and out of these he improvised a crutch, so that he was able to get about sufficiently to obtain water by melting snow on the rocks. It was not till the Friday that the people at the Hermitage knew that Mr. Lowe was missing. On the west coast a search party was immediately organized, and the two young New Zealand Alpine guides, Jack Clark and Peter Graham, at once set out from the Hermitage, and arrived at the Delobic bivouac at Fora. M. On Saturday, March 3, there they found Mr. Law alive, but in a very weak condition. They at once released a carrier pigeon they had brought with them, with a brief message to the manager at the Hermitage for medical aid. In case of any misadventure to the pigeon, Guide Clark dispatched a man to the Hermitage with the news. On the Monday, Mr. Law was carried down to the Ball Glacier hut. This was a terribly arduous undertaking, as the Tasman Glacier at this point is very much creviced and broken up into large hummocks. Why, lower down, the Hochstetter and Bull Glaciers and some enormous moraines had to be crossed. Next day, Tuesday, the guides improvised a comfortable couch with a sheet of galvanized iron, a mattress, and some pillows. If this being placed on a stout pack horse, Mr. Low was taken across the Hooker River for twelve miles to the coach road. Thence he was conveyed by road and rail to T. Mark, F. subsequently, to Christchurch, where, after an operation and skilful treatment, he began gradually to recover. I had the pleasure of sitting beside him at the Alpine Club dinner in London the other evening, and he told me he had been rocks liking in Wales, and yet there are some pessimists who will tell you to day that the young Briton is becoming decadent. I did not mean to write anything about all fice, and I am afraid, Mr. Low will not forgive me for having done so, but the incident is of historic interest, and no chronicle of de Laubach and its bivouac rock would be complete without some reference to it. It was on January 3, 1893, that Fife and I reached the rock. It was a glorious evening, with not a breath of air stirring, and the warm sun streaming down into the valley loosened the sericks of a fine glacier opposite. 
sending avalanche after avalanche thundering down over the precipices onto the Kronprinz Rudolf glacier below. We raked up the gravel under the rock, and having leveled it somewhat and scooped out small holes for our hips in order that we might be more comfortable, we spread the tent and one blanket for a mattress, leaving another double blanket for a covering. Just in front of us, above our bivouac rock, was the main spur of Villabec, and at the foot of it the lateral moraine of the Crown Prince Rudolph, with six or seven older and higher moraines, some four or five of which had plants growing on them. The Crown Prince itself, near where it joins the Tasman, was very much broken, and its ice was black with moroanic debris. Across this glacier we looked on to the lower cliffs of the main range, over which Reich avalanches frequently fell. Above were visible some fine peaks, and the proportions of two or three unnamed glaciers. More to the left, in the direction of Mount Cook, could be seen glacier after glacier. The forest ross, the Kofman, the Hast, the Freshfield, the Hochstetter, and Bol all being visible while down the centre of the valley we looked four miles over the white billowy ice of the Tasman to the opposite range far beyond its terminal face. One great rock on the lateral moraine of the Tasman just above us seemed to menace our safety, but a closer examination showed that it was firmly poised and likely to retain its position for a year or two at all events. The evening continued fine, and we sat at the mouth of our cave watching the sun illumining the higher snows as it sank slowly behind the bold outline of Mount Haydinger, and listening to the avalanches thundering down from the glacier. Far away down the valley a bank of sunlit mist continued for a while above the Hochstetter ice fall, and while we sat and watched the lighter wreaths mysteriously appearing and vanishing on the highest peak of Orondi, the last gleam of sunlight slowly stole away. We intended to make an early start next morning. But, just before the gloaming, our hopes fell as we saw the relentless mists once more gradually creeping down the mountain side, and observed that a light wind had begun to blow in at the mouth of our cave. Slowly the mist descended, and glacier after glacier faded from our view, till at last a dense fog filled the whole valley. It grew cold, and we found it difficult to get to sleep. The more one tries to sleep in such situations, and especially on the eve of some important expedition, the more one cannot do it. The mind becomes abnormally active, and is occupied by one train of thought after another in quick succession, most of the subjects being quite incongruous, and entirely out of keeping with the situation. I'm sure if any eminent mental scientist ever has the good fortune to spend a night under the bivouac rocket de la Beck, he will find food for reflection, and perhaps be able to write an interesting chapter on bivouacs and mental effect. At first our pebbly bit feels fairly comfortable. After a while we begin to think it hard. About an hour or so convinces us that it is hard. Then we imagine that our hip bone is slowly working its way through the blankets, and we turn over to give the other one a fair share of the discomfort but it also soon seems to be working its way through, and as a sort of compromise we lie on our back for a few minutes preparatory to going through the whole performance over again. Then then wanted sounds add to our wake of central roar of an avalanche above the mists, the nose of loose stones rattling eerily down the moraine near our bivouac, or the cry of a belated mountain parrot seeking his airy, Next morning a drizzling mist was driving in at the mouth of our little cave, and the rock had spread a leak. There was nothing of the view left but the huge boulders of the moraine looming up ghost-like through the fog, while the only sign of life was a funny little wren that every now and then fluttered inquisitively up to the mouth of the cave. He had only the semblance of a tail. No doubt he philosophized in his own little way as to what manner of beings they could be who had made themselves a bed in such a strange situation and in such weather. Fife brewed some hot tea over the spirit lamp, and after we had partaken of breakfast we turned into bed again. By this time we were getting used to disappointments. So now we resolved to take matters philosophically, and wait for a chance at our mountain as long as the provisions held out. We had little in the way of amusement. 
and our only literature consisted of a copy of the Sydney Bulletin that Fife had put into his swag when leaving the Hermitage. We read the stories in this, then the advertisements, and then read some of the stories over again. We were, however, better off than on the occasion of our last expedition to these regions, when our only literature was the labels on the meat tins and what we composed ourselves. Later on we occupied ourselves by keeping count of the number of avalanches that fell from the glacier opposite. We found the average to be about ten an hour, or at the rate of two hundred forty a day. Eventually, we got our climb, but I shall not weary the readerent to Laura Furwishet which the details of it. We got caught in the mists, and had to descend. We endured some fine glistening and one or two adventures such as a tumble or two in two narrow crevices. We returned to the bivouac defeated, and the weather grew worse. The old sea captor who said, Give me weather as is weather, none of your and blue skies for me would have revelled in it. Food got scarce, and we had to tramp down the glacier for further supplies. It was true that there were some provisions under the rock left by Harper and Hamilton, to which we might have helped ourselves, but we resolved that if we were to climb the mountain we should do so entirely by our own exertions. We were painfully conscientious in those days, in company with some visitors whom we met on the glacier. We had another shot at the mountain later on. We got on to the main wood just below the final peak, F, finding ourselves on a bad route, again retired defeated. We were, however, rewarded by the most glorious views on every side. It will perhaps also be as well to draw a veil over this descent. We got into some awkward situations, and I have a vivid recollection of cutting steps down an almost perpendicular slope, of making some very awkward traverses across others, and of dangling at the end of the rope on a smooth rock in order to make a step in the ice at its sedge, and all the time the sun beat down furiously and there was so much refraction that our hands and faces were not only brown to a dark chocolate color, but painfully swollen into the bargain. The rocks in places were so hot as to be quite unpleasant to the touch, while the leather of my camera case began to smell as if it were singed, in one steep place. During a rather ticklish piece of stepped up, I removed my goggles for a few minutes in order the better to see what I was doing, but paid the penalty for it afterwards by suffering considerably from snow-bloodness. It was two or three days before my eyes were quite right again. Years later, one fine day, soon after our ascent of Hatinger, Fife and I strolled from the hut up to the D. Lobeck bivouac, carrying fairly light packs, consisting of sleeping bags and provisions for three days. We were in fine form, and made light of the journey, we reached our destination at three o'clock in the afternoon, lunched sumptuously at four, lit our pipes, and basked, smoking, in the warm sunshine. It was a gloriously bright day, and the higher mountains lifted their ridges above the tumbled moraine, clear-cut against an azure sky, while glaciers and white slopes of snow billowing to still higher and purer fields completed the picture and there were those other and sterner rock peaks that took in their teeth the sun, the storm, and the whirlwind, never changing countenance from day to year, and from year to age. We smoked, and talked, and watched the shadows stealing across the Iceford Valley, till finally the sun dipped behind the narrow ridge of Hadinger, and only the snow cap of Orondi was illumined. The gleaming silver brow of the monarch of the southern Alps was then transmoted into glowing gold, if, in turn, changed into frosted silver, all in the space of the fleeting sunset after. The temperature fell quickly. We crawled under the rock and sought the warmth of our sleeping bags. Through the mouth of our cave we watched the stars being set like jewels in the darkness of the spot. We were astir at half-past two of the clock and breaks faded by lantern light on tin food and cold tea. Bath rain. M. We were marching, with the lantern, across the old lateral moraines and up the Kron Prince Rudolph Glacier towards the ice fall, which we reached as dawn was breaking. 
one does not make quick progress across these dreadful New Zealand moraines by the uncertain light of a flickering candle. You step on what appears to be solid ground, and the boulder, resting on ice, slides from under your foot. You recover your balance with an effort, but hit your ankle in the process against a sharp edge slate that is as unyielding as the other stone was in stable. Dark shadows that you treat with confidence are discovered to be pools of water with a thin covering of ice that lets you through, and the warmth of your language is not sufficient to counteract the chilling shock that you have received. It is to be hoped that the recording angel turns a deaf ear to the language of the Bolimer wing mountaineer. It is under such circumstances that the climber notes, with a feeling of devout thankfulness, the faint glow that heralds the dawn, and eagerly watches the conquering march of the sun along the peaks of the giant range. With the breaking of day our spirits rose. If, being in splendid form, we simply rumped over the first cliffs and snow slopes. Having gained the crest of a narrow rocky ridge, we descended by a slanting crack onto the plateau at the foot of the peak. We walked and ran across this plateau, and then started up a snow slope that took us on to the rocks of the final peak. There was one short bit of rock work that proved interesting, but we made light of it. And at seven, thick divifa, m, we were having second breakfast on the top of the mountain. It was a record performance, and one could not help casting a retrospective glance at the unsuccessful struggles of the Rolly Mountain or Sinners in in these slopes. As we gazed across the island and along the great alpine chain, the virgin snowing peaks of the minarets, quite close at hand, attracted our attention. They were first Spills Peaks, over 10,000 feet high. Why not attempt their ascent now that we were so high up and had time to spare while we were eating our breakfast and considering this problem? Clouds formed in a stratum of cool air below us, and a marvelous transformation scene was unfolded before our wandering gaze. Northwards the mountains became islands in a sea of fleecy cloud, South and east there was a wilderness of majestic peaks, and westward that glorious view upon which we ever cast longing as dark lakes and forests, the silver streaks of river, and the great ocean, far, far down below us, that a slatted sea of cloud with the sun shining on it was such a scene as Nansen saw when he sailed in the Fram along the fair coastline of his bill of Nordland, past Alden and Kin when he beheld reefs of mist glittering like silver over the mountains, their tops soaring above the mist like islands out of the sea. Only, instead of looking up at this, as he did, we looked down at it, and saw the sun shining on the top of the clouds a still more glorious sight. In order to get at the minarets, we had to descend on the western precipices of Delabek to a somewhat extensive plateau of snow, the rocks were rather difficult where we attacked them, and when we got down and on to the snow we came on a kind of bergschrind with an almost perpendicular wall of ice, down which steps had to be cut. I dug the handle of my ice case deep into the snow and took a hitch of the rope round it. I held on to the cliff with one hand and paid out the rope with the other as Fife cut down this wall of ice. It was not of any great height, but it was a ticklish bit of work and it took freighters of an hour to cut twenty four steps. So hard was the ice, so difficult the slope, and so carefully had the steps to be fashioned for the descent of such a place. After this there was no difficulty, and we simply romped up those two icy peaks. The higher one was a perfect cone of ice with scarcely room for one to take a photograph of the other on it. We left a record of our ascent in the rocks on the western side just below the ice cop and then climbed the other peak, leaving on the highest rocks another account of this the first ascent. For some time now we were enveloped in the clouds, and had difficulty in finding our way back to De La Bec, which we had to climb once more on our way back. The Istex race which we had cut on the descent gave us no trouble in ascending, and we gained our peak in quick time, and waited for an hour on its summit enjoying the Panner Aminda smoke. We felt quite pleased with our performance. The descent was made in splendid style. 
we glycated and scrambled down the final slope in a manner that would have made a model mountaineer's hair stand on end but we had absolute confidence in each other's powers the bergschrund at the foot of the ice fall was a little awkward to cross but we gained the glacier while it was still early in the afternoon we ran down its ice for a mile or so and after scrambling over the final moranies found ourselves back in camp at four peat m a ridiculously early hour soup after tea we must needs start off again down that asmund glacier to the ball hut which we reached in the dusk of evening here we had another tea and turned in for the night to enjoy a well and rest off were those glorious days again wide as one grow old chapter zeasy across the southern nalps a wretched invention for swat for people who wish to push on is a line of retreat an everlasting inducement to look behind when they should have enough to do in looking ahead nansen when we were on the hoxteter dome and subsequently when we climbed hating rindy lobeck we saw far below us the silver streaks of rivers winding seaward through the sombre forests and cast longing eyes adown the western slopes of the alps the more we saw the more we wished to go over and what better way could we go than by some unknown pass at the head of the largest and most splendid of all our glaciers after our ascent of de la beck and the minarets it was decided to try over the lendif and Saville, and down the left and branch of the water of a river about twenty miles down the coast from the wanganai writes mr harper in the latest work on the southern alps is the water of it, another large river draining the main range at the head of the rangitata godly and murchison glaciers it has many large branches in the mountains up which no doubt there are considerable snow fields in some fair sized glaciers but except the tributary coming from the Sealy Pass at the head of the Godly Glacier, it may be said to be terra incognita. Mr. Roberts, of the Westland Survey Department, wrote in a similar strain. There were, he stated, many legends of people who had come over different passes from Canterbury in the early digging days, and stories of others who went up into unknown valleys and never returned. But amongst all these, he had never heard of any one who had come down the left and branch of the water of a river on thursday the eighteenth february the weather was fine and fife and i shouldered our packs and started off once more for that asmund glacier our friends at the hermitage came out to say good-bye and wish us good luck take good care of yourself said my wife and i replied laughingly that there was little danger Faf had written to his wife to say that there was absolutely none. It was not like climbing a mountain. It would be just to walk. Such wretches we men are for, after all, there might be danger. We could not tell. As I turned my back on the hermitage and marched off over the Tososki shingle flats to the cage in which we had to pull ourselves across the Hooker River, I fell odd warning if we should get over the pass and down through the unexplored country in safety but it would never do for britons to be poor fibrous mortals and to turn tail and run just because there was a spice of danger in an adventure so what if there were risk we should keep our eyes and our ears open and go through in the face of it and no sirens of the mountains charm they ever so sweetly should tempt us to destruction we were spartans for the moment and our pecks seemed featherweights as we swung out over the uneven plain in fine style, bound for our old bivouac some twenty miles ahead, but such an inconsistent animal is man, that by the time we got halfway over the dreary shingle flats of the Tasman, the pace had relaxed somewhat, and the featherweight packs of an hour ago began, in some mysterious manner, to be transmoted into lead, after leaving the shingle flat behind us we strode out bravely once more but while walking up the hot valley we were met by the goddess of indolus and she in her most insinuating manner said men were fools to twirl along with heavy swags on their backs under a broiling summer sun and talked pleasantly of to-morrow and the cool of another morning so by the time the blue lake was reached we had succumbed to her blandishments 
and stopped the reading and drinking in arcadian simplicity by the lake shore then we smoked and sauntered slowly over the remaining miles of the rocky track to the comforts of the ball glacier hut F. once arrived there wild horses would not have drawn us farther that night thus does the spartan morning of the mountaineer too often end in lutzi of afternoon and next morning we were in no great hurry to leave our beds there was a red dawn and we pretended that it was going to be bad weather when the morning risseth red why's not thou but keep thy bed when the dawn is full and gray sleep is still the better way beasts are up bettings but then they are beasts and we are men Buff. As a matter of fact, the weather was glorious, and we had reluctantly to tear ourselves away from the flesh pots of the hut. So once more we shouldered our loads, marched up the glacier to the De La Bec bivouac, and dined there at 3 p. m. in order to save our fresh provisions. We ate some bread that was a month old and had been lying under the rock for three weeks. It was blue moldy in the cracks but judicious sparing made it palatable and we even enjoyed it the butter was also old it had been buried in an ice slips near the bivouac some weeks before and now we found it had mysteriously disappeared after some considerable search it was discovered in a cranny between the rocks into which it had fallen knowing to the residents of the ice slope by melting it was fairly good dinner over we left for the Malt Brun bivouac, higher up, on the other side of the glacier. Here, in a little flat hollow between the lateral moraine and the mountain, we discovered a scanty supply of snow grass that had been used for bedding by dry. Kronkar, a German climber, four years before. Apparently, the worthy doctor had left camp in a hurry. For, on shaking out the grass, we found in it an Austrian climbing lantern of the folding pattern. F. Near at hand, on the walks, a pink knife, much rusted, also the remains of a leather case for a field glass. When crossing the upper portion of the glacier from the De Lubbock bivouac, we came to the conclusion that our swags were too heavy for difficult climbing. So we now set to work to reduce them to the smallest possible compass. We jettisoned some spare clothing and provisions, and it was finally decided, after much deep thought, that my camera should be left behind a decision I have never since ceased to regret. The cause, on this expedition, we traversed unexplored country by a route that in all these years no one has since attempted. Moreover, when, disheveled and wary, I returned, some weeks later, by a more southern pass to the hermitage it cost me a walk of forty miles to retrieve the camera we had a beautifully fine night for our bivouac f having supped and there being nothing else to do we turned into our sleeping bags while it was yet day the view was glorious and they watched the great steadfast peaks slowly changing color in the held breath of the day's decline across the glacier but a mile and a half away rose the main range of the southern Alps in all its glory of broken glacier black precipice and snowy dome lying in bed there we looked far down that as to where or on this great ice cupped ridge pierced the primrose of the western sky and watched through god's great window the coming of the stars for in such by walks as these it is that you get the most glorious revelations of the night true our pillow of rock was somewhat hard and the Milky Way was rather a cool counterpane. But what cared we, the goddess of Indolus, does not come so far up the glacier. We were Spartans again. On Saturday, an hour after midnight, we crept out of our sleeping bags to prepare breakfast. And at two in M, we shouldered our packs and set our faces towards the unknown. In the dim light, we had to exercise a little care in descending the loose rocks of the moraine and in getting over the broken ice at the edge of the glacier. Once we had left the moraine in the crevices behind, the going was easy, but we went at a very leisurely pace, wishing to keep our strength in reserve, for we knew not what difficulties were in front of us. The white mountains at the head of the glacier looked ethereally beautiful in the clear moonlight, 
which cast strong cold shadows on the white ice as we walked along. On our left, a fine avalanche fell from the lower slopes of Elie de Beaumont, and came thundering down into the head of the valley. In the east a pale flush heralded the dawn. Illustration, Crevissant Asmen Glacier. Some clouds came floating up over our pass from the northwest, and hung menacingly on the white shoulders of the dome. It was an ominous sight, and our spirits fell. We were soon in the region of covered crevices. So we put on the rope. The eastern light gradually brightened, and we watched the moon shadows on our right grow fainter and fainter till they disappeared, and the sun shadows took their places on the left, growing slowly in boldness of outline with the advancing sun. As we mounted the final slopes towards the saddle, the sun was bathing the higher snows of the western range with a golden glow, and by the time we were fairly on the pass, his slanting rays fell athwart our way. The pass did not look inviting. The glacier fell away on the other side in a broken ice fall, and great chasms yawned immediately below us. It was not possible to get straight down. That was clear. So we climbed a snow spow and got on to some rocks on the left. Higher up, don't say a blessed word till we've had a smoke. And then well look round, remarked Tyth. I acquiesced, and we sat down on the rocks, munched a few figs and some chocolate, and then had our smoke and the look round. We were not enamoured of the prospect. The panorama certainly was magnificent, especially towards the north, he asked. But the getting down that was the trouble. Far below us we could see the Wimper Glacier, much creviced in its upper parts, and further on entirely covered with a rain. How far below do you think it is? asked Fife. Three thousand feet. I hazarded. Fife thought four thousand. But even four thousand feet would have been nothing on good rocks and unbroken ice slopes. The rocks, however, were very rotten and the ice was just about as bad as it could be. Away down below us on the left a long way it seemed as a track where the avalanches had completely swept away the snow, and loose blocks of ice had filled up the crevices. If we could get into that we could get down. It was our only hope, and everything depended on speed, for it would never do to be caught in that narrow ice bed after the sun had acquired strength in the ablocks for hurtling down. We rose deliberately, shouldered our packs, shortened up the rope, and started down the first ridge. The rocks were furful sea rotten, and the last man on the rope had to exercise the greatest caution lest, by starting a block, he should crack the leader's skull. But we got down the first bit all right, and at the foot of the rocks encountered a snow slope, which, though beautiful enough, was from a climber's point of view, altogether uninviting, because in two places there were clear indications that it was swept by avalanches that poured over a precipice immediately above on our left. But we knew there was not much danger at that only hour of the morning, and we started across. One of the avalanche tracks was scooped out to such an extent that the further side was a perpendicular wall of snow some ten feet high. Up this we had considerable difficulty in climbing, as the steps we made repeatedly gave way. But we went at it doggedly, and in due course it was vanquished. The final avalanche chute for which we were making was still a distressingly long way off, and a great ice fold, through the serex of which we should have to thread our wake. Now began to loom large in front of us. We made a traverse across the last bit of the soft snow slope on which we were now climbing, taking good anchorage with our axes in the difficult places. Near the end of the slope was a shrund which was partly filled with avalanche snow. But we jumped it, if, crossing a little more snow, got on to good solid rocks. There was ice above, and the rocks were dripping. The debris of avalanches lay below. We crossed on slippery rocks right underneath a great wall of ice, and then climbed downward, more to the right to gain a rocky ridge of a peculiar red's brown color. There we halted for two or three minutes, and enjoyed a deliciously cool drink of the ice water that was trickling over the rocks in several places. 
We then saw that one strand of the alpine rope, about midway between Fife and myself, had been cut through by a falling rack. The cut was as clean as if it had been made with a knife. Having repaired the damage with a fisherman's bend, we began to climb down on easy rocks. Good progress was now being made. If, if we could only get down this ridge of rack, and on to the snow slope at the foot of it, it was apparent that the back of the climb would be broken. But, in mountaineering, as in many other things in this life, it often happens that, just as we are nearing the goal of our ambition, some unexpected obstacle bars the way. So, but our hopes were quickly dashed to the ground where we were face to face with a precipice down which it was impossible for man to climb. We thought we should have to give it up as hopeless, but we pondered the situation, and then began to scan the ridge immediately behind on our left. He ran almost vertical slab of wet rock, between thirty and forty feet, led into a narrow gulf shore chimney, down which a waterfall was pouring. There were no handholds to speak openly one or two cracks in the rock, but one of the climbers thought he could get down. It was truly a case of hanging on by one's eyebrows, but it was managed some high, without putting much strain on the rope, and the one stood patiently waiting under the waterfall till his clothes were quite wet and until the leather had scrambled down. The descent of this chimney, which was dripping all the way down, did not take as many minutes, for two pinnacles of ice loomed threateningly overhead, and there was also some danger of falling stones. We kept in the shelter of the cliff as much as we could. The passage under the great serac and the little bit of work into and down this chimney were somewhat sensational, and put all thoughts of return by the same route out of our heads. An hour or two later it would have been absolutely dangerous to go that way. We had burned our boats behind us, and must needs push on. That wretched invention, a line of retreat, had, by this time, to all appearances, been shattered, if, save for an occasional turn of the head to see if there was danger behind, our glances must be ever forward. In a few minutes we had reached the ice fall. If, without further hesitation, we commenced to fret our way through it, had we not known our work we should have been afraid. The toppling seraphs looked dangerous. Higher up the fall, two enormous pinnacles of ice towered splendidly in all the glitter of the morning sun. One felt so fascinated with them, and with the surroundings generally, that one needs must occasionally indulge in a momentary halt to gaze on the scene, greatly to the vexation of Faf, who always remonstrated and kept urging the necessity for greater skeed. We fretted our way down that ice fall in a way that we felt sure would be a credit to any guide, and in due course arrived at the avalanche chute. It had been raked by blocks of falling ice and masses of snow, but at this early hour of the morning, when King Frost still held the situation in his icy grip, there was no business doing. Later in the day, after the sun had been at work for some hours on the snow slopes and ice pinnacles above, it would have been a veritable death rat, even though there was no time to waste, for the sun was gaining strength every minute. Without a word we got into the chute and started down. I am free to confess that when we were on the other side of the overhanging ice cliff an hour before, I should have been quite glad to have turned back. Now I was keenly enjoying the adventure. There is something intoxicating in danger once you are fairly in it, and once you are keyed up to that point of daring and alertness at which you begin to feel the spin of the blood in your veins, as exultant, and with every confidence in your own prowess, you go forth into the battle whether man be at close grips with nature, whether he be batting with opponents in sport, or putting his wits against rivals in conversine play or in work, in lavor and where it is under such circumstances that his greatest successes are made, and so it was that our dash and daring pulled us through. For a time everything now depended upon rapid climbing, and we started off down the chute, jumping half-flight crevices, scrambling over solid eye blocks, 
and even eliciting on hard neve in a way that would have made the hair of the offers of the badminton book on mountaineering stand on end we slid down places where under ordinary circumstances we should never have dreamt of going without first cutting steps in the ice sometimes i found myself slipping down at an alarming rate only to be pulled up by fife with a jerk of the rope at other times fife came hurrying down after me and i had to hold on with my axe and set a stiff back to check his descent it was splendid fun and we were making wonderful progress albeit the destruction of our nether garments was not exactly an inverse ratio to the rapidity of the descent there was a succession of steps in the nice chute at the foot of which there were invariably loose blocks or masses of avalanche snow on these also assisted us in checking a tool and a cantable and precipitate glissade thus frequently just as an unnecessary and somewhat alarming amount of friction was being developed were we by the aid of the avalanche snow in front and the ice case acting as a break behind pulled up and brought to a sudden stop the shocks from the unexpected interposition of an avalanche block and from the sudden tightening of the rope around the most boneless part of one's anatomy came in about equal proportions though occasionally the effects were somewhat modified by a combination of both but the moment we had recovered from the surprise of the former or the tension of the latter the process was commenced again de novo thus did we make a truly wonderful albeit a somewhat indignified progress once only during this stage of the proceedings i looked behind and so the great sarics and pinnacles poised aloft after twenty minutes of fast going for such a place we came to a point at which we could see the foot of the chute filled with avalanche debris bulging out in fan-like shape as it reached the more gently sloping part of the glacier without further adventure we made our way down to this debris which as it had no snow on it made somewhat difficult walking but we were now out of danger and could afford to slacken our pace soon we had crossed the last bit of avalanche and had gained the gently sloping solid ice of the whimper glacier there we approached each other if solemnly shaking hands in that wonderful terra incognita with the everlasting hills as witnesses bad that whatever happened we should not attempt to go back by that route i thought a little ruefully of the long walk i should have from the hermitage on my return to get my camera and i wondered also if we could get down to the coast from where we were but of this surely there could be no doubt after what we had just accomplished no west coast river nor gorge nor forest could possibly stop us where the question of food might cause us some little anxiety we halted a few minutes to scan our route looking back at it no one would have imagined it possible for human beings to come down that way the rock seemed so steep and the ice so terribly broken as we gazed a few small blocks of ice started down the avalanche chute we had got out of it none too soon old sol was making his influence felt the ice was followed by a large piece of rock that broke away above the chute and came hurtling down in our tracks on it came in great leaps and bounds till at length its progress was arrested and it found a restenspold half buried in the debris of the avalanche at the foot of the chute rock avalanches continued to start from the dome which on this side was a series of magnificent ridges and precipices at one time there was a regular cannonade but we were well out of the line of fire to the left of this mountain the range continued round the further side of the whimper glacier there was one sharp rocky peak next to the dome if adjoining that on the other side of a long snow couloir some enormous slabs of slate sloping up to the summit of the range then there were two glaciers joined at the bottom where they poured their tribute into the whimper but separated higher up by a ridge that came down for some distance between them beyond this the range was very rotten for their way still on the right hand side of the water of it we could see other rocky peaks and a ridge with a flashed aft glacier on the top of it 
The Whimper Glacier went straight down the valley for some distance, and then took a fine sweep to the left. An effort was made to follow it down. But, after going some way, dodging one or two crevices and jumping others, we came upon some enormous rents in the ice, very deep, and extending right across the glacier. There was nothing for it but to retrace our steps. There was a possible route on the left by way of the rocks above the ice, threading our way through some more crevices. We climbed this ridge, and having gained its crest, were delighted to find that, so far as the ice work was concerned, all our difficulties were now at an end. We sat on the warm rocks and smocked. The ridge below was studded with numbers of beautiful yellow wren and pulley, the wikes like petals of which glistened like burnished gold in the sunlight amongst the dark rocks. From this ridge we scrambled down some slopes of seraphs and gained the glacier again. Here, beside a stream that ran in a channel in the ice, we stopped for lunch at eleven. At M. We had been going without food or rest for nine hours, and now took off our wet things and dried our putties. Booths and stockings on the warm rocks that he almost covered the glacier. Hey, we did enjoy that lunch we stopped for nearly an hour, dozing for part of the time in the sunshine, then off down the glacier for fully a mile over Moranine, some places composed of small rocks, and others of great erratic boulders shin up the face of a great ancient lateral moraine, on top of which there was a luxuriant growth of vegetation, thence down to the terminal face of the glacier, where the water of a river came forth in majestic volume from a cave of clear ice. A creek flowed in from the left, fed from some beautiful waterfalls that came over the precipices from the everlasting snows beyond. It was fringed with fine trees and alpine plants, and one ribwind off tree was gay with beautiful white blossoms that peeped out from amongst the tender green of its leafy branches. It was so different from the eastern side of the Alps, and altogether such a charming spot, that we were tempted to haul to while. A cold wine sprang up, so we made a fire and bowled our little billy to make bovril. We put a whole pot of bovril in it, and this we ate with dry bread. In half an hour we were on the march again down the left hand side of the river, finding our way through scrub, over enormous boulders, and down through dense butch. The river was now a seeking torrent, roaring over and between the great rocks, and the mountains towered above the sombre vale. We seemed to make but slow progress, and hour after hour went all too quickly by. At six p. m. we camped for the night beside the turbulent torrent that went roaring down the unexplored valley. We had been on the march since two o'clock that morning, and now, after our sixteen hours toil, during which we had carried swags over by for the roughest pass ever made in New Zealand, felt we were entitled to a weller and rest. Mm. Then Beb, and soon the crackling of the campfire mingled with the rumble of the river, which was ever present, and seemed to haunt us in our dreams. Chapters of Across the Southern Alps continued good luck is the gayest of all gay girls. Long in one place she will not stay. Back from your bro she brushes the curls, kisses you quick, then runs away. But Madame Badlock, she soberly comes. No fancy has she for flitting. Snatches of strange, sad songs she sings, sits by your side and brings her knitting. Good luck had walked with us over the pass and down the valley. But at this point of the journey she must have either outdistanced our lagging footsteps or returned the way she came. Anyhow, she left us, and our troubles began. When we halted, the warm sun had left the narrow valley, and before we could get a fire going, the chill air began to search up the very marrow in our bones. The dryness of the eastern side of the range had given place to the humidity of the west, and every bit of wood or plant was either green or sodden with moisture. Finally, when we did get a fire going, it was a very smoky one and gave little heat except what was required for the burling of the billy. We ate a frugal meal of tinned meat, bread, and tea, made mattresses of damp green branches and ferns cut with our paquetsking, 
crept into our sleeping bags, lit our pipes, talked over the events of the day and the prospects of the morrow, and then tried to sleep. Fife's leg was beginning to trouble him, but he said little about it. The mere fact of his mentioning it at all was, however, sufficient to give me some concern, for Fife was never meant to make a mountain out of a molehill. We spent a miserable night in our sleeping bags, and when we awoke at five o'clock next morning were cold and stiff. Tea was made from compressed tabloids, and sweetened with saccharine. In this compressed form it is possible to carry in one's waistcoat pocket enough tea and sugar for an expedition lasting several days. Saccharine, however, does not seem to be a good substitute for sugar, as there is no nourishment in it, and tea in tabloid form is an invention of the devil. At six it, m, shouldering our cacks once more, we started down the valley, cold and stiff as we were. There was no buoyancy in our stride, and I could not fail to see that Fife was limping badly, though he told bravely on. It was Sunday morning, and a clear sky gave promise of another glorious day. The valley was densely wooded, the forest coming down the steep hillsides right to the water's edge. There was scarcely a scrap of level ground anywhere, and the river was a seeking torrent. It was necessary to shout to make our voices heard above its everlasting roar. We proceeded for a little way along the side of the stream, and then took to the butch, but returned to the edge of the river again a little further on. The boulders were very large, and had we not both been rocks leakers, they would have troubled us considerably. As it was, however, we lost but little time, for whoever happened to be leading tackled the difficulties without hesitation, selecting the route, and quickly noting the best hendrippings as he went up one side of some great boulder that blocked the way and down the other. After an hour or two scrambling we found our progress barred by a gorge in the river, and we had to climb through the bush on the hillside. Here Fife had the misfortune to strike his leg twice in rapid succession on sharp angular rocks de debris of an ancient moraine that lay hidden under a luxuriant growth of the most exquisite mosses and ferns. In each case the blow was severe, and very painful because of the already inflamed wound on the leg. If, though we were still in the cool shade of the forest, the pain was so intense that the perspiration came out in beads on his forehead, we struggled on in rather a gloomy frame of mind, till, at tenant, M, we came to a second gorge in which the scenery was very grand, a rocky plateau, worn smooth by flood water, fringed the left bank of the stream at a considerable height above, pools of water lay here and there in the hollows of the rocks. Along this plateau we proceeded, across the stream the rocks rose straight from the water's edge, clothed with ferns and mosses, and fringed above with trees, amongst which the scarlet blaze of the rata blossom made a glorious contrast with the sombre green. The scarcity of bird life in such a beautiful wood seemed strange. At times we could hear the beating of a wood pig in wings in the air, if, on looking up, would see a solitary, great plumed bird flying across the narrow valley, or we would hear the whistle of the caca butch parrot and note the flashing scarlet of his underwings as he went from one branch to another, eyeing the strange intruders into his domain with that insatiable curiosity that is such a feature of his character, and that, alas, so often leads to his destruction. The alpine vegetation was now far behind us. Everywhere was a luxuriant growth of moss and fern and tree. In one place a tight anic boulder blocked the river bed and the waters thundered through a narrow defile, over which a man might easily jump. At the lower end of the gorge the river ran for some distance between precipitous walls, and we had once more to take to the pathless forest on the mountain side. Then we climbed down to the river again, and began the same scramble over the interminable boulders. This scrambling over and under rocks made us get into all sorts of strange attitudes. We femt, if there were much more of it, that we should soon qualify for the position of acrobats in a circus. But the cold, hard, damp bed of the previous night, following upon a long and trying day's exercise, 
had left us rather stiff for such contortions, and we simply longed for a hot bath and a rub down. We even talked about such a luxury, and scarcely were the words uttered than we found Mother Nature with the bath ready at hand. All this morning we had noticed at intervals, as we marched beside the stream, a strange and somewhat offensive smell. We had attributed it to some plant in the forest, or to decaying vegetation. In jumping from one boulder to another I saw that the water below had patches of oil floating on it, and the offensive smell was very strong. So I stopped to make an investigation. On putting my hand into the water I found it was quite hot. Here was just what we wanted. I called out to Fife that I had found a hot spring. He was at first inclined to doubt my words. But when he remembered the strange smell that abounded in the valley, he came back. If, in less time than it takes to tell the story, we found ourselves in the garb of Adam, and reveling in the luxury of a hot bath in the midst of a garden more glorious than the original Eden. But minus the temptations and distractions with which our original ancestor was beset, the water ran into a clear pool and where it welled up in one place beside the glacier water of the river we could have. At the same moment, a warm bath on one side of our bodies and a cold bath on the other, this bath freshened us up wonderfully, and took all the stiffness away. Our only regret was that we had no means of taking us ample of the water away with us for analysis. About midday we came to yet another gorge, where we halted for lunch. We got through without much bushwork and arrived at a large stream that came in from the left. We took off our nether garments, put on our boots again without stockings, waded through, and in that guise walked for some distance along a comparatively level beach. When I looked round and saw Fife walking half-naked behind me over the rocks, I was seized with the ludicrous nature of his appearance and laughed heartily, only to have myself heartily laughed at in return. Our delight was now great for we saw ahead of us a mile or so of comparatively easy walking, and fondly imagined that we had done with those troublesome gorges. But again our hopes were foredoomed to disappointment, for on rounding a promontory the river took a bend to the left and entered another gorge. It was the worst one of the lot. There was nothing for it but to take to the bush and climb the steep hillside to a plateau in the forest that seemed to run parallel with the river. We climbed up a long way, and got in amongst some tall trees where the forest was fairly open. The ferns here were exquisitely beautiful, and rare varieties abounded. Whole tree trunks were covered with the varied greens of the beautiful kidney fern, and at almost every step the graceful fronds of the umbrella fern rose above its neighbors and the lovely mosses that made a gloriously green and springy carpet for the neven ground. It was a veritable fairy land and one would not have been greatly surprised if the queen of all the fairies had met us at any turn. We kept well up the mountainside, sometimes getting a bit of easy climbing, at other times making heavy work of it with our swags through scrub and luxuriant undergrowth, and all the time the rumbling of the waters, softened now by distance, could be heard down below on the right. But we could see nothing beyond a few yards, Suddenly the roaring of waters close in front fell upon our rears, and we found ourselves face to face with a high fall that came down in a succession of leaps through the forest. We followed it to the river and crossed where the precipice ended and the water ran over some gently sloping ground towards the river. Ahead was a level shingle flat. The valley was widening out and the hills were lower. But, surely, our difficulties would be at an end. But after going a few hundred yards we saw the river again entering a deep and narrow gorge. We had been going pretty steadily for twelve hours. Fife's leg was bad, and we were both a little tired, and in no mood to tackle the gorge. So we camped and made tea. Driftwood was here in plenty. We lit a big fire under the overhanging trees, and dried our wet clothing. Meanwhile we took our bearings. The river now swollen into a stately stream, forked on the shingle flats, and ran at a more leisurely pace. It seemed a good spot to cross in the event of our deciding to avoid the gorge by climbing a lower hill on the right bank. 
we had taken with us at the start of this expedition two loaves of bread, a foiled tin of meat and four pound of marmalade, together with a small pot of bavril, and the tea and sugar tabloids, reckoning that, with our sleeping bags and some spare clothing, this would be as much as we could conveniently carry over so difficult a pass. We estimated also that this quantity of provisions would be just about enough to see us down to civilization on the west coast. It was with a somewhat rueful countenance, therefore, that, after supper, we now looked at the two empty tins that had contained the jam and marmalade, and beheld only enough bread left for one frugal meal. Had Fife's leg been sound we should not have minded, but it was now terribly inflamed and swollen to abnormal dimensions, so that we were not sure whether he would be able to stand another day's rough walking. Having dried our things, we slipped out, with our ass cases, to hollows in the shingle on a bank overhung by trees, if, getting into our sleeping bags, lay down in them for the night, should it come on to rain. It was decided to get up at any hour of the night and endeavor to cross the river before it became flooded. The sand flies were numerous and very troublesome, but they left us shortly after sundown. The shingle bank made a soft bed in comparison with the rougher rocks of the glacier Moranis, to which we had been used on the eastern side of the divide, and under ordinary circumstances I doubt not that we should have slept long and soundly, but Fife's love grew worse and worse and all night long he tossed, moaning, from side to side in a vain endeavor to get relief from the pain. I lay awake four hours, listening, and wondering whether we could cross the river in safety, and whether in the event of our doing so he would be able to continue the journey. Then I would commence to devise schemes for getting him down to the cursed should he knock a pole together. I fully expected that I should have to leave him here and proceed alone down the valley in quest of aid, once or twice during the night, when he was more than usually restless. I ventured an inquiry as to how he fared, and received a gloomy, monosyllabic answer that was the reverse of shearing, and then it was, in the silences of the night, as I lay thinking and planning that the lines I have put at the head of this chapter came into my head, and I could not refrain from repeating them over and over again to myself, good luck is the gayest of all gay girls. Long in one place she will not stay. Back from your bro she brushes the curls, kisses you quick, then runs away. But Madame Bad Luck, she soberly comes. No fancy has she for flitting. Snatches of strange, Sad songs she sings, sits by your side and brings her knitting. Well, after all our good fortune, here was Madame Badluck come at last, and it really looked as if she had brought her knitting. The campfire dies down, and a wecko or some night bird stirs the dry leaves near at hand. I watch the stars come out, and one fine star rise slowly above the eastern horizon. The night is clear and cold, and stretching stretching over all, bends the unmessered sky, that blows with its pale stars like the full close where it with eternity shall wall time round when time shall fall. Chapter Veeks across the southern Alps can spalled the was about half a minute when it have sold out mighty cheap and took a promise for the money. American offer. When dawn came, Fife was still tossing restlessly in his sleeping bag. We got up at Fiber. M and partially in rest for the crossing of the river, we got over the first branch without difficulty, but the second stream ran swift and deep. Faf got near midstream, hesitated a moment, and then plunged ahead, but he had scarcely gone a couple of yards when he was swept off his feet and was at the mercy of the current. His swab was over one shoulder, in one hand he carried the alpine rope, and in the other his ice case. I never expected to see swab, as face, nor rope again, and I was just on the point of rushing downstream with a view to intercepting Fife at a bend in the river before he should be carried down to the gorge. Once into it there would have been no hope for him. Many years ago a man was drowned while attempting to cross this same river below the gorge. Fife, however, 
with grim determination stuck to all his belongings if after a stroke or two he came to the surface again and floundered into shallow water the current there was still strong and he was knocked off his feet for the second time but in two minutes he had got through the worst of it and as he gained the further shore he turned round and laughed he told me afterwards that that he had set his teeth with grim determination and was all the more minded after his involuntary sizing to get even with the river he would not have cured so great was the pain from his wound had he been swept into the gorge whether he got through it dead or alive it was now my turn to cross and as i looked truthfully over the broad stream at my dripping halkthove companion i realized that what he had so narrowly escaped might perchance happen to me fife came back as far as he dared into the current and endeavored to throw one end of the alpine rope back to me but the stream was much too wide and he failed in his efforts there was nothing for it therefore but to make the attempt and i waded in by going a few yards farther upstream i took the current at an easier angle if thought was touch and go at one time i crossed in safety at that holy hour of the morning both the water and the air were icy cold and when i reached the further bank five steep were chattering we lit a fire to dry our wet things and between the process of undressing and dressing we were attacked by myriads of sand flies ahead was a steep hill covered with dense butt up which we had to climb and we knew not what was beyond moreover we had to be content with tableau tea and saccharine for breakfast as we wished to keep our last bit of bread as an emergency ration while we were drying our things a small wren came hopping about in quite a friendly way if though it went to my heart to do it i killed him with my catapult still in the event of my having to leave five one or two of these birds small as they were would not be amiss one cannot make a very full meal of tableau tea sweetened with saccharine and it is scarcely the sort of food for a climber when he has to go through dense forest and up a steep hill with a swag on his back at one time we thought of abandoning our swags so that we might make quicker progress fife sled pained him at every step and he told me afterwards that he was busy wondering during all this morning why he had ever been born on gaining the top of the hill we found several gullies running in the direction of the river we crossed near the head of these and arrived at a comparatively flat area on top of a ridge but could see nothing owing to the tallness of the trees at length with a joyful shout i came suddenly on an old disused rack on which were the recent footprints of a bullock we presumed that the animal was being used by some lonely miner as a means of transport to his claim and came to the conclusion that if we followed the tracks we should find food and help near at hand a closer examination of the tracks however revealed the fact that the bullock had gone up and down the path and we could not tell which prints were the newer moreover look we ever so closely we could find nowhere any sign or trace of the presence of man if finally the mystery was solved and our hopes again dashed to the ground by the sudden appearance of five or six wild cattle big and fat and with great horned heads that went tearing past us through the forest and vanished over the brow of the hill into the valley out of which we had just climbed the nerves they made as they crashed through the undergrowth at close quarters startled us somewhat and the first inclination was to dodge behind the trunks of the splendid trees that grew in such luxuriance in this forest primeval but it was soon apparent that they were much more frightened of us than we were of them so we continued our weary march down the narrow half again on track which led us out of the forest and back to the river a little way below the mouth of the gorge here on the beach the first thing that met our gaze was the footprints of a man we would have given a great deal to have found that man but like the footprints of the bullock his tracks also went both ways 
and it was impossible to decide at which end of his journey he was. I tried very hard to make out which were the more recent footprints. But there appeared to be no difference. They had apparently been made on the same day. We afterwards found that the man was a miner and that he was working hard by. Here we halted to have some warm tea, and we now eat all our bread except about two cubic inches, which we kept as a memento of the trip. I also plucked and cooked the wen, grilling him at the end of a stick. He was a tender morsel, but very, very small at this point. There was some debate as to whether we should swim the river to the left bank or proceed down the bank upon which we now were. So, while Fife rested, I went exploring. If, at the mouth of the gorge, found an old and rickety foot bridge made of fencing wire and saplings suspended high above the water. As Fife's leg grew still worse, I now threw away the blanket out of my sleeping bag. If, to ease his burden, took most of his things in my pack. We crossed the bridge in some trepidation, for it swayed ominously and looked most insecure. On the other side of the river we found another disused track, in places completely overgrown with ferns and scrub. It led us to the rive bank a mile or so farther on, where we came upon the footprints of a man, a horse, and a dog, and we followed these down the valley. Sometimes the tracks were along the shingle beach. At other times they went into the butch. Occasionally we lost them altogether. Then one of us would suddenly come upon them again, and cry out, Oat, here's the horse while the other would, perhaps, remark, here's the man, or here's the dog also. In this manner we made our way down the valley, where there was, as yet, no sign of cultivation nor of any habitation. The river was now a stately stream, flowing over a broad shingle bed. Indeed, it is the third largest river on all the west coast, only the buller and the host exceeding it in size. About eleven o'clock I was overjoyed to see the head and shoulders of a horse appearing above one of the gravel banks in the river bed. We found a small but very intelligent bow in charge and immediately subjected him to a running fire of questions. He told us he was the son of Alex, one of the water of a ferry. Now it chanced that I had a letter of introduction from the late Mr. Seven, then Prime Minister of New Zealand, to Mr. One. So we made haste down to his house. Some three and a half miles farther on, we spoke of leaving our swags for the horse to carry, but on second thoughts we decided to finish our contract in style, and left them on our own backs, regretting all the time that we had done, sir. At twelve, thirty in the afternoon we walked into what is marked on the map as the township of Rehuchio. It consisted of one house in the house we found an elderly man with his wife and a large family, the youngest of which was only three months old. In this home we received a most kindly and hospitable welcome and remained several days in the hope that rest and hot fermentations would heal the wound in Fife's leg. But the leg got no better, and after a time it was decided that I should go south some forty miles to Gillespie's Beach and return to the Hermitage via Fitzgerald's Pass. While Fife went on to Tukitikov, where he had his leg opened up by a doctor, and two or three pieces of bone taken out, we said farewell on Wednesday, February 24, he going north, and I going safe in company with the mailman, on horseback. It was raining heavily when I left the water of a ferry, and I had no overcoat. But Mr. Gunn rigged me out in true west coast fashion, with one sack tied round my loans and another fastened round my shoulders. Then we started off down the wonderful and historic west coast where the climate is as wet and the liquor as fiery as any in the whole wide world. The pack-horse that carried the mails was a particularly obstinate brute, and while I was helping the mailman to drive it along it suddenly lashed out vigorously with its heels and kicked me on the leg. In a few seconds the lead was terribly swollen, and the pain was so acute that I feared the bone had been injured. Luckily, however, the iron shoe had just missed the shin bone 
and my leg was to some extent protected by the putties I was wearing. Otherwise it had gone harder still with me. Here was a nice state of a fester be laid by the heels in this manner on a level road after all one's adventures amongst unexplored glaciers, mountains, and rivers, however, I decided to ride on to Ocarito, if, for the next few miles of the journey, was able to reflect on the fact that all our original party except my wife were now hors de combat with injured legs. It seemed doubtful if I should now be able to return alone over Fitzgerald's Pass. An injured leg is not the best of companions on a solitary mountain journey. After we had proceeded a few miles through the bush we came upon some men who were driving cattle. If, strangely enough, one of these young fellows had just been kicked on the chest by the horse he was riding. Such accidents are among the little troubles that the pioneer has to put up with, and as there is usually no doctor within a hundred miles, one simply damns the cause of the injury. Applies the ordinary simple remedies or even a horse in Brookmaverchen Kacher, with the assistance of plain living, to complete the cure. It is wonderful how many things can be cured by simples and how well you are when the doctor is a hundred miles away we arrived at Ocarito in the evening in the pouring rain. And for one night we enjoyed the luxury and comfort of an hotel. He met quite a character who was locally known as Billy Barlow. He had been a star in the holes in London many years ago, and could still act Hamlet and sing a good comic song. On Thursday we made an only start for Gillespie's. The main south road from this point was, in places, more imaginary than real. So we kept to the Bibig. The heavy rain had ceased and the sun shone brightly on the shore, while inland great masses of cumulus glide piled themselves above the mountain tops. Our spirits were high, and the horses, though, seemed to revel in the glorious morning as they galloped along the firm. Wet sands, the breakers came tumbling shoreward. Above us were the cliffs of the Beebake, covered in places with beautiful ferns and shrubs, through which, at intervals, the silver streak of some waterfall flashed in the sunlight. Beyond, the tall trees rose on a sort of tableland, and the forest streffed away to the foothills, above which gleamed the long line of glory of the southern Alps. Peak after peak I recognized. Here were all our old snowy friends with their backs turned on us, but looking grander than ever in their state lounges of beetling crag and gleaming comb, above the sombre green of their forest setting. In riding along the beach to Gillespies, the traveler has to study the tides. In places there are bold rocky bluffs that cannot be passed at high water. We were late enough at the last bluff, and Huey Thompson, the mailman, shook his head dubiously as the foaming breakers came thundering amongst the big rocks. We waited some minutes, anxiously watching, and then made a dash for it. At who came last, just escaping a big wave that broke as I passed, the pack horses used in this mail service are, however, wonderfully sagacious animals. On occasions they have been left to their own devices whilst the mailman has taken a safer route along the rocks higher up. At such times they will be seen patiently watching the receding waves till a good opening occurs, when they will dash along to a safe standpoint, there to await another opportunity before dashing on again. Several men, however, have been drowned while rounding these bluffs, and their horses dashed to death on the rocks by the remorseless surf. Another case is the horses have escaped by swimming. The turbulent, unbridged rivers, though, have claimed heavy toll of the daring pioneers. Gillespie's Beach is a small mining settlement with one hotel and a few diggers' huts. I had to wait here for some days, but did not grudge the time, as both my leg and the weather were bad. Eventually I moved on farther south and stayed in a hut with four miners and an entertaining young Maori named Friday. The hut was on a small cattle ranch owned by an old west coaster who was then in the Nikitika hospital. His nephew, Dick Vivian, a strong, bright, Lancashire lad, was in charge, if, as I was not very sure that my leg would hold out. 
I engaged him to accompany me part of the way on my return journey to the Hermitage. All the people I met on the way down shook their heads gravely when they learned that I purposed crossing the Alps alone. But I knew if my leg held out for the first two days I should be all right. I was rather pleased than otherwise that the weather continued bad, for the enforced idleness gave my leg a chance to mend, much bathing with warm water and rubbing with a horse embrocation. A panacea for all outward ailments in these parts had considerably reduced the swelling. One night we were visited by a severe thunderstorm, and the rain fell in torrents. But we made merry inside the hut. If, after a supper of bold fish and potatoes, held a grand concert, Friday, with a Morris song, some parts of which, I am afraid, would not bear translation, was the hero of the evening. Even Billy Barlow would have had to play second fiddle to our man Friday. I can still see his expressive dark features and his expansive grin, revealing a set of beautiful pulley teeth. And here, in imagination, the strange songs that were sung, I can see again young Foster, and Head, and Wick, and the Maori, and a quiet old Scotsman sitting round the big log fire that went roaring up the capacious chimney, all keeping time with their feet as they drawled out a melancholy chorus to each verse of an interminably long love swing. It take you home, Kathleen, across the ocean blue and wide, to where your heart has ever been, since first you were my bonny bride. Kathleen was evidently an exile in a strange land, if, apparently, could not get used to her new surroundings. Fine, bronzed, broad-hested fellows the singers were, leading a healthy, happy life in these western wilds, and I shall never forget their kindness to the lonely pilgrim who had chanced within their domain. My leg mended slowly, but I spent the time in delightful idleness, by day fishing for flounders and mullet, and by night mainly occupied in hunting, quarry being that diminutive species of charmos so humorously described by my old friend and fell with Elbert. Mark Twain, but the more one slaughtered the more there seemed to be. No sooner had you killed one than you found a hundred prepared to come to his funeral at last the time came for me to turn my face again towards the mountains, for I knew my wife, who was waiting at the hermitage, on the other side of the great mountain chain, would be getting anxious about my non viral So one fine morning Dick Fidian and I got horses and rode to Scott's homestead, situated on a little island between the forks of the Karangoria River. We were warmly welcomed and pressed to stay the night. But I decided to hurry on. He repurchased two loaves of bread, four dozen hard-boiled eggs, some bacon, cherries, sugar, and butter for my journey. The butter, unfortunately, owing to the heat, melted and ran out of the tin in which it was enclosed into the blanket in my sleeping bag. It was not at all pleasant getting into a buttered sleeping bag, and I would much rather have had the said butter on my bread than on my bed. However, there was no use crying over spilt milk, or spilt butter, and we ate our dry bread with a good grace that a turned, and a measure, for the absence of the butter. We camped the first night under an overhanging rock near Architect Creek, several miles up the Copland, which is the right-hand branch of the Karngoria River. My companion was an excellent bushman and a good hand with a swab. He had built a large fire close by the side of our bivouac, but I, who had not of late been used to such warm quarters, found it mighty and pleasant, and lay sweltering in my sleeping bag, warding off the attacks of mosquitoes, and vainly endeavouring to sleep. The next day we went right up to the head of the volley a good day's march. As the blazed tracks made in the butch were in places completely obliterated by slips from the hillside or new vegetation that had grown since they were cut, our bivouac this night, near Mount Sefton and the Marchant Glacier, at the head of the valley, was as cold as the previous night's was warm, for the temperature was below free gestnating, and without an axe we could get no suitable wood to build a big fire. Next morning, only 
I said fit by two dict, and started up the valley alone. This was the first crossing of the pass from the west coast, and there was little date as to the line of route. To add to the difficulty, the last thousand feet had to be climbed in a fog. But luckily I had, before the fog descended, taken a compasser being of the general direction of the pass, and this stood me in good stead. The summit of the range was gained after slightly more than two and a half hours climbing. He I waited for an hour till the clouds had risen. When I was able to enjoy the views on every hand, then I commenced the descent. It was quite clear weather on the eastern side of the divide. There was a bit of rock work to begin with, which, seeing I was alone, I did very carefully. Then I crossed the top of a glacier and got some good glistening down snow slopes and shingle shoots. Hill, in an incredibly short space of time, I found myself feeding a second luncheon on the old moraine of the Hooker Glacier. I was in splendid form, and my lead had stood the strain well so far. The whole descent occupied only an hour. There can be no doubt that this pass, discovered by Fitzgerald, a member of the Alpine Club, is the best route for tourists proceeding from the Hermitage to the west coast. On the old lateral moraine of the Hooker Glacier I gathered some very fine edelweiss, which I took with me to the Hermitage. I arrived there early in the afternoon, but was in no plight to the scene, for my knees were sticking through great holes in my knickerbockers. My coat was torn, and I was bronzed and bearded, if not like the pard, at least like a man who hadn't shaved for several weeks, which is perhaps worse, though I do not know for certain. Never having seen the pard, I tried to slink into the hermitage by the back way, but the rattle of my pannikin against the ice case drew the attention of one of the sunbound brigade in my direction, and I had to run the gauntlet of their hearty congratulations, while at the same time I had to walk backwards into the house because it was not only the knees of my nether garments that had suffered on this particular expedition in a very few minutes i was steeped in a luxurious hot bath and an amused listener to the remarks on my personal appearance made by the hermitage maidum gladys back mrs rust but ain't he a sight lord mum no tramp could look west chapters evie and kiwi landal and upstream some like a downward smoke slobberping veils of thinnest lawn did go and some fro wavering lights and shadows broke rolling a slumbrous sheet of foam below tennyson in that far corner of new zealand where the long fingers of the fires reach inland towards the mountain ranges amidst which lie the great deep lakes there is a region rich in its surpassing beauty and ever ready to offer a store of stern adventure to the modest climber who delights in the untrodden ways it is true the mountains are not high as heights go in these modern day sea teeth and the bruises and the bull cormans your conways and your collies would in the times i write of find tasks to test their indian cerber at least their perseverance parentis to put a strain upon their commissariate sufficient to conduce to a gradual tightening of the belts of such as wear them into that land of beautiful forests and a strange burbulf of deep canyons and high waterfalls, of lovely lakes and clear rivers, of dark precipices and insullied glaciers, we were the first climbers to adventure. Of our journeyings in that wonderland, memories come crowding in upon me as I take up my pen to commence this chapter. But there is scarce space in this book to tell a tithe of them. They began with that said mission into the Mount Anson Company with my friend and fellow Caplers, the Hog, Vast. Mackenzie Otto looked for my own lost professor. He had wandered out from the tent and his two companions. One wet day, for a stroll looked the gorge leading to the pass they were looking for. That was more than twenty years ago, and to this day no one has found trace of him, and no man knows the manner of his death. A hut, after a hurried journey by means of special trains and coaches, we reached that beautiful sombre lake of the sorrowing heart and launched a leaky boat upon its troubled waters only to find it sinking so rapidly that we had scarce time to get it back with our wedded belongings to the shore 
of how we patched it up with old rags and some tar found mixed up with the pebbles of the beach, of our adventurous trip, with the baler ever at work, up the lake, of our journey through the forest primeval, of our discovery of the pass and our unavailing search there, of how the mountain torrent rose in the night time, many feet, till the tent was in danger of being swept away, and of how our food gradually diminished until there remained only some biscuit crumbs and the leg of a tough and hoary pre at a man to tea cack up of these and other matters I am tempted to write. But the most good at heart of publishers must put some limit to the size of the book he is producing, and so I forbear. The cairn that be erected to the memory of Professor J. Main wearing brown a talented English gentleman for the rude wooden cross at its head, was, perhaps, not a very lasting memorial, but we took the liberty of naming after him a lonely mountain tarn and a peak at the head of the pass near which must lie his lonely grave either in the fairyland for a star amongst the beautiful alpine flora that he loved so well. These form a more fitting monument. The road to this region led past the Takatimo mountain range, across the silvery tussock downs, and fruin bridged streams, the Takatimo Rangiso tradition says is one of the canoes of the Mari migration turned into stone, and its sail is now the plain through which the five rivers flow from the inner land. Time was when the swore the southern Maori, encamped by the lakeside, grubbed the edible firm root, or in the absence of a warkindingly baited his elpots in view of a change from the monotony of a vegetable diet. In time of war the change was, perhaps, as easily made, if, certainly, it was more decided. For some years it was thought that a remnant of the Nantigamops might still exist in the mountain fastnesses of Firedland, but there can be no doubt but, that the marauding warriors from the north practically annihilated the tribe, and that the Elports and fire sticks, the old skull with the teeth gnarled from chewing the fern root, and the mares and other relics from the ancient battlegrounds, dug up by the early settlers, are all that remained. Besides tradition, to tell the story of the former inhabitants of Manipuri and Tianu, how the lakes came to be formed is a matter for the geologists, the geographers, and the physiographers. Some will tell you they have been scooped out by the glaciers of a past period. Others, again, will deny this. For myself I can never quite follow the reasoning of the rationists. The greater glaciers, in the higher part of the range at Mount Cook, moving at the rate of, say, half an inch a day along their softer beds, and with a great press of moraine above and in the ice below, have scooped out no such deep lakes, the vanished glaciers of Tianu and Manapuri, flowing from a lower altitude and down a more level valley would march at a still slower rate, and they carried with them a minimum of moraine. Why in the less likely case have we deep lakes, if, and the more likely one, non as to close shallow ones that have been formed, not by erosion, but by the blocking of the valleys with moraenic debris, it is difficult to conceive how Lake Wakatapia, especially with its surface 1,000 feet above Sealville and its floor 400 feet below it, could have been so scooped out, and one is tempted to tell the rationists, as Ruskin told them, to try to sew a piece of marble through with edge of iron, not of sap, yes, for so, and with sharp flints and four fells per slime, to move the sew at the rate of an inch in freakters of an hour, and see what lively and impressive work they will make of it. I may be told that Ruskin was not a scientist, and I certainly am not. But even the scientists themselves hold converse theorists, and after all, they are only theories. In the days when I made the journey I am now about to write of, travel in Kiwil and was beset with many difficulties. The getting to the lake was bad enough, but once aboard the lugger with was a very small steamer that raised steam in a most erratic way from burning wood and never quite knew what would happen. The captain had some knowledge of steering a plough on dry land, but little in regard to the navigation of a ship. If, moreover, he had contracted an unpleasant habit of falling asleep at the wheel, a habit that one would rather not see and duly encouraged, 
especially on a dark night. The result was that when he Aokor was of a confred would generally be a heated argument between him and the one and only engineer as to where they were the engineer had a happy knack of poking his head up through the little hatchway at an opportune moment and asking the skipper in a gruff voice where the devil he was making for. And the skipper, guiltity endeavouring to rub the slumber out of his eyes. What remark in dubious stones that he was steering for e on clump potries or for the promontory with the bluegums on it? But, as often as not, the clump of trees would be quite a fiction, and the promontory with the bluegums on it the creation of an imaginative but otherwise dull brain. At such moments the skipper would at first argue the point with all the passiveness of the slumberer who swears he has been awake all the time. But, generally, it would end in his taking his orders from the engineer this was somewhat disconcerting for the passengers if it might have been thought humiliating for the captain especially as he was not only the captain but also the owner of the vessel the captain however did not seem to mind occasionally when there was a headwind the little vessel would make but slow progress up the lake and the supply of fuel would come suddenly to an end. But that was a matter easily remedied, for they simply ran the nose of the vessel ashore, and captain and engineer, with the passengers assisting, plied the axe in the forest primeval until a new supply of fuel had been put on board. Then the vessel would be put ahead for all she was worth, and sparks would come streaming aft from the funnel till the drier part of the fuel on deck would catch fire, and we would have to dip buckets of water from the lake to quench the conflagration. Or maybe, under the press of steam caused by some combined momentary enthusiasm on the part of the engineer and the captain, the boiler tubes would commence to leak, so that we would once more have to run ashore and make up some puddle of thick clay with which to heal up the wounds all nautical pride we laid aside and ran the ship ashore till with rags and clay in all only bay we made her taut once more at the close of a day exciting day we sailed in pouring rain if at length we lay in another bay to patch her up again but even in such memorable journeys there are some compensations and one of these is luncheon we land in a sheltered nook where the little waves come flapping lazily to our feet to kiss with whispering sound and low the beach of pebbles white as snow. There, under the tall beech trees, we build a great log fire, if all in heeding of the gently falling rain. Ball the billy and enjoy our first camp meal, amidst scenes of almost Arcadian simplicity. It is the memories of such meals that remain when recollections of Vosin's in the Rue St. Hernard, or the Ritz, in Piccadilly, have been dimmed by the passing years, and I am sure that no delicacy in a Savos supper, and not even de Lair's famous canard de la presse at the Tredargent could be more delicious than the grilled bacon that came to us. In these wilds, still sizzling from the red coals of the campfire, Overhead we could hear the strange sound from the beating of the air by the wings of a wood pigeons and note the scarlet flash of the cacas under dress as he flew across the valley uttering his discordant screeches of protest. Mueller, the quiet native thrush, with russet tail, would peer at us from the tangled undergrowth, while the little wrens, confiding to the verge of boldness, would come hopping to us, if, after eyeing us with curiosity, but without suspicion, would peck the crumbs that fell at our feet. By the time our meal was at an end and we had reembarked, the rain clouds were low on the mountains with their burden of unhid showers, and a stiffish breeze from the middle fired was chasing a squadron of white crest waves aslant the lake. But we got out of this disturbance in two smoother waters and steamed slowly along the western shore at the feet of the great forced last mountains and high in heaven we got a glimpse of one's no pit peak that rent the clouds asunder with startling suddenness and then vanished again beneath its sash and rapery. Mater, other peaks came out. If, in the breaking clouds, the majestic grandeur of the scene was slowly revealed. The walled summits closed in upon us as we went. The cold night air dissipated the swirling mists. The stars stole out one by one and the serrated edges of the mountains on either hand were silhouetted against the evening sky as our vessel puffed along. 
narrower and narrower became the lake and as we rounded the final turn the blackness of the water and the towering precipices ahead seemed to be luring us to destruction the captain and the engineer exchanged orders but there was no slackening of speed and just as the doctor who had been stationed in the bow as a lookout was straining his eyes in a hopeless effort to fathom the samoan darkness the vessel went full tilt on to the beach and we found ourselves suddenly at the end of our journey if, as the engineer remarked to the captain in a vevel of a place luckily no damage was done and we had only missed the proper lundinga shelving sandy beachy a few yards the men of our party scrambled out over the bow knee deep in the cold water the ladies were carried from the side and then swags and provisions were quickly transferred from the steamer and up a short butch path to the hut near by a roaring fire was soon blazing up the spacious log chimney and the expedition settled down to discuss the pannikins in of steaming hot tea and the liberal camp bill of fray that the self-accounted cook and doctor's wife and the potish spread on the rough bush table for our delectation illustration on lake tea anew the walk from milford sound has been described as the finest walk in the world if, although this is an exaggeration it has sufficient of beauty and grandeur and variety to make it world famous but it has been so much described that it were futile for my poor pen to add anything here except perhaps to say a word or two about the views from and about the pass which is named after my old friend and fellow players quentin mckinnon whose body these many years now has lain at the bottom of the deep cold lake that he loved so well one of the lonely list spots on the journey is lake mintero at the eastern foot of the pass the lake itself reflects the surroundings and the few widow wolf on its waters look at themselves as in a mirror this one on still street mary's lake floats double spin in shadow with the dying day the gloom of the narrow valley deepened the glow of sunset fell for a few moments on the mountains down the valley and the terracier of the dark beech trees stood boldly out against the gold the trumpet note of the paradise ducks which are not ducks but geese a sound from the lake and the plaintive cry of the war did cry free clear said knots in a minor key came from the hillside in the dying day the trees were gray with clinging mosses mount hart towered on the left and across the lake the grim precipices of mount balloon inaccessible from this side rose in wild grandeur four thousands of feet a solid wall of black granite seamed with snow while just overhead on the left the enormous buttresses of the mountain range in places overhung and seemed ready at any moment to topple over and compass our destruction the valley is narrow and gloomy and almost completely shut in from the late autumn sun so that as the evening wanes one is glad to seek the shelter of the hut and to pile on the bicarty logs till a great sparking fire goes roaring up the capacious chimney late in the season as it was we only gained the summit of the pass after a weary trudge through snow our reward was the view one has seen nobler mountains greater glaciers and more beautiful snowfields but the wild and rugged grandeur of the surrounding country cannot fail to leave a lasting impression the blackness of the mountain walls the narrowness of the valleys if, above all the nearness of the views charmed and surprised us in the valley up which we had journeyed the mountain ranges rose above the mists deep down below us was lake mintero with the lonely hut turning to the right we saw the long ridge of mount hart leading to a fine rock peak if beyond it behind mount sutherland the glacier that feeds the sutherland falls gleaming in the morning sun down the arfer valley range after range streaked with snow rose clear-cut against a blue sky moging near the horizon into pale green while white opposite the pasty grandest and most striking sight of all was mount elliot with the pretty little jervos glacier stretching between its twin peaks the sun just tipped a patch of snow on the left of either peak while the glacier itself and the stupendous black precipices flanking roaring creek were in shadow 
two streams of frozen snow clung to the rocks below the higher end of the glacier f still farther round a peculiar cleft in the rock ran down slantwise from near the summit to the shoulder of the mountain for fully a thousand feet occasionally a block of ice fell from the edge of the glacier or a rock avalanche rattled down sheer into the valley thousands of feet below mount balloon rose on the right above in point of grandeur and beauty it was not to be compared with mount elliot the dark precipices of which stood out in vivid contrast against the foreground of snow which the saddle this day afforded the fine crags of mount balloon frowned defiantly down upon me so fife and i leaving our burdens on the pass went off to test them from a climber's point of view we went straight at the precipices that rise above the pass picked steps up a short snow color and then zigzagged up the rocks climbing towards what appeared to be anorite running down into the valley at the head of roaring creek we got on very well for a while but the sun began to work round on to our side of the mountain F melting the snow made the rocks slippery and the vegetation in the crevices and on the ledges dripping wet so that we had to exercise more than usual pair the heat of the sun moreover began to loosen the frozen snow on the ledges of a wall of rock that towered above us for nearly a thousand feet and masses came crashing down in in pleasant proximity in nearly every case however the falling pieces became so disintegrated through coming from such a great height that there seemed little danger and we proceeded the climbing was unlike anything we had previously experienced and we went at it independently trying the rocks in different directions fife almost got blocked on a difficult bit of the cliff near the head of the couloir and had to leave his axe behind the couloir narrowed as we proceeded furtively glancing up every now and then at the chunks of frozen snow that came whizzing down from the heights above some of the chips occasionally struck us and the fusillade was becoming just a little unpleasant when suddenly there was a louder crash above and we saw descending from a great height a larger mass than any that had preceded it we instinctively ducked our heads into the snow as the falling mass struck the edge of the cool or above us a little to the right and came swishing down the slope in a thousand pieces this was hardly gov enough so recognizing that discretion was the better part of the loo we turned and beat a precipitate retreat with the rocks free from snow these crags would however make quite a fine climb but now it was quite clear the mountain was not in a condition to be trifled with we had further evidence of this a few minutes later for as we were glistening down the color a chip of rock came whizzing past us too close to be pleasant faf went dane first and was skirting the base of the first great precipice that rises from the saddle on the milford side when there was a crash above i yelled to him to look out but he had seen the rock coming and in a moment had ducked his head down and his heels up the slope so that if the rock did strike him it would not be in a vulnerable part to nay looking down from a height of two hundred or three hundred feet the attitude he presented was most comical and although i could not but recognize the danger and admire his quickness and presence of mind i could not at the same time refrain from laughter the rock fell within half a dozen yards of him and buried itself in the snow mater my brother kenneth and i made two efforts to ascend the peak as we had discovered a route from the head of the valley on the milford sound side leading to an easier that led right on to the summit but each attempt was nipped in the bud by bad weather one afternoon in company with mr so a member of our party we left the beach huts at sutherland falls and climbed to a bivouac near the pass feeling confident that on the morrow the peak would be ours we found an ideal place for a camp a small stream trickled through the bush near at hand lower down we could hear the ceaseless murmur of the waters of roaring creek and over the treetops immediately below us we got a glimpse of the frowning precipices of mount elliot kenneth lit a great camp viper right on the path and while i built a perude platform of branches and twigs 
Zeal busied himself cutting the fronds of Tudia Superb and other ferns, so that we should have an easy couch. It was dark before we finished, but we continued our operations by the aid of the firelight, and at seven, Tudy P. M., we crawled into our sleeping bags for the night. The cries of the Kiwi and Kakapo sounded close by. The fire crackled on the path near at hand, while above the monotonous lullaby of Roaring Creek and all the other noises came. Every now and then, the roar of an avalanche from the Jervos Glacier just across the valley, to Kakapo's, half flying, half running, rushed past us through the butch, and the shrill whistle of a weck on the slopes above was answered by the quack, quack, quack of a blue mountain duck in the creek below. Then a whine began to sigh ominously in the trees, and a falling barometer warned us of further defeat. But our bed was a comfortable one, and the old campaigners, at all events, were soon in the land of dreams. Towards morning we were awakened by our friends the Kakapos, who in their frolics seemed to forget the respect due to the featherless backs, and scampered right over our heads, putting out my hen half an hour or so later. I felt a gentle rain falling, and there was a small pool of water in the folds of Zeal's sleeping bag. The weather had again broken, and there was nothing for it but to return to the huts and try another time. The mist was thick in the valley and all the mountains were blotted out, but the booming of the avalanches indicated clearly that the Jervos glacier was still alive and kicking. We waited an hour after daylight, and then squirming out of our sleeping bags, made a hurried breakfast and marched off in single file down to the beach huts. On arrival there we found that Fife and Hodgkins had started down the Milford Sound track to see if they might by any chance fall in with the government road-making party, who we knew must be camped not many miles away. Hodgkins returned in the afternoon with the intelligence that a party of fourteen men were camped about a mile and a half down the valley, that they had almost run short of provisions, and had been for some weeks without news of the outside world. As the day wore on, the rain came down heavier and heavier, and by nighttime we fully realized that the climate on the western side of the divide could be damned moist and unpleasant when it chose. Our supply of bread now ran out, but luckily we had taken some flour over the pass and my wife was kept busy baking scones to supply the wants of six hungry men with fully developed appetites. It was rather interesting to watch the evolution of the methods of camp cookery, but let us hear the cook herself on so important a matter. It was with some trepidation. She says that I decided that afternoon to bake bread. At home, I am considered a good cook, even by those who suffer under my experiments, but here things were different. The commissariat department included self-raising flour. One is fairly sure of a success with that, and I was fortunate enough in the first hut to find it in basin to mix my dough in. My husband had, before starting, objected, on the score of weight, to the handle of the common domestic frythinkin that figured among our utensils. It was decided to break it off and put two light curved wire handles across, to make it still lighter. Only one of these handles was brought, and the consequence was that the pan, if any one winked or coughed, ticked up suddenly. My doll looked beautifully light as I patted it gently into the hanging pan. Stockers there were in plenty, and I felt sure of success as I saw the cream-white bubbles rise on the surface. Two of the party were building castles in the air, sitting on the bench in front of the fire, gloating over the idea of fresh bannocks for their tea. For but one moment, her hapless moment, he left my scone to wash the basin at the door. One short step away from the hearth, when I returned, the panhead ignominicium ejected its contents into the very middle of the fire, and then had righted itself again. I demanded of the two who still sat gloomily gazing. Why was this thus? But they told me they thought I was running the sure. Four words to that effect. The three of us set disconsolity to work with spoons to fish up some of the dough. I deposited a spoonful or two of it in the fry finken, where it burnt, 
and smelt so strong that another member of the party came rushing in with his appetite in full play. Well, he said cheerily, how did yours con turn out? I stared solemnly, spoon in hand, and told him that it had turned out all right, but not in the manner expected, however. They let me down lightly over this first fox pause in camp cookery, and I hid the charred remnants with the meetings where the rats ran right behind the hut. If, no doubt, made short work of them. It was always interesting on arrival at a hut to inspect the kitchen utensils. As a rule, it did not take long. We left the hapless Freifinkin behind in one hut, hoping to find in another a substitute. I pounced eagerly upon three small cake tines, and determined to utilize them. They did very well, though of rather thin metal. An enamel plate I also used returned, I regret to say, from the furnace minus the enamel. Of course, these were simply placed on the embers which had constantly to be raked out from beneath the great mossy logs at the back of the fireplace. Now and again culinary operations had to be stopped, as the wooden chimney had a little habit of going on fire, but a man inside with one bucket of water, and another outside with a second bucket, soon extinguished the conflagration. We got quite used to it at last. It was terribly hot work raking out the embers and watching the bread, and I always got a volunteer for that. I sort of superintended. These scones were really very good, but the best plan was hit upon towards the end of our trip. One awesome night, dark as pith, when I lay awake in the hut and listened to the rain pouring and the rush of Roaring Creek as it carried its rains whirling waters into the Barfer River, my thoughts veered round to the perennial scone. The rats that night were holding high carnival, they had discovered some figs in my swag, among the bricabric in the men's hut, which was our kitchen, dinigrom, and drubrin men one. I had noticed a fryfinkin with a large hole in the bottom. This inverted over the baking tins, a piece of tin covering the hole, and then thickly covered with hot embers, would be a great improvement on our present method, and this also would save the trouble of turning. Next day, when tried, the plan proved a great success, and much less bother than the other way. La Nute Port Concealed. The French say, it was so in this case. We had heavy rain now, and on our journey down to the Sound had to wade nearly way step through strong running streams. We were hospitably received at the roadman's camp, albeit they were running short of provisions. At one time they had run out of tea, and had to be content with hot water, while now they had neither sugar, butter, nor jam, but were obliged to rest satisfied with dry bread and tinned meats. To add to their troubles, they had a cook who was no cook, and whose mental balance, never very well adjusted, had in these solitary places developed a decided kink. He eyed us with a weird look, half of suspicion and half curiosity, we had noted, in passing, near the cook-house, a crooked low partially hollowed out, and we now learnt that this was a primitive canoe which the cook in his spare moments was laboriously fashioning with the avowed object of making a voyage to the better land. It would have been a cranky craft in any case, if, had he trusted his body to it, there can be no doubt that his contemplated journey to the better land would have been somewhat shorter than he anticipated. However, instead of voyaging on the troubled waters of the Martha River, he wandered off at midnight down the track to Lake Ada. He returned next day, but went straight to his bed, and refused to cook any more. When asked what possessed him to make this midnight journey, he merely remarked that he had heard the Lord calling him. Some of the men wished he had gone in his canoe. Our journey down the valley after the heavy rains afforded us a wonderful sight. Dwarfa River, swollen to three times its normal size, roared over the rapids, and flowed swiftly along the more level reaches, while adown the granite walls of the splendid valley hundreds of waterfalls of great variety in height, in volume, and in beauty came madly rushing or softly falling as the case might be and upstream some, like a downward smoke, 
slobbering veils of thinnest lump. Dit do, and some fro wavering lights and shadows broke, rolling a slumbrous sheet of foam below, down the river in the boats that be found there, across Lake Ada with its sunken forest, and again on down the woodland track we rode and marched till we reached the lower boat landing. There we found a boat and a small flat betaft punt. We bailed them out and embarked four in the boat and three in the flat of four Milford Sound. The valley broadened out a little, and the rapids of the river had given place to quiet tidal reaches. We seemed to be floating down into fairyland over mountain tops that were mirrored beneath us. Kenneth, Fife, and I were in the flatty, and we had to bail for dear life. But often we would halt an hour work and gaze admiringly upon the beautiful scenes that a bountiful creator had spread about us with such lavish hand. No wine stirred the waters, and no sound vexed the hutch tear save the plash of our oars in this which from the bailers can. It all seemed in real a pleasant dreamland, a land in which it seemed always afternoon. We saw the gleaming river seaward flow from the inner land, far off, three mountain tops, three silent pinnacles of aged snow, stood sunset flushed, eth, dewed with showery drops, up clomb the shadowy pine above the warven copse. Suddenly the curving foam of the Bowen Falls flashed into sight, and an involuntary shout of delight and admiration arose from both boats. Then, rounding the last promontory, we came from the dark mountain shadows of the narrow valley into the gleaming sunshine of the open sound. The stay of a few days in Milford Sound was greatly enjoyed by the non-climbing members of the party. My wife writes of it. The exquisite weather tore Indian summer days magnificent surroundings. The genial hospitality of Mr. and Mrs. Sutherland, and the feeling that there was no need to be up and doing, all increased the lazy enjoyment of those halcyon days. Perhaps even the knowledge that our comrades, while we basked in the sunshine or rode on the calm water, were tolling through the matted butch, or cutting their way up their mountain, also added a sharper relish to our pleasure. Many a time our thoughts of them were tinged with anxiety, and we followed their course in imagination. From the hour we came in sight of Sutherland's, lying in the afternoon sunshine of that perfect day, with the white curving flash of the bow and fall on our left, and the great mountains far above, to the morning when, with many a wistful backward glance, we left it, silent and seemingly tenantless. We had ideal weather. After the excitement and bustle of starting the climbers were over, and after the return of Mr. Fife, who had to be put under medical treatment for Narodlia, we decided to go fishing. It was most exciting. The boat, to begin with, was Mickey, and I was very thankful that I had no skirts to get draggled and dirty. One had to keep bailing half the time, and another rowing to keep the boat in position. As there were only two of us in our boat, our fishing was spasmodic. But in Mr. Fike's case successful, he stood with quite a professional air in the stern of the boat, and caught four or five fizz home blow cod, and two or three of a large frill-backed pen called turaki, which objected extremely to have the hook taken out of their mouths, and flopped most alarmingly about my ankles. Some little red fish, cold soldiers, were not considered worth catching at Milford, where so many finer varieties may be cooked. In other places they are thought very good. The water seemed teeming with fish. The line was scarcely out before there came a tug, and occasionally some of our party caught two at once. As the afternoon wore on, a tiny breeze ruffled the surface of the sound, and it began to feel chilly. The sun had set, and the silvery pallor of the mist reef across the line, veiling its precipices, was changed to rose. From the water's edge towered the great mountains, gloomy in shadow, but above. The higher peaks were still glorious in the sunlight and glowed with living gold. When we got back to the roaring fire and comfortable tea misses, Sutherland had provided. We did full justice to both. It was the first time I had tasted cutlets or stewed caca, and both were very good. 
and then after we gathered round the blazing logs and told stories and listened to mr sutherland's yarns amid the calling smoke of the evening pipes he told us among many other things that there were in the sound fish he called grampressive in sea sounds more coraptaff when at play jumped out of the water twenty feet sometimes turning a somersault in the air he said they were often twelve feet long a recent visitor to milford city had said mr sutherland's yarns were on a par with the seni rachel and we metaphorically of course winked at one another as he volunteered this statement time proved it to be quite correct however next morning the three men of our party started off to try to climb the mitri and left me to my own devices it had been dark a long time and there were no signs of their return i was feeling a little anxious as they had to row five miles in the leaky boat at eight o'clock mrs sutherland and i went out and listened for the plash of their roars for that on a still night in the sound can be heard over a mile away the moon was up and making a silver glory of the water the muffled drawer of the hidden bow and fall came to us across the little inlet in front towered the mitri grander yet in the misty moonlight suddenly across the silence of the sound came a cheer and some nondescript noses afterwards explained to be singing and in a little while we welcomed the wanderers back they were exultant for they had filled their boat with fish and excited for they had been chased four miles by grampuses quite twelve feet long and that jumped at least twenty feet out of the water just alongside our boat to judge from the slightly incoherent accounts these monsters must have chosen this fine moonlight night for a game of leapfrog and have wanted an audience fortunately the they dived underneath and jumped quite close to the oars they never touched the boat but evidently the minds of the gallant crew were not free from apprehension the next day mr sutherland showed us these same fish spouting five miles away near the sterling falls chapters ev and key will and continued my summit calls its floors are shod with rainbows laughing up to god let a the jagged ways and bleak that give upon that lonely key robert haven schoffler the time had now arrived for us on this journey to do a little climbing and some real exploration so one morning only in may and much too late in the season fife hodgkins kenneth and i started off up the kledai river with the object of making a first descent of tutoko the highest mountain in fireland the guide who convoys tourists over a land to milford from tea and new and vice versa accompanied us so far as we could ascertain from him and from sutherland who had resided in these parts for about twenty five years no one had explored the headwaters of this branch of the kledau and the ascent to titoko had never even been attempted we had three days in which to accomplish our undertaking and as we were promised some rough travelling through the forest and over the river boulders besides which there was the prospect of a difficult climb we decided to push on with all haste our plan was to establish a camp as far up the valley as we could the first day climb the mountain on the second day and on the day following return to the sound we started at eight it, M, tracking through the bush behind Sutherlands, and then skirting the right bank of the Kledau. There, a broad walling stream. We followed an old, disused bus track cut by Sutherland some years previously, and then emerged on to a comparatively open piece of flat, with only a clump of trees here and there in the middle. Fife, who was still suffering terribly from Rodliac, could bravely as he bore the pain proceed no farther if greatly to our regret and his own disappointment he had to return to the sand we carried in addition to a tent our sleeping bags a camera the ass cases and alpine rope and provisions to last us for days we were not likely to starve whatever happened as the valley abounded in game and we had with us two dobstums belonging to sutherland and rover belonging to the guide 
Rover went about his work quietly, and in spite of our admonitions was continually bringing us cacapos he had killed. Cubs, on the other hand, rolled at large through the bush making a great noise but killing nothing for full on one occasion he very nearly succeeded in killing himself. But more of that later. Proceeding for a mile or so over comparatively open ground, we were able to obtain a good view of our surroundings. Barren peaked. The end of the barren range rose abruptly on our left. Mount Moriton towered massively in front, and on its right, up the left hand branch of the Cled Elk. We saw the mountains where it is supposed that young Quill lost his life in the attempt to discover a pass from Wakatapia to Milford Sound. His footprints were found on the brink of a precipice overlooking the left hand branch of the Cledar River. F. Subsequently, his brothers, making search in the valley on the milford side found a portion of a skull which may or may not have been his some two and a half miles from the sound the river forks turning abruptly to the left we reentered the forest and then followed for a few miles the north branch of the river now for seven or eight miles a foaming torrent swollen with the rains and hurrying seaward over its boulder trin's granite bed. We struggled over and around these great slippery boulders, in some places balancing ourselves with difficulty, another slipping knee deep into pools of ice cold water. Then, by way of variation, we would march back into the forest. On either side, the trees came down to the water's edge. The butch was wet and gloomy and occasionally we sank to the knee in springing moss and decaying leaves. The trees were covered with moss and lichen. No sunshine penetrated. F. What with the gloom and the smell of rotting vegetation. A depressing influence is apt to steal over the stranger and used to such solitudes. All the time we heard the muffled roar of the river on our right, varied at intervals by the piercing scream of some caca, hidden in the higher branches of the tall beech trees. Occasionally there was a loud barking from a distance. This was from Tubbs, who was assisting at the death of some poor Kakapo. Tubbs did the barking, but Rover did the killing, and presently would turn up smiling, and looking very pleased with himself, because he had a full-sized Kakapo in his mouth. Some of these birds were very fine specimens, and one old fellow, with bristling whiskers and dilapidated wings, we judged to be the patriarch of all Kakapa land. A number of streams that came down through the bush from the mountains on the left had cut deep channels for themselves. If swabladen as we were, we did not at all enjoy clambering down one steep bank and up the other. After a time we would get tired of this bush traveling. If, for the sake of variation, take to the boulders again. The nails in our boots could get no grip on the smooth wet granite and it was sometimes entertaining to the last man to watch the peculiar gymnastic progression of those in frontal betty. If he let his eyes wander from the rock on which he was treading, he was soon, himself, providing a more entertaining exhibition. Our remarks were not frequent, but, as they might say in the parish of Drumcher, a few purple adjectives were I slip a newt. From the forest we could see nothing of the surrounding country, from the bed of the stream the view was superb. The colored granite boulders, with the foaming river struggling over and around them, made a striking foreground. The graceful beech trees in exquisite middle distance, and the massive scone-lied mountains, towering high above a noble background, we waited three years of an hour for lunch and then journeyed on. As before, sometimes keeping in the river bed, at other times scrambling through the forest, near the head of the valley we came upon some open country, and obtained a good view of the mountains ahead, and of the ranges on to their side. The mountains swept round the head of the valley in a grand amphitheatre. Straight ahead was a long, snow-filed couloir leading to a narrow col, on the right of which rose, abruptly, the serrated edge of a peak that held on its shoulder an ice field of considerable extent. Then came another mass of rock, 
shelving gradually towards a larger glacier that occupied the heights to the north and flowed low down into the valley from the middle of this field of ice there rose a huge gendarme or tower of rockle and mark four miles around on our right another narrow valley began to open out a waterfall fell over a precipice opposite if a mile and a half distant we could see a glacier leading up to the foot of a high peak with a beautifully rounded dome of snow close to it on the right this peak we took to be mount tutoko nine thousand forty feet in height though it was impossible to tell which was the higher of the two mountains and only one was marked on the map we judged that the right hand one was the higher as it stood further back and carried the greater glacier and so we made up our minds to attack it on the morrow a critical glance at the lower portion of the glacier revealed seracs and crevices and it seemed as if we should have a fairly long climb we had now to wade through the river which we did with some difficulty then crossing the flat we followed the bed of a mountain torrent that came from the ice field which we named the age glacier we were less than a mile from the ice but it took us a good hour fired as when hour to accomplish that distance the bed of the stream got rougher and rougher as we proceeded and at last we were forced to the butch through which the leader proceeded bill hook in hand slashing every few steps at some sapling or branch that barred the way it seemed strange to be carrying s cases in such a place the last bit of the journey was over an old moraine covered with dense forest at length shortly after sunset we emerged from the butch f with a sigh of relief threw off our swags for our day's work was happily at an end while two of us went on to reconnoiter the lower part of the route the other two pitched the tent and boiled the billy after supper we partially dried our wet clothing and then turned into our sleeping bags for the night we were too tired to talk but i listened for a time to the crackling of the campfire the murmur of the stream and the strange cries of the night birds that were now wandering through the forest in search of food kiwis and kakapos appeared to be about us in plenty but more especially the latter the kakapo breeds every second year three or four young ones being found in each nest but the kiwi lays only one egg as if to compensate for this difference the little kiwi is a very independent fellow while master kakapo on the other hand requires a considerable amount of attention before he can shift for himself the kiwi is out of the nest almost as soon as he is out of his shell there are four species of kiwi but so far as i know not only one kind of kakapo both birds are easily tamed and make interesting pets the kakapo in particular being a very affectionate fellow a professor friend of mine when he lived in a hut on the wild west coast in the days before he was a professored one that became very much attached to him they are practically blind in the daytime if on our return we got one on the track in the clinton valley he was staggering about and bumping up against the trees just as if he had been out all night and was coming home with the milk lying in my sleeping bag there i could hear also the strange whistle of the weka that other curious flightless bird with his strange feathers his long beak and his rudimentary wings he is distributed over a very wide area in new zealand and is so fearless a bird that he will come right into your tent and even eat out of your hand he is however an inveterate thief and particularly fond of walking off with any little bright thing that you may happen to leave lying about the camp he is very fat and doly under the skin and if by any chance you require to use him as food you must boil him before you grill him he has however such a friendly confidential inquisitive way with him that you would never dream of killing him unless you were hard put to it in the matter of provisions he is not found in large numbers about milford signed perhaps the climate is too damp for him one of the handsomest birds found in the sounds and on the southern lakes is the crested grebe which builds its nest under scrub or overhanging bushes near the water's edge 
These beautiful birds are much rarer than either the kakapo or the kiwi. The key in some localities so destructive of sheep is also to be met within the alpine parts of Fireland, but in these localities he knows nothing of sheep, and is still a vegetarian. He comes into this story elsewhere. F. Of all the New Zealand verbs, he is the one that is most fascinating to the mountaineer. Duck of various species are met with, the most interesting being the blue mountain duck, who has a peculiar whistling note and who seems almost to have lost the use of his wings. Other interesting birds frequently met with an hour journey with a cockatree parrot, the wood pigeon, the New Zealand thrush, and the Warren Altult crow, the Notornis Montelli, of which there are only four specimens in existence, once inhabited this region, but is now, to all intents and purposes, extinct. No specimen has ever been taken alive, the last one found was killed by a guide's dog in the vicinity of Lake Tianu, and was sold to the Dunedin Museum for quite a large sum. A good specimen would now fetch as much as five hundred pounds. As a matter of fact, an agent, acting for Lord Rothschild, wanted to buy the last one found, and offered a sum considerably larger than was offered by the New Zealand authorities. But the fide being a patriotic New Zealander, accepted a much smaller sum rather than let the specimen go out of the country. It is just possible that a very few more specimens of this handsome bird may be found in the unexplored wilds of Fireland, but there cannot be very many more left. The gigantic moor, which once wandered over the upland plains of Lakeland, is, of a surety, extinct. If one specimen could be found, it would be a prize indeed. At present the birds of Fireland have few, if any, natural enemies, and none of the commoner kinds are likely to become extinct for years to come, unless through the ravages of ferrets, sates, weasels, and cats that have been introduced into the neighboring country with a view to keeping down the rabbits on the sheep runs a kind of acclimatization that is almost criminal. But in following the birds I have wandered off the track, so, but let us return to our mountain. Next morning the old familiar clink of the ice cases on the rocks of the moraine sent a thrill of pleasure through us, while a sniff of the keen mountain air, and the prospect of a stiff climb, cheered us onward, as, leaving behind the depressing gloom of the dark, trackless forest, we resolutely strode forward to attack our peak, we could not help remarking on the purity of the glacier, and the almost complete absence of moraine, owing, no doubt, to the hardness of the granite rock of which the mountains in this region are composed. In similar situations in the vicinity of Mount Cook there would be long slopes of scree on the mountain sides, and the snout of the glacier would be buried under a moronic accumulation. Here the clear ice flowed, unencumbered, to the terminal face. As we climbed the rocky buttresses above our camp, we observed on this glacier roof which we were the discoverse of a fine mass of cerakice from which blocks came crashing down on to the lower part of the glacier. A great deal of this broken ice had fallen at one time or another. If, while we were scrutinizing the glacier for a safer route, a splendid avalanche thundered down. The glacier was steep, and the ice hard, so that there would have been much arduous stepped up by that route. Even if we could have avoided the ice fall, we therefore kept to the rocks and made our way upwards, sipsegging by ledges through a series of precipices. Illustration Homeward bound, on leaving the old lateral moraine, we crossed a stream that issued from an enormous cleft in the granite. We then commenced the ascent proper, the rock, except where it was absolutely precipitous or actually overhung, was clothed with a slippery grass, alternating with alpine plants and shrubs. If, though this vegetation seemed to give good hold, well, not being used to it, did not care to trust it too much, so that at first our motto was slow but sure, one or two vertical bits of rock gave us some little trouble at the start, and the dogs soon had to give the ascent best, the irrepressible tubs had a narrow escape here, 
tumbling over backwards, but managing to pull himself up just in the nick of time on the verge of an awful precipice, this escaping certain and ignominious death, as it were, by the skin of his teeth. Argyme, at this point, apparently, thought discretion the better part of Valu, and returned to the camp. From an upper ledge we shouted instructions to him to have a soft bed and a good supper ready for us on our return, but not to be alarmed if we did not come back that day. For, if the peep were worth doing, and should prove difficult, we might spend the night out on the rocks. After some time we reached the crest of a ridge overlooking the icefall, and saw, stretching away before us, a beautiful snow slope that led, in gentle undulations, to the steeper ice slope that barred the way to the final peak. We progressed rapidly over this plateau, the snow being just soft enough to permit of our getting a good grip with the nails in our boots. The peculiarity of the glacier was its purity. Not a stone of any kind was to be seen on its surface. Our route now lay plainly before us. By making a slight detour we could easily avoid the bergschrins and crevices that extended from the ice fall almost to the head of the plateau. From that point there was the slope of frozen snow, up which we should have two cut steps to the final rocks. These rocks might afford us half an hour's scramble. And then, high pressed it Utoka would be conquered. Already we counted our victory won. We were confident of topping the peak by two p. M. At the latest, alas, we were never more mistaken in our lives. We stopped in the middle of the plateau for a morsel of lunch, and divested ourselves of our superfluous clothing, which, under such circumstances, is always a mistake, and for which we were heartily sorry afterwards. Close at hand on our right rose a splendid drop peak, with a steep snow cool or leading up to a shattered pinnacle the fretwork of some earthquake or the clouds paused to repose themselves in passing by. This we thought of attacking on our return. So confident were we of gaining an easy victory over Tutoko. The snow on the plateau was so hard, and the crevices and shrunds were so marked, that we never dreamt of putting on the rope till Kenneth, who was leading but a step or two up a short stoop, curving slope, and found himself on the edge of a yawning bergschrind. The mountaineering authorities define a bergschrind as a big crevice with its upper edge higher than its low edge. Here, however, was a shrund that, paradoxical as it may seem, had a curving lower lip that rose above its upper edge, and so it happened that as we were proceeding up the glacier we found ourselves on dangerous ground before we were aware of it. But the snow was so hard that even this thin overhanging lip would have held the whole party safely. We deemed it wise, however, at this stage, to put on the rope, and we bore away to the right to avoid other shrunds, eventually reaching the crest of the range and overlooking a pass that led down into the Holiford, here there were some most remarkable pinnacles of rock, and the radiation of the heat from one of the larger buttresses had melted the ice of the plateau, which stood back from it in a beautiful amphitheater some forty or fifty feet thick. This we named the Colosseum. The ice at the top was a pure white, but gradually merged into beautiful tints of bluish green lower down, where, owing to the greater pressure, it was more compact. The bold granite battlements, rising above the delicately tinted Colosseum ice, half in sunshine, half in shadow, and the broad expanse of the plateau combined to make as effective an alpine picture as could well be imagined. And we now longed for the camera which our tired shoulders had rebelled against carrying beyond the head of the valley. Cameras were heavy in those days. From the Colosseum to the final snow slope was but a few hundred yards and up to this point we were well satisfied with our progress. But, however, our troubles began. The need was so hard that every step had to be cut with the pick end of the axe. Midway up the slope was an overhanging wall of ice, and up to this we cut steps, only to find, when too late, that we could not surmount the obstacle. So we turned abruptly to the right and made a traverse to where the wall ran out, 
then we made a more difficult traverse back again above the wolf f ascending gradually after a good deal of left hand step tuft we gained the final rocks those to our dismay we found glaze with ice it was the penalty we paid for coming so late into these low latitudes at the point where we first gained the rocks they were so steep and so glazed with ice that it was practically impossible to get on to them there was nothing for it but to make a traverse along the slope for some distance in the hope of finding an easier place at which to attack them kenneth led round here the step tuft being arduous sometimes he was out of sight round a corner and while he was chipping away we held on with our axes and stood firmly in the steps till he called to us to move on a step or two the ice chips went switching down the slope over the ice wall and into a bergschrind at the top of the plateau occasionally we were able to hook the rope over a projecting knob of rock but for the most part the rocks afforded no hold Kenneth, however made the steps wide and deep if so long as we moved one at a time managed the rope skillfully and kept our heads half as cool as our feet were the danger was practically nil for everything above was frozen and there could be neither avalanche nor falling rock to fear still the situation was sufficiently exhilarating and hodgkins afterwards informed us that on mature reflection he had come to the conclusion that the pictures in the badminton book on mountaineering instead of being as he had at one time imagined greatly exaggerated were wonderfully true to nature with this sort of work higher after our slip by and still our peak looked down defiantly on us at length when we did get on to the rocks progress was slower than ever if eventually we had to turn back from the line of route we had selected and take to an ice field cool or that was both steep and slippery with smooth slabs of rock showing through in places just under the ice up this we slowly hacked our way and gained some broken rocks above where the climbing was still difficult and one place the rocks were perpendicular if owing to the ice and the nature of the rock the holds were few and far between the ice had to be chipped off the rocks and it rained down on the heads and hands of those below with rather unpleasant force till at length we reached the highest rocks and called a halt the views were splendid on the one hand was the valley of the holiford on the other that of the Cledalp. inland we looked over a wilderness of peaks rising near at hand in savage rendure and further away mingling and fading in the dim haze of distance but all the while the broad sun was sinking down in his tranquillity if as we had spent hours on those rocks and ice slopes where we only expected to spend minutes it behoved us to think of the descent there was a further pinnacle of the peak above us if all year in the season with the rocks in good condition we should have waltzed up it in quick time but now with the rocks in this frozen state it was clear that there would be step to fentage difficult step tuft at tattle the way and not only step tuft but then covering of the rock itself so that if we wished to get off the mountain in daylight it was already high time to think about the descent we took one last look around if then very slowly uncautiously with our faces to the mountain we climbed down the last man when opportunity offered hitching the rope around some pinnacle so that the others might descend more safely we had turned none too soon for just as we reached the foot of the rocks the sun in a blaze of golden glory pushed his rosy rim behind a bank of westering cloud and all the choicest and most delicate tints from nature's palette seemed blended in the evening sky above the faraway mountain tops some one has wisely said or written that if you must have a sunset in your book by all means have it but let it be a short one and in this case we must perforce follow such excellent advice for we had scarce time to notice detail though we could not help every now and then stealing a glance from our icy staircase to the glowing west beyond but there was no time to stack 
the keen air and the gathering gloom warned us to get off those steep and slippery ice slopes before dark but it would have been dangerous to hurry so down we went faces to the wall with no sound to break the silence save the clink 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 of our axes in the ice and an occasional admonition from kenneth to the plucky hodgkins to take the steps faster but kenneth's legs are long and hodgkins legs are short if as the steps had been made at intervals to suit the former it was not so easy for the latter to comply with the request still we made good progress considering the difficulties and at length emerged from the shadow of the peak into the moonlight which now gleamed on the final slope just above the plateau here we had adventures the temptation to indulge in a glissade was too strong to be resisted so unfastening myself from the rope i made a traverse across the slope so as to evade the bergshren below and started off on a standing glissade but the slope was steeper and the snow harder than i imagined if though i used my axe as a brake with all the skill i could i quickly lost control and went whirling down at an alarming speed away went my head and away went my axe but i just managed to keep my feet till with strange gyrations of arms and legs i landed breathless with excitement on the gentler slopes of the plateau three hundred or four hundred feet below others profiting by my experience came down more slowly trusting simply to the hold they obtained with their axes for we had made no steps here in going up all went well till kenneth suddenly found hodgkins whizzing past him down the slope in the direction of the bergshrind kenneth however was equal to the emergency for crick as pot he clutched the slack of the rope with one hand and dove his axe into the slope with the other bringing his companion up with a round turn a few feet below him once off these slopes the strain of the past few hours was at an end and we ran down the plateau in the moonlight to where we had left our coats in the morning here we hastily donned them and then continued our race across the plateau on the last snow slopes we had to slow down as the gradient was steeper and the snow was now frozen quite hard the ice fall was a glorious sight in the clear moonlight once off the snow it was not an easy matter to kick to our route if lower down in the shadow of the valley the difficulty was increased all things considered however we managed to hit off the route wonderfully well but at last in the darkness we were completely stuck up at a point not more than two thousand feet above our camp there was only one way by which we could descend but all our efforts to find the exact spot were unavailing i tried to the right in several places making an awkward traverse across a steep and slippery wall of granite if eventually on finding myself hanging over the face of an awesome precipice above the glacier i gave up the search on rejoining my companions we held a short council of war with the result that rather than risk an accident we decided to stand the night out on the mountain there was no shelter where we were nor any dry grass nor fern with which to make a comfortable bivouac but luckily the night was fine the temperature fell quickly and the provoking part of the situation was that only some two thousand feet below we could see the glimmer of our camp free so near and yet so far we shouted in jodel to our guide in hopes that he would he russ come up to the foot of the cliff and give us a clue to the route but all our shouting and jodeling were in vain the only answer was the rumble of an avalanche from the serex opposite and visions of the soft bed and the hot supper that we had been longing for quickly faded away we were none too warmly clad and we had but a limited stock of provisive small scones and the scrapings of a tin of jam which we now disposed of washing the crumbs down with a drink of icy cold water from a little pool in a rock close at hand the temperature continued to fall till by ten o'clock it was several degrees below frigisnating and the pool of water on the rock became a frozen mass 
we selected a spot where there was a comparatively flat rock about a dozen yards long, on which we might promenade at intervals to keep up the circulation. The stars shone in a wonderfully clear sky. Starbronze star until they seemed to melt or mingle into a pale glow in the realms of a limitable space. No one, says Stevenson, knows the stars who has not slept. As the French say, a la belle toiled. He may know all their names and distances and magnitudes, and yet be ignorant of what alone concerns Mankintry's serene and gladsome influence on the mind. There is a great deal of truth, though not, perhaps, the whole truth in this bit of Stevensation philosophy. But, at any rate, it is in such bivouacs as these that one realizes to the full the wondrous beauty of the southern constellations, not of the southern cross itself, which, one might almost say, is a feeble thing as compared with the regal radiance of those seven resplendent sons of the great bear that have scarce changed their positions since the days of Ptolemy two thousand years have a butt of the southern firmament as a whole i have heard englishmen profess their disappointment with their first view of the cross and its attendant constellations but let them sail to the far south or camp in late autumn in the high mountains or even go out on one of our clearer winter nights and they will begin to understand our pan one can easily comprehend their first disappointment for in the same way was I, though disappointed, when, sailing through tropic seas, I first saw the bear, F. also, Mater, in England, but soon it began to dawn upon me that neither the haze of smoky London nor the most summer air of southern England was the medium through which one should search for the beauty of the heavens. F. finally, one clear, dark night, and the Isle of Erin. I began to form a higher estimate of the beauty and magnitude of the northern constellation, a estimate that was more than justified, when, later in the year, after witnessing the most gorgeous sunset imaginable from the summit of a pass in the high Carpathians, I descended into the darksome valley, and saw the great bear, in all his glory, with his two pointers leading the eye on to the pole star, serene and immovable in his place in the northern spy. Nevertheless, I must still hold that our southern firmament bears the palm, and more especially that part of the milky wave in the north it is strewn with millions of bright stars, and that glows with the nebulous mingled haze of still more distant myriad suns. One begins then to realize that to other worlds that spin in space our world looks just a shining star. But, perhaps, I shall be told that one whose ignorance of astronomy is in inverse ratio to his knowledge of mountains cannot be trusted to make comparisons, and I quite agree that it is as futile to attempt comparisons between groups of stars as between groups of mountains, for each has a beauty and a grandeur that cannot be justly estimated the one against the other, if, moreover, no offer, however obscure can afford to have a charge of parochialism leveled at his head in regard to the firmament. Though, mind you, there are people quite ready to take up this attitude, as I myself know, for I once heard a young lady clinch an argument with an acquaintance about the relative beauties of their cities, with this triumphant assertion, tacked on to an Edmayanello. Your harbor may be beautiful, but... You should see the moon we have in Auckland, but I have been drawn by this dissertation on the stars. From the matter in hand, we certainly had full opportunity of studying the beauty of the southern stars that night. A cold wind began to sigh through the rocks, and it was not long before we commenced to tramp resolutely up and down our rocky platform, marking time to a song sunk, or a tune whistled. This got somewhat monotonous after about half an hour for a change we lay down in the lee of some detached rocks near our platform and tried to sleep but granite rock is not exactly a feather mattress and the milky way makes rather a cool counterpane so it was not long before we had resumed our platform march then we coiled up once more in the shelter of the rocks at first it was one man one rock but experience which teaches many things 
subsequently taught us that three men one rock resulted in a greater conservation of bodily warmth albeit the outside man got somewhat the worst of the bargain and was always the first to resume the march however we were sufficiently magnanimous to take turn about on the outside and in this way we did fairly well and some of us even managed to sleep we spent the night in halfers under the rock trying to sleep and hafters paramagliding the narrow platform singing psalms telling stories making speeches and trying to get warm again but the hours passed so slowly that after a time we were afraid to look at our watches for once we thought an autumn night in necessarily long if truth to tell we would willingly have exchanged all the glories of the southern cross for a hot supper our warm sleeping bags and a glowing campfire i tried to console myself with the fact that this cold autumn bivouac was better than our midsummer one on orangi on that terrible night when the snow drifting higher and higher every hour threatened to overwhelm us when the lightning played around us and the incessant thunder shook the tottering ridge we had endured all that with a marked aptly in philosophy and some pretense of jollity so that now when the elements were propitious we were not so much inclined to grumble but rather cheered ourselves with the thought that when morning dawned one should have gained a new experience and so we talked and joked and sank and had any one chance that way an hour after midnight he would have been amused and mayhap astonished to see free nodding and shivering mountaineers with hands deep in pockets and hats tied down over ears solemnly marking time on the rock to the strains of a weird melody from Pennet's repertoire but notwithstanding all our inventions the night seemed long some cola wine which we doled out at intervals in small doses kept away hunger and we imagined had a sustaining effect if somehow the hours did pass the stars began to lose their luster and fade slowly away till only one dim twinkling orb was left in east and west recount a breath mixed their dim lights twixt life and death to broaden into boundless day with the first streak of dawn i set about the putting on of my boots which i had discarded during the night for tennis shoes but i now found them hard frozen however by sitting on them one at a time for ten or fifteen minutes i thawed them out sufficiently to permit of my getting my feet into them with the daylight we saw our route clearly and out at fifty yards from where we had spent the night we were not long in hurrying down to the tent once again beside the cheery camp fire we felt happy and not one jot the worse for our strange experience and our five and wetnity hours on the mountain though inclined to agree with one of crockett's characters that a reeking dish of porridge is the delegates watts of scenery to a famished man after breakfast we lost little time in packing up and then we marched back down the valley through the forest primeval to milford signed from there we commenced the long trudge back over the pass and down the clinton valley to lake t and new the weather which had been remarkably fine for the past three or four days showed signs of breaking and by the time we had crossed lake ada we saw we were in for a drenching we had very hard work getting the big boat back up the arthur river to the upper landing and at several places in the rapids the four rowers had to get out and push waste dipped in water once or twice we thought we should have to abandon our task altogether but eventually perseverance and determination won the day a gentle rain had begun to fall so we hurried on to the beach huts where we arrived in a rather most condition early in the afternoon next morning we again shouldered the inexorable swag and started off up the pass before we quitted the huts we had a cleaning walk and left the place in as orderly a condition as we could it was raining heavily as we commenced to climb the steep incline into the bush of asli and hopelessly and not even the mark taply of our party could prophesy a change for the better the mountains had shrouded themselves and the waterfalls were riotous but above us in the branches of the trees undeterred by rain or storm the birds sang cheerily and now and again a cock hoppo blundered across the track blinded by the daylight 
Before we had gone far we were soaked to the skin, and the track was naturally heavier and more difficult to climb. Soon we got out of the forest into the low scrub. Then came the steep pull up the Tososki slopes, down which, ten days before, some of us had attempted to glissade. Now there was no remnant of the snow that then lay so thickly on the pass, but the foot sank deep in the marshy ground, and numberless little nosy streams bore witness to the heavy rains and melting snow. On the top of the pass a strong wind was blowing, ruffling the sullenly gray surface of the tarns, and whistling through the tussocks. Near the cairn built there we went to the edge of the great wall of granite which falls sheer to the valley below. Far down lay the Mentero Lake and hut, mere specks in the misty distance. The mountains in front of us loomed up through the mist, that, lifting a little, gave us a glimpse of the spun silver of a waterfall or the rugged grandeur of a granite peak. But there was still some distance to go before we reached our little haven, and on we trudged, serenely conscious that by this time it was quite impossible to get any wetter. A little care was necessary in the descent, but soon the Clinton River was waded, and the Mintero hut reached. There, before a blazing fire, a council of war was held as to the advisability of going on further that day. It was urged that the next hut was more comfortable and drier, and could easily be reached by dusk. So, after some hot tea, we took up our swags and plodded on down the Clinton Valley, now a wonderful sight with countless waterfalls streaming over the dark rocks, wet and a little tired with the heavy walking. We reached the halfway hut at six feet. M. There is a delicious feeling of virtuous well by when a fur to weary tramp turfs are changed. F. Pannikins in hand all gather round the huge log fire that prattles so cheerily up the great wooden chimney note even be it the finest peep of enriched with the thickest of cream and sipped from the daintiest dresden since like billy tea we had quite a festive appearance as we sat round the fire that evening one man especially who sported a white sweater gave a gal near to the proceedings and my wife spink hound out dressing again was at any rate a piquant contrast to her business suit in which she had climbed the pass, waded the swollen streams, and cheerily held her own in the long day's march. Tea over and the dishes washed all we had hit upon the idea of this being taken in alphabetical order for of us settled down to west. The others read, smoked, talked, or lounged in their bunks, for the lay bower was all but over. Tomorrow was a mere afternoon stroll. To a certain extent our ambitions had been realized, and our expectations fulfilled, and though the rain continued and the jealous mists still hid everything up and down the valley from us, we were happy. Hot cocoa and then only to bed was voted the correct thing. Anal slept soundly that night. In the morning the rain was still steadily falling, and there was little hope of its clearing. We waited two or three hours and then started forty anew. On the way down I stopped to take a photograph of Quentin Mackinnon's hut. Standing lonely and tenantless amid the tall beech trees on the picturesque quanks of the Clinton River, as we neared the lake we heard the steamers whistle leckering up amongst the mountain heights, and a few minutes later, with a fervent thank heaven we slung our swags on the floor of the hut at the head of Lake T anew. This being our last night in the wilds, for tomorrow we should be, winds and waters concurring, in the comfortable hotel at the foot of the lake. We resolved to have a constrata smoking concert, after a substantial tea, and the usual whist contest. Seats were taken on the bunks, the table, and a bench, which had an amusing habitum shipping, at least, to the onosorf tipping up suddenly unless it were evenly balanced. Every one had to sing no excuse being taken. Medical certificates, physical disabilities, were of no avail. Each was to give one verse, to which was to be a panbidi the whole company the aprousing refrain of rule Brit any one could scarcely imagine a more admissical set than we were, taken as a whole. But every one did his best. One warbled of ditty in a voice that was perhaps tremulous with emotion. 
and a furfural at Im Corner, where he blutched on seeing a sailor's song, while the last man, when it came to his turn, made a hasty retreat to the door, only to be brought back forcibly by his coat-tails. When he again took his seat, he brought down the house by a spirited rendering of the man who broke the bank at Monte Carlo, displaying a talent which none of us had ever given him the credit for possessing. An encore was insisted on, and by the time we had all sung again we were certain of at least one thing refrain of rule Britannia. The captain and the engineer, who were in the steamer, had been asked up to join in our convivitalize, but they did not put in an appearance. Away down in the dim shadows one could now and then catch the notes of the latter's flute, and I have no doubt they could hear something of our so-called musical attempts. To finish up our concert, Kenneth was called upon for the wild colonial boy, as sung by him on Mount Tuturco. I can see him now, his handsome bronzed face and dark eyes lit up by the firelight, waving his pipe backwards and forwards in time to the tune, and singing the lawless ditty with the greatest vigour, while all of us, in a delightfully promiscuous way, shouted the refrain well gallopori on mountains, and romori on plains, and scorned to die in slavery, bound down in iron chains. It was a song, with endless verses, of the old bush ranging days in Australia. The exploits of the gang were belauded, and they themselves were made out to be great heroes. Whereas, as a matter of law and justice, they should all have been hanged, however, this perversion of sentiment did not detract from the merits of the song as a song, and so we all vigorously demanded an encore, which was promptly given. Some one says that there was a certain pain always in doing anything for the last time, and certainly as we said good night on the sour last day in the Clinton Valley, most of us must have wished ourselves able to put time's die hand back. The merry evening in that hut will be among our many pleasant memories of the trip a trip in which one and all worked heartily, often in the face of impediments and dangers, from the beginning to the end. Fife and Kenneth had labored under difficulties, the former suffering terribly from Rajlia, and the latter having, from the second day out, a hilan which there was a section of raw flesh the size of a chushling piece. How he managed to climb at all under such circumstances was often a puzzle to me. Hodgkins, who was comparatively new to such rough work, did remarkably well. While the good at heart zeal was invaluable in camp, my brother John surprised us with the cool manner in which he threw another man's camera in addition to his own heavy swag over his shoulders, lit his pack, and strolled without apparent effort, smoking all the time to the top of the pass. And last, but not least, my wife was all times, I think, the cheeriest and the pluckiest of the party. Next morning there was a big flood in the Clinton, and the river had overflowed its bounds to such an extent that it was no easy matter getting to the steamer. The men waded out with the swags and cameras and afterwards pushed a boat up the edge of the stream for my wife and me. Into this we got and once fairly out in the current we were shot down like a cork into the quieter and safer waters of the lake. And now shall I attempt to describe our sail down the wonderful lake I am afraid I can do it but scant justice. There was no gale to vex the waters through which our little craft got her way. The rain had ceased, and the heavy pall of ash and grey was slowly but surely resolving itself into noble piles of cumuli. Peak after peak came out, here black with overhanging precipice, yonder, where less steep, snow flecting, and ever and then in the cloud masses that were slowly rent us under wood, more slowly still, with ever raging change, heal themselves up again and softly drape the beetling crags. Now a peak would be hidden completely. Then the clouds would break, revealing with startling suddenness some rocky pinnacle high in heaven. Further down the sun came out, and the mists forded themselves in bands athwart the lower hills. The high mountains at the head of the lake slowly recede. On our right a purple cone flecked with new snow rises above the mists and then is cloaked as with a thick veil. A black promontory, with trees arrayed a dead, 
clear cut against a bank of sunlit mist, juts out ahead, mists in high snow ped mountains on the right, trees in the lull and on the left, away up the north fired a patch of blue sky, and southward gleams of green, below us the dark waters of the great dake, and yonder, on Lone Island, standing out against the sombre trees, left by some long mid-led glacier, a granite herbilis Cominian's monument. Our journey is coming to an end, and in the gloom of this restful autumn evening a feeling in which there is it in up sadness steals over those of us who are such barbarians as to enjoy a taste of the nomad's existence, and ever I find my thoughts recurring to the fate of the lost explorers of Fidramalda Chair Brown, William Quilt, and Quentin McKinnon, widely different in temperament, in character, and in education. Each had the same love of indefiled nature, and each had felt the fascinating spell of the great unexplored mountain region, gone to Lake Gertrude Saddle, and trying to get down to Cledi Valley. Will Quill, Fifth and Shaninty, Seven F, M. Thus run the last words of Quill's diary, written on a paper bag and left in the tent at the foot of Homer's Pass. In endeavoring to find a way to Milford, he probably slipped and fell over a precipice. Mainwaring Brown perished. No one knows how. In endeavoring to find a pass from Menapuri to Hole's Arm, and poor McKinnon, who had gone through many adventures by flood and field, was no doubt knocked off his boat by the boom in some sudden squall, and drowned in the lake. Brave fellows, all of them. Of the manner of their going hence, we know little. But of this we may be sure, that when the time came for them to leave for that other country, where ends our bark, uncertain travel, where lie those happy hills and meadows low, there would be no flinching nor bemoaning, but that bravely and unmarginally they would depart. The charm of the unexplored, of the sombre forests, of the beautiful rivers, and of the giant mountains seemed to beckon them on unto unknown graves, Chapters be each the first crossing of Mount Cook from depth to height. From height to loftier had the climber sets his foot and sets his face, tracks lingering sunbeams to their restents bulge, and counts the last pulsations of the light. Strenuous through day, and in surprise by night, he runs a race with time and wins the race. Christina Rossetti, I had been in the hands of my doctor, and had made a good recovery, it was not surprising, therefore, that with renewed health and summer suns there should fall upon me that irresistible longing for the mountains that so often comes across the dreary miles to the city man. In imagination I was already drinking in the champagne air of those higher lands, and seeing, in my mind's side, the ecker scenes of the southern Alps, but I had given up all hopes of a climb that year. A week or two later, Mr. Samuel Turner, F. R. Loon, S. of England, appeared upon the scene and asked Fife and myself to join him in an expedition to the Mount Cook district. I was doubtful about attempting big work. So I went back to my doctor. He thumped me in various places, listened carefully to certain interior organs that it is generally supposed should be in good working order for climbing, and said, Bald, it will do you good. That settled it. Though I believe if the doctor had said no, I should have gone all the same. Turner and Fife had a week's start of me. If, before I could shake off the shackles of the city, they were already at the hermitage. Our coach had a full load of passengers, and the accommodation along the line of route was sorely taxed. Very comfortable in the laundry. One man had written in the visitor's book, and this entry was indicative of the general crutch, for there was truth as well as sarcasm in the sentence. Both this hosterly and the one at Mount Cook were in the hands of the tourist department, if, like most government enterprises of the kind, were a dismal failure. Tourists, or the majority of them, do not have votes, and what matters efficiency under a liberal government if votes can it be counted much better expend the needed money in some other place where the ballot box looms larger on the political horizon. Gox Popoli, 
Box D, the views along the lakeside as we drove towards Orangi in the early morning were very beautiful, and it was pleasing to note a considerable increase in the birdolf of this region, because as a general rule the feathered tribe of a colony has to bear the brunt of the colonist's gun. Swan, paradise and great seem to abound, while the strutting pakaki, the perky redbill, and the ubiquitous seagull were also in evidence, as the coach pulled up at the hermitage, Turner and Fife appeared in the doorway. They had attempted the ascent of Mount Seely in a nor'wester, if, as was only to be expected, have failed. Two days later we left the hermitage and walked up the Tasman Valley, fourteen miles, to the Bald Glacier Hut, Clark, Brain, and Green, of the hermitage staff, who were packing provisions to the huts, came with us. The skillful way in which Clark managed this portion of his duties was evident even to a novice in the art of transport in rough country. He had reduced it to a science, if, though he declared that the dreadful Hooker River would one day be the death of him. He continued year after year successfully to make these packing pilgrimages with the horses across swollen streams and moraine and avalanche debris to the Ball Glacier Hut, and thence without horses, over the solid hummocky and crevice ties to the Maltbrun hut, far up the great Desmond glacier. The huts were now very comfortable, and I could not help contrasting the changes that had been made since my wife and I first pitched our tent in this rocky wilderness sixteen years before, and carried tents, blankets, and provisions on our own backs along the crumbling moraine and up the trapless valley, we passed the spot where we had bivouacked under the stunted pantry, and a screech from an impudent key on the moraine recalled the fact that in those days a slight detour would have been made in order to get him for the pot. Now the keys are preserved to amuse the tourists, and the chief guide, with wonderful celerity, will produce you a forecast dinner that is warranted to satisfy even a Mount Cook appetite. It is true that colored doll cloth takes the place of spotless damask, and that soups, entrees, etc., are evolved from the mysterious contents of gaudily labeled tins. Nevertheless, after a hard day's tramp, one is apt to consider it a banquet fit for a king. There is a story current, and it is quite a true one if to tourists who finished a four kice wine dinner at the Ball Glacier hut with black coffee and cigars after which one, looking at the unusual surroundings, remarked quite seriously to his companion, By Jove we are roughing it. Aren't we next day we walked up the glacier to the Maltbrun hut, which we found half buried in snow. A week before it was quite covered, and Clark and Green, coming up with some tourists, had to dig their way down to the door, while inside the hut six candles had to be kept burning all day to give light. Our party was bent on the conquest of LED moment, but a storm came up from the northwest, and a heavy fall of snow put climbing out of the question for some days. We decided to retreat to the ball hut, and walk down the glacier in the dying storm, the gaunt precipices of the Malt Brun range looming darkly through the mists, while the murmuring of waterfalls and the roaring of avalanches were borne on the winds across the floor of the glacier. On Christmas Eve, the weather having cleared, we packed up tent, sleeping bags and provisions, and started across that Asmin Glacier in the Murchison Valley, for a climb on the Liebe Grange. Our objective was the Nuns Vale, a mountain of about 9,000 feet. It occupies a commanding position on the range, and Fife and I had often expressed a desire to climb it for the sake of the splendid views likely to be obtained, it was a hot walk across the glacier. He were almost entirely covered with moronic debris. A solitary key from the flanks of the Malt Brun range came and screeched at us, daring us to enter his damson. But we heeded not his eldritch cries, and descended into the Murchison Valley, the proportion of which is filled with a fine glacier drawing its supply of ice from an area of fourteen. Zero acres the Murchison River coming from the St. Mathlone Glacier bar our way, but we doffed our nether garments and crossed it in comfort in the garb of old gold. 
Camp Prize pitched close to a waterfall that came down in a series of leaps and cascades for fully 2,000 feet. It was a most interesting corner. The billy was boiled and supper served round a blazing fire, after which we turned into our sleeping bags inside the whimper tent. We slept fairly well till Turner roused us with an attempt to sing Christians. Awakened, we realized that it was Christmas morn. Turner had the billy boil at hour too soon. But that was a detail. Breakfast finished. We waited for the dawn. Then a start was made up the steep slopes of Espoir on the Leby Grange. The waterfall on our red came down in magnificent leaps. At our feet the Murchison River, in numerous branches, wandered over its stony bed. And north and north the asked hundreds and hundreds of rocky peaks and ice cliff mountains cleft the sky, directly opposite. Across the valley, the splendid mass of Mount Cook filled the view above the Boulder Trins Glacier. Presently the sun caught its upper snows and grim precipices, bathing them in a warm ethereal tint to despair alike of the artist and of the writer. The rosy flush crept slowly down the slopes, and then faded as it came, giving place to a wonderfully delicate pearly gray with just the faintest trace of warmth in it. This in turn vanished, and then, as Booz came boldly up above the eastern mountain tops, the snows of Arangi were changed to gleaming silver. It was a sunrise to be remembered. A detailed description of this climb would only bore the reader unacquainted with Alpine Heights. Suffice it then to say that the ridge that from below up to Kekwok became very much broken, and gave us some interesting rock work. Fife, who was, of course, in his element, decided to keep to the reet, and gain the snow slopes higher up, but Turner urged a deviation. If, somewhat reluctantly, we descended a snow couloir, flanked on either side by magnificent precipices. This detour lost us five hundred feet of elevation, and the climb became, for an hour or more, a weary snow trudge. The main arete was regained only to find that we were completely cut off from the nun's veil. We therefore had to be content with the first ascent of the nearest peak Mount Barrett, 8,760 on feet, which is the highest point of the rocky priest's cap. The final climb was interesting, especially the crossing of one narrow snow ridge, on which there was just room to stand. On either hand the snow slopes swept sharply down to great bergschrins that yawned below. From the summit of our peak the view of Mount Cook was Magan beferitably the finest in all the southern Alps, and, towards the north he asked, there was a most glorious panorama of mountain peaks that seemed to stretch for over a hundred miles, till the more distant were lost in a haze of blue chbri. The weather was still unsettled, and a cold wind had arisen, but we secured some very interesting photographs. On the descent we got two thousand feet of glistening, and reached Camp Proli in the afternoon. We packed up, waded the Murchison River, crossed the Tasman Glacier, and were back in the ball hut just before nightfall. After fifteen hours, fairly hard work and easy day for an invalid, we now began to cast longing eyes toward Mount Cook, the first calling of which he, oh, the climbing to the highest summit on one side, and the descending on the other side who had resolved to attempt. This was no ordinary undertaking, and it was necessary that we should take no chances either in regard to weather or equipment. The weather, however, was not yet quite settled, and another difficulty in the way was Mr. Turner's boat. While the chief guide at the hermitage was hammering some nails into it, he gave the heel a tap with the hammer and the heel came off the boot was sent first hast to the nearest shrimmy anchor and see us miles away. It was now due back at the hermitage, and Fife went down four I to twenty mital journey there and back. Meanwhile Turner did his walking and climbing in a pair of my alpine boats. At luckily, having taken the precaution to bring a second pair with me, Turner and I were left in the hut, and during these two days, in addition to doing the cooking and washing ping, I managed to find time to make a collection of beetles and butterflies for my friend, Mr. Percy Buller of Wellington, 
on Wednesday, December 27, accompanied by Drive, Fishet of Wellington. We proceeded up the Tasman Glacier to the Maltbrun Hut, where we found a party consisting of Mr. and Mrs. Longton of Christchurch, Miss Von Dabelsen, Miss Dixon, and Mr. W. Mintosh of Wellington, under the leadership of Graham, one of the hermitage guides. These huts have only two rooms, and the bunks are in each room are like steamers' berths, one above another. One room is supposed to be reserved for ladies. The men's room does four bedroom, kitchen, dinner room, and drug room by turns. The problem of housing seven men and three women in these two Fowerbuff cabins had to be solved by one of the men taking a bunk in the ladies' room, and two of our party sleeping on the floor in the men's room. This central portion of the Southern Alps was becoming such a popular tourist resort that problems of this nature not infrequently presented themselves, and further accommodation, both at the huts and at the hermitage, was urgently required. Five having returned with the McTair of lead boat, we were ready for more serious work, and on the 20th of December were astir at 1. 15. M. Preparing breakfast, an hour later two climbing parties might have been seen marching by lantern light in single file down the path that leads from the hut to the upper Tasman glacier, five hundred feet below. One party consisting of Mr. and Mrs. Lawton, Drive, Fishet, Mr. Mintach, and Grainth, being bound for the Hoxteter Dome, nine thousand one hundred seventeen feet high while our party was bent upon making the first descent of L.A.D. Beaumont, a found scone mountain of ten, two hundred feet, the day was not promising. While we were having breakfast, a fitful wind had soughed ominously about the hut, and by the time we had proceeded about two miles up the glacier, and before it was yet dawn, this wind had increased in strength, and was blowing steadily. The great mountains around us seemed dwarfed in the feeble light before the dawning, and the cold, grey snows of the minarets, Mount Green, Mount Walter, and Delhi de Beaumont loomed ghost-like against the western sky. Eastward, the serrated ridge of Mount Darwin, and the dark precipices of Molt Braun frowned on us from heights of over nine thousand and ten thousand feet respectively. The rounded snows of the Hoxteter Dome closed in the view at the head of the great icefield valley. The snow on the glacier was hard with a night's freezing, and we made quick progress over its gently sloping, even surface. The sunrise on that Asmin Peaks was devoid of the beautiful rosy tints that one so often sees in alpine regions. But for a way down the valley beyond the Ben Oha Range, where the storm clouds now gathered in great companies and battalions, there was a gorgeous and even a theatrical display, the mountain tops and the distant cloudland appearing as if lit up by some great conflagration, or the glowing fires of some vast volcano, just as day was dawning. Graham halted to rope up his party for the ascent of the dome, while we swung round to the left in the direction of our mountain. Easy snow slopes broken by an occasional crevice led us towards the foot of Mount Walter, from which the Times Glacier takes its rise on the western side. This fine peak, 9,507 feet in Mount Green, 8,704 feet, rise from the main glacier to glorious spires of rock and ice and snow, forming, with the pure dome of LED Beaumont, a magnificent alpine view that dominates the head of the great Asmin Glacier. The approach to the upper snows of our mountain was guarded by deep crevices great gaping bergschrins, and gigantic serics, and through and up these we had to fret our way. The snow was in bad condition, and the climb became a weary grind. Fife and Turner led alternately, and I, being in the middle of the roke, had little to do but follow my leader. Some great ice cliffs on the left coming down from the shoulder of Mount Walter looked dangerous, and we gave them as wide a both as possible. As we climbed past them on the right, a great ice avalanche fell away below us, crashing with thundering roar onto the glacier some distance to the left of our line of route. 
ahead. The face of L.E.D. Beaumont presented a fine sight with its towering walls of ice and steep snow slopes. On the whole line of the ascent we could see no sign of any rock to contrast with the delicate harmonies of green and blue and white. Illustration. Mount Walter. Beyond the corner of Mount Walter there was an interesting little bit of work on fretting away past great blocks of ice and gaping shrunds. Above, generally speaking, the climb was an interesting. It is a climb to do once, but never a second time. We dodged round a steep sloping ice block and descended a fairly easy snow slope, only to find the way barred by a burgress fender crevice with one lip lower than the other. This trund, however, was narrow enough to permit of our jumping over it, if, though it was a case of jumping up, we had little difficulty in crossing it. It is very rare for two parties to be climbing together within sight of each other in the Southern Alps, because in New Zealand we have not yet got to that stage in which, as Whistler put it, you can both admire the mountain and recognize the tourist on the top. It was a decided novelty, therefore, to watch the Launton party gradually ascending higher and higher on the Hoxteter Dome. By the time we had crossed this Berkshire and we could see them of small dots like flies, sheltering from the cold wind on the lee side of the ridge leading to the lower peak of the dome. Bate, wisely, did not attempt the higher peak. When we had gained a height of 9,000 feet, the cold northwester, at this altitude blowing with considerable violence, struck us with full force, and whisked clouds of snow and fine particles of ice in our faces. The mist was also pouring over the main divide, and the Longton party, who were watching us from their distant sheltered ridge, now source disappearing into the clouds. Really, we should have turned at this point. But Turner was very anxious to climb a virgin peak, if, while he led up the frozen slope. We too followed meekly in his uncertain wake. Soon the clouds and the driving snow grew so dense that we could see only a very few yards ahead, and the line of route became quite obscured. The wind also increased in violence, and once or twice we had to cling to the frozen slope with the aid of our rice cases. The wind was bitterly cold, and icicles hung from Turner's mustache and half-ground beard. For about an hour we climbed upward in this blizzard, without any likelihood of a view, and with a very good chance of not being able to follow the proper route on the descent. Besides, we could not tell what dangers lay ahead. So at last Turner gave the word to retreat. During a momentary rent in the driving cloud, we got a glimpse of the last Bergschrind, which runs round the final lyscop of the mountain, so that we were only some four hundred feet below the summit, and all the real difficulties of the climb had been overcome. Another half an hour in fine weather, and we should have topped our peak. But a first ascent cannot be claimed till the actual summit is under foot at all events by any true sports mind, and therefore, though only a few hundred feet of easy step tuft on the final ice cup remained to be done, we retired defeated. As we turned, the swelling cloud and snow became denser, and I was fearful lest we should not find our way back. All I could see was my two shivering companions and the alpine rope that connected the party. As it was, the drifting snow had completely obliterated our upward steps, and we got off the proper line. But we climbed downward as quickly as possible, trusting to the general direction of the slopes to bring us right in the end. There was not, however, a great deal of room to come and go on and the great walls and blocks of broken ice loomed through the fog, looking nearly twice their actual size, and more formidable than ever. At length five foundle and mark in the sloping sera crowned which we had climbed on the descent. If the rafter, we were able to keep the route fairly well. Just below this sera turner started a glissade, but the slope-hard rough ice under a very thin coating of snow was unsuitable for glistening. If after whizzing down a few feet, I had the misfortune to strike a hard block in the ice, and was doubled up in an instant with a bruise on my left hip, another on my right knee, and a third on the bone just above the right ankle. Using my ice case as a brake, 
I shouted to the leader, and quickly pulled up, but not till Fife, who was glistening behind, had almost cannoned on to me. After this experience, we proceeded more cautiously till we had passed the dangerous corner at the foot of Walter Peak, where the fob thinned out, and we could see more clearly. The rest was a trudge down the glacier to the hut. Turner proudly carried the icicles on his mustache right into the hut. We had been going steadily for nine hours without halting to eat or drink, and we were glad of hot soup and other luxuries that Graham provided out of the government locker. All others, including two tourists who had come up with Clark, returned to the bowl hut that afternoon. But we remained behind to make another attempt to conquer L.A.D. Bowment. Next day the weather was still threatening, but we marched off again. Only two turn after proceeding a little way up the glacier. We resolved to try once more on the morrow, and started by lantern light. This time at two a.m. the night had been unusually warm, and Fife and I felt convinced that it was useless to persevere, as the snow would be in bad order, and there was a nor'wester brewing, in deference to Turner's wishes. However, we went on, but we never touched our mountain that day. The snow was soft and slushy. If, after a weary, an interesting trudge, we reached a point above the Lendefen satellite thousand feet above Sealville. The nor'wester had covered the west coast with Clyde, but Fife and I were glad of the opportunity of looking down the pass we made from the head of the Great Esmond Glacier to the west coast six years before. Many memories of that somewhat daring exploit were recalled if, as we looked over the steep walls of splintered rock and broken ice. We now wondered how we had got down. In an ice-cold wind we trudged warily back through the soft snow to the Moltbrun hut. The weather was bad as ever. So, after some food and a rest, we retreated down the glacier to the ball hut. Fife had a skinned heel. Turner had sore feet and I had a bad ankle. Again we had suffered defeat. L.E.D. Bowman hit his snow summit in the clouds, defiant and unconnerped, and the scent of Mount Cook seemed still afar off. On our arrival at the Ball Glacier hut we found it already occupied by a party consisting of Professor Baldwin Spencer of Melbourne, Mr. and Mrs. Linden of Geeling Grammar School, and Mr. M. Stett, Jr of Melbourne. Clark had come up with them, as had also the coke driver and the stableman, so that the hut was again full to overflowing, with the result that three men had to sleep in the ladies' room, while Clark and Fife dust on the floor of the men's room, in which all the bunks were already occupied. So far as we were concerned, it was evident that our party would be the better for a rest, but even had we been bent upon another climb, the weather would again have prevented it. That night the nor'wester developed in force, if, accompanied by heavy rain, howled round the hut. Turner and Fife, the coke driver and the stableman, returned to the hermitage, but I wasn't able to accompany them, and remained behind to treat my house wool and ankle with hot fermentations and bandaging. Nevertheless, I spent a very pleasant day in the company of the professor, Mr. and Mrs. Linden, Mr. Stett, and Clark. Our expedition was evidently, for various reasons, becoming an all-starred one, and the congenial company of my new-found friends came like a ray of sunshine through the gloom. In the afternoon the weather cleared. As it was New Year's Day, we celebrated the event with a four-pouse dinner, served up in Clark's best style. The menu consisted of soup, fried sardines, cold mutton, and hot plum pudding, with cocoa decidedly good a la Baldwin Spencer. The best of the professor was that you would never know he was a professor, and it was some time before it dawned upon me that he might be, and indeed was, the man who had been guilty of an erudite treatise on a rudimentary eye in the two tar lizard, and the offer of a valuable work on the Australian aboriginals evidently I was in Luxwake might have been just an ordinary tourist, 
or a climber who regarded the mountains very much in the nature of greece poles to be climbed for his own glorification and profit on the contrary the new visitors were charmed with the new zealand alps and it was a great delight to clark and myself to find such a whole side appreciation of our mountain glories and no attempt at belittlement or vain comparison that evening there was a wonderful sunset and we all stood outside the hut watching the gorgeous and decker shining pageantry of cloudland in front of de la becca most beautiful of mountis nads the spotless snows of the minarets far up the icefield valley great rounded cumuli came sailing across from the northwest like huge balls of glowing fire the southern sky was glorious with higher clouds of spun gold and burnished copper and the heavens themselves were tinted with yellow and amber in the distance exquisitely shaded by some master hand into delicate ethereal greens and blues the echershanging tints formed marvellous and wonderful harmonies the stony grey wall of the moraine fronting the hut was splashed with the sombre green of the alpine herbage and across the glacier high above the level of the moraine the rugged rock peaks of the malt brun range were tinged with dull rose their bold perpendicular slabs silhouetted against a sky of lapis lazuli flecked with exquisite wisps of thin cloud the colors changed quickly the clouds sailing past de Lobeck in the dying nor'wester lost their fire the spun gold the lapis lazuli and the delicate peacock blues and greens gave place to sombre gray there grew chilly so we went into the hut and chatted around the fire till bedtime this past our new year's day on the second january my friends departed for the moltbrun hut eight miles up the glacier and i was left alone even the keys and the two seagulls who had interested and amused us during the previous day had gone upon a winged pilgrimage i did some washing and mending cooked my meals washed the dishes tiddied the hut wrote up my journal made a beetle trap with an empty tin sunk in the ground fed the carrier pigeon left by clark and read Ryder haggard's jess which i found in the hut for the second time the weather grew worse and in the afternoon snow fell in big flakes on the third january the program was much the same this day i continued the hot fermentations on my ankle and succeeded in reducing the swelling considerably i had no watch so i gauged the time by my hunger and determined to satisfy the inner man with some of the delicacies in the government larder herr suprather appealed to one and it was opened only to find that it contained stewed kidneys i pitched it over the hut and opened a tin labelled curried mutton chops but once more the label was a lie and there stood revealed stewed kidneys that tin with its contents also went over the roof of the hut as did a third delicacy that existed only in the imagination of the packer i was going through the same trial that my wife and i had gone through at the dialogic bibwick several years before and found afterwards that my experience was not at all an unusual one finally i made a dish of hot macaroni soup put up by another firm to which i added green peas tinned in paris and this with bread made a sumptuous repast the weather was still unsettled the barometer standing at twenty asphertens and the thermometer at four to six degrees the keys and the gulls returned in the evening and one of the keys came inside the hut and walked about cocking his head knowingly from side to side as if he were taking an inventory of the furniture and reckoning what it would fetch at an auction sale there were in all nine keys and they went through the most comical antics chattering in their quaint key language dancing on the rocks and even kissing one another as the night wore on they became a decided nuisance glistening down the iron roof and picking up and dropping the empty meat tins behind the hut that in dropping business with its nosy rattle seemed to entertain them hugely but the sleepy mountaineer inside the hut could not see where the fun came in so he got up and hold imprecations and stones at them they replied to the imprecations with some of their own invective and the stone trow hiving instead of scaring only amused them 
However, I had my revenge, for a random shot laid one of them low. I picked him up and put him in a box, just outside the door, with the intention of spinning him in the morning. Then all the other keys gathered together in a committee meeting a few yards off and jabbered away to one another about this strange big featherless animal who threw stones. I know I was roundly condemned, and the mate of the dead key came up to the box, and pecked at it, and crooned dearly over the corpse till I felt a perfect brute, and went off to bed again, but wasn't able to sleep. Thereupon I fell to moralizing upon the pleasures and penalties of mountaineering, apart from the actual joy of climbing. It gives the opportunity of beholding nature in her most sublime and most glorious moods, so Martin Conway agrees in this, but adds a word of warning. The climber, he says, pits his life against nature's forces, and dares them to take it. He can do so with impunity if he knows enough, and has enough skill. He will get the better of nature every time, unto an almost dead certainty. But if he does not know enough, or lacks skill, sooner or later nature will win the trick skill, knowledge, and textbooks are supposed to have hold the dangers of mountaineering almost into the known. But Mumry, that most brilliant cragsman was so a known grave lies somewhere among the snows of the giant Himalaysians his delightful book about his climbs in the Alps and Caucasus, says he cannot forget that the first guide to whom he was ever rocked, and one who possessed more knowledge of mountains than is to be found even in the badminton library, was none the less killed on the Broilard Mont Blanc, and his son, subsequently, on Kistot Hound, than the memory of two rollicking parties, comprising seven men, who one day in eighteen seven time were climbing on the west face of the Matterhorn, passes with ghost like admonition before his mind, and bids him remember that of these seven Mr. Pentel was killed on the wetter horn. Ferdinand Dimsing on the Macubna Monte Rosa, and John Petrus on the Fresne Mont Blanc. In New Zealand, the lowly pioneers of alpine climbing have done good work without guides and without accident. And in thus quoting two such famous authorities as Kambay and Mummery, I have no wish to in any way discourage the practice of so ennobling a sport, but rather to enjoin caution and pains to acquire proficiency. High proficiency, as Mummery again points out, is only attainable when a natural aptitude is combined with long years of practice. It is true the great ridges sometimes demand their sacrifice, but the mountaineer would hardly forego his worship though he knew himself to be the destined victim. But, happily, to most of us the great brown slabs bending over into a measurable space, the lines and curves of the wind bamlet cornice, the delicate undulations of the fissured snow, our old and trusted friends, ever luring us to health and fun and laughter, and enabling us to bid a sturdy defiance to all the those that time and life oppose. But I have been led by the lonely hut and its surroundings into a moralizing mood. Let me therefore come back from the great peaks and descend to the valley, for the next morning the former were hidden in the clouds, and even the valley was filled with gloom. Fife and Turner had not returned. I felt lonelier than ever and formed a strong conviction that man is a gregarious animal. Having come to this conclusion, I cooked myself a late breakfast of bacon and onions, and a little later went out and saw the professor and his party striding down the moraine from the upper Tasman. In a few minutes the billy was singing on the fire, and then, over a cup of hot coffee with my friends, I became once more a sociable being and all the world was Rosal Crowd, the visitors resolved to go to the hermitage in the afternoon. I decided to walk a few miles down the valley with them, and then, tempted by the pleasant company and thoughts of the luxurious seas of the hermitage, I was persuaded to accompany them all the way. By the time I had done ten miles my ankle was again bad. If, an hour or two later, I limped into the hermitage, dead lame and fully convinced that my climbing for that season was at an end. Chapter 6 The first crossing of Mount Cook can to tighten the muscle. Feel the strong blood flow, and set your foot upon the utmost crest Jeffrey Winfrey Pion. 
During the next seven days my ankle mended slowly, and a biologist nearest approach to a doctor within ninety miles spesks the opinion that there was a splinter off the bone. So far as I was concerned I had now given up all thoughts of attempting the ascent of Mount Cook, for, with a weak leg, I should be likely to endanger the whole party. It was with a sad heart that I watched the expedition start off once more for the Tasman, in the hopes of accomplishing the first traverse of Mount Cook. Fashioned grain, however, were keenly anxious for me to accompany them, and it was decided, on the day they left for Mount Cook, that I should give my leg a good trial on the Sealy Range, if, if it stood the test, rejoined the party the same evening at the Ball Hut. Accordingly, in company with Professor Baldwin Spencer, Mr. and Mrs. Linden, and Jack Clark, I went up the Sealy Range. We spent a delightful day, the weather being glorious, and the views of Sefton, Mount Cook, and many other mountains, magnificently grand. My legs stood the test, and I returned to the hermitage in high glee, feeling confident that another day's rest at the Mount Cook bivouac would complete the cure. Accordingly I bade farewell to my friends at the hermitage, and that evening rode up with Clark, in the moonlight, to the hut, crossing the dangerous Hooker River. We changed horses, Clark insisting that I should cross on the safer of the two, and giving instructions that I should hold on to his mane if he got bowled over. However, these horses, which are wonderful at crossing rivers, got over safely. Never shall I forget that glorious ride in the moonlight. We galloped over the Tussa Flats, and then slackened our pace as we entered upon the narrow and uncertain path between the dark Spovorong the on our left and the great moraine of the Tasman Glacier that loomed on our right like some tight and a jumble of wreckwork. The talk was of climbing and climbers, reminiscences of former victories and defeats, glorious days spent amongst the higher snows, and of brave companions who had shared our alpine joys and sorrows in the years now past. Meanwhile the stars, dimmed by a glorious moon, swung westward to our path. The fourteen miles went past like four, and presently, about ten p. m., we spied the solitary light of the hut window, like a star in the lower darkness, and our cheery dodelling awoke the echoes of the valley and brought an answering shout from Graham and Fife. They were glad to see me, and delighted to hear that I was fit to climb again. On Monday, the 8th January, we ascended to the Bivouac Rock, on the Host Ridge, from which the early New Zealand climbers made their heroic, though unsuccessful, attacks on the monarch of the Southern Alps. We climbed the steep rocky ridge with heavy swag stint, sleeping bags, ass cases, alpine rope, and provisions for three or four days. Green, a promising climber, came with us in the capacity of porter. It was necessary to shovel the snow from the little stone platform on which we were to sleep, and we had no sooner got camp pitched than the weather changed. Fence clods, borne on southerly airs, quickly filled the valley, blotting out from view the moraines and icy ungs of the great Tasman glacier thousands of feet below. We made a billy of tea, and dined on bread and borty and cold mutton, after which Green very reluctantly left us to join Clark and a party at the Molt Brunhut further up the glacier. Graham went down with him over the first snow slopes. As he did not return for some considerable time we got rather anxious, and Fife went to see what was the matter. Presently he returned with Graham, and we heard Green jodelling from the misty depths thousands of feet below us. We gave him answering jovels from the bivouac. This interchange of signals being kept up till Green's voice grew fainter and fainter, and at last we got tired of answering him. Then we made things snug about our weary perch, and turned in for the night. The four of us were packed like sardines in a tin, but with our clothes on, in the eider down sleeping bags, and under the shelter of my whimper tent, with its waterproof floor, we were fairly warm and comfortable. Those of us who were smokers lit our pipes and were happy. 
Then the clouds that had overwhelmed the ridge began to patter taped her on the tent roof in gentle rain, which, later in the night, turned to snow. Visions of a night in this same bivouac years ago, when the lurid lightning dazzled our eyes, the thunder shook the ridge, and the tent was frozen to the rocks in a terrible storm, came back to me. But that is another story, and has been told elsewhere in this book. Illustration above the clouds we brakes fated at seven o'clock next morning after fourteen hours of the tent called mutton mm. bread and borty and jam the weather was warm and the new snow was peeling off the slopes of mount cook avalanches hissed and thundered all around us the mountains being literally alive and in a most dangerous condition for climbing nest however did not concern us greatly for we had decided to rest for a day at the bivouac and there was at last a good prospect of the weather's clearing we spent the day in delightful idleness lazying on the warm rocks pottering about the camp and photographing five acted as chief cook and for each meal prepared a billy of delicious hot tea using as fuel a little bit of deal board we had brought up together with some old candles found under the bivouac rock. With these he melted snow and boiled the water. We also added to our water supply by spreading snow on a warm sloping rock, and allowing the drip thereof from to collect in a billion and empty throughton. For the greater part of the day we were above the lower stratum of cloud, which spread itself like a fleecy counterpane over the great valley, or swathed itself about the giant peaks, leaving the dark summits standing in startling yet stately grandeur as pointed dialins in a vapory sea of whitened grey. Now and again this counterpane would be torn by some sport of wind or partially dissolved by the warm rays of the sun. If, through the holes thus made, we could see the upper snows of the great as or its lower tongues of attenuated ice flowing between the piled debris of the grey more niched largest in the southern alpshidst and a feet below. Mater as the mists gradually dissolved we obtained glorious views of the great helps with their tributary glaciers pouring streams of broken ice down the sides of the valley to feed the parent stream here were all our old friends havinger and de Laubeck, and the minor shekwiswils ten zarafit summits fife and i had trodden looking down at us with a lofty disdain if across the valley Maltbrunt, the Matterhorn of the Southern Alps heaved his strong shoulders of grim dark brown rock up through the veil of surging mist, and cleft the azure blue of heaven, recalling to my mind Fife's memorable first ascent and his equally memorable entry in the visitor's book I had left at the hut played a lone hand with Malt Brun, and won. Yes, all our old friends were here, strong in their might, each with his own unchanging character and as one recalled the joyous days spent on slope and summit the pulses quickened and the hourglass ran in gold and sands glorious creatures fine old fellows as lamb says we bowed before them and gave them reverent greeting befitting their greatness thinking that when time who steals our years away shall steal our pleasures too the memory of the past will stay and half our joys renew it was decided not to go to sleep that evening, but to start for the traverse of Mount Cook before midnight. Well, however, crept into our sleeping bags inside the tent in order to keep warm. Turner had complained of the dampness at the end of the tent the night before, so I took his place and gave him an inside both. At ten peak, M. Fife was a steer boiling us a billy of tea, and at ten, Twenty wee breaks fated the sky was clear, and the moon was shining. Above, higher up the range, the clouds were pouring over between Hadinger and De La Beck. This did not augur well for success. On going through our rucksacks again, we discarded a few things to make them lighter. Above, what with cameras, spare clothing, food, and the two aluminum water tolls one filled with claret and the other with water we had to carry from fifteen pound to twenty pound 
he prefer heavy loads for so long and difficult to climb. Our provisions consisted of half a loaf, one large tin of ox tongue, one tin of sheep stones, one tin of sardines, two tins of jam, some butter, two oranges, two lemons, a few raisins, and about a pound of brown sugar, upon which latter I subsisted almost entirely on all our climbs. I had remembered reading about the virtues of brown sugar in one of Sir Martin Conway's books, and my wife had obtained some special brown demer air sugar for me from our grocer. Then I looked the subject up in Conway's book on the scent of a concacha, after mentioning the necessity for light foods, such as soup and jam, for high scents. He states that on the Kankacha climb more important than all these was a great tin of coarse brown demerara sugar, the finest heat producing, Miss Glenaring's food in the world, for men taking violent exercise, such as soldiers on active service or athletes in training. A plentiful supply of sugar was, he stated, for better than large meat rations. A quarter of a pound per day per man was his allowance on the mountain side and he was inclined to think that this might be increased to nearly half a pound with advantage. Cane sugar, of course, being selected for this purpose, we were aware that on such a climb, what with the great exertion, the want of water, and the reduced atmospheric pressure, we should be able to eat very little, and that, if we were successful, most of the provisions we were taking would not be needed, Still there was the danger, in consequence of a sudden storm, or other unforeseen difficulties, of our having to spend the night out on an exposed ledge of rock at an altitude of ten, zero or eleven, zero feet, in which case sire lives would depend upon a supply of extra clothing and food. Therefore we dared not with prudence make our loads any lighter. At eleven, fifteen p. m. on the night of Tuesday, January 9. We started, having rolled up all our belongings that we did not require in the sleeping bags. On these, in turn, in the tent, this made one big bundle, which we jammed under the rock as far as possible and weighted down with stones, so that it should not be blown away. We took with us also one sixtivit thick length and one fiftieth length of alpine rope made by Buckingham of London and tested to a breaking strain of two thousand pound in single file in the moonlight we told up the snow slopes leading to the glacier dome thirteen hundred feet above our bivouac for the most part we climbed upwards in solemn silence each one being busy with his own thoughts and wondering no doubt what the day would bring about ten minutes after midnight we had left the final steep snow slope of the dome behind and looked across the great plateau that stretches at an altitude of over seven thousand feet for a distance of some four miles at the foot of the precipitous slopes of mount scook and tasman from the dome we had now to descend seven hundred feet and then cross the plateau to gain the foot of the northeast whence ridge that was to lead us to the summit of our peak the snow was in bad condition and we sank in it over the boot tops in places it was in that most tantalizing of conditions with a frozen crust that let one foot through, while the other foot held on the surface. While we were crossing the plateau, a vivid streak of lightning, or an unusually brilliant meteor, flashed athwart the northern sky, and a weird effect was produced by the moon, which, with a great halo round it, was dipping westward over the snow peak of Mount Hast, for a few moments the moon, with half its halo, seemed to rest on the very apex of the mountain. We crossed the rest of the plateau in the shadow of the high peaks of the main divide, behind which the moon had now sunk. If, presently, in the den, uncertain light became up against the debris of a great avalanche that had fallen from the slopes of Mount Tasman. A mass of broken ice and snow was piled in confusion to a height of fifteen or twenty feet, and we had to make a detour to avoid the obstruction. Illustration, Mount Tasman. At about a quarter past two, M. We commenced to ascend the long snow slope leading to the Zerbegrin Arete, 
and in the dust before the dawn we reached to Bergshren that might have given us a good deal of trouble to cross. Graham led carefully through the broken ice. F. Peering into the dull gray light, thought he saw a bridge over which we might crawl in safety. We made a traverse to the right and climbed round under the overhanging wall of ice that formed the upper lip of the shrund, and which, had it fallen, would have crushed us out of existence. At this hour of the morning, however, it was perfectly safe, and Graham, disappearing round a huge block that towered above, crossed a frail snow bridge and gained the upper lip of the shrund. Turner followed, and I caved out the rope as he, though, gradually disappeared from view round the corner, Graham driving the handle of his axe deep in the snow, while Fife and I, below, took a firm stand and kept the rope taut. In a few minutes we were all safely across, and congratulating ourselves upon having so easily overcome the first serious obstacle of the climb, we were now fairly on to the long three thousand its no slope that leads up to the rocks of the Zerbegrinerit. This slope was found in fairly good order. In places we could pick steps, but in other places the steps had to be chipped with the ice cases. As we slowly climbed upwards the slope got steeper and steeper. Indeed, the angle was just about as steep as it is possible for snow to hold. After about half a hour's climbing we were startled by a magnificent avalanche that fell with thundering roar from high upon the broken islipses of Mount Tasman. It crashed on to the great plateau two thousand feet below, sending eye blocks to a great distance, and throwing up a cloud of snow like some huge breaker that sends its spray high and near above a rock bound karst. It was cold work standing in the steps in the chilly dawn with the ice chips from the leader's axe swishing about us. Presently the sun rose gloriously over the eastern ranges, and we were reveling in its generous warmth on the slope where, before, we had been half frozen, but the combination of sun and slope became almost more intolerable than the slope without the sun. Three thousand feet of such work is apt to become a shade monotonous even to the keenest disciple of Sconrichts. This particular wall is so long and so steep that the climber must give his attention almost continually to the matter in hand. He has little time to admire the view. The steps must be cleaned out, and the rope must be held taut. Each man must keep his distance. Otherwise, a slip might be fatal. But it is monotonous work climbing slowly, hour after hour, in zigzags, with your face to the white wall. You have time to review your past life four years and years, and to think of the future four years ahead, with the dead uniformity of it all, and the nebsirissing glare in the stagnant atmosphere. There comes a munition of impending drowsiness. This you fight with an effort of the will, and some pretense set in enlarging the steps that the leader has made, but which are, already, large enough in all conscience. While I was standing in the steps at a spot about halfway up the slope I felt a strange tug on the rope, and thought it must have caught in some obstruction or have been struck by a falling block of ice. But, on looking round, I could see nothing to account for it. Some hours afterwards, while we were resting on the warm rocks above, Faf smilingly asked me if I had felt the pull, and then the rasp, still smiling, informed me that it was the result of a moment of actual somnolence on his part. For a second his brain had become dulled and his feet had come to a sudden stop on this never-ending ladder of ice. As the rope was taut, and I had a firm footing, the danger was nilt, but it would never do for the leader to be so taken, and the leader on that particular slope has enough to do to keep him very wide awake. I, after our, went by, and we began to get very tired of the endless snow slope. So traversed to the right to gain the rocks, we found them difficult, with few holds for hands or feet, and so coated with snow and ice that progress was almost impossible. Reluctantly we had to traverse back to the snow slope. It was six, forty, m, before we reached the rocks on the main reet. A halt was called on a narrow ledge of snow. There we headed rink and some bread and marmalade, and took a number of photographs. 
a bank of cloud loomed above the eastern mountains but the sun was clear in the blue above and as there was at last every prospect of fine weather our spirits rose proportionately to the elevation gained from this point a beautiful snow ridge rose in a gentle curve to a series of rocky crags there was just room for our feet on this narrow ridge on the right a steep pool or led down to the linda glacier and on the left the mountain fell away in very steep slopes for over three thousand feet to the grand plateau at the end of the snow ridge we had some fine climbing up a shoulder of rock this was scaled without incident except that of a falling stone which turner dislodged but which fortunately went past without hitting either five or myself then we climbed along another narrow snow reed which though steeper than the first one was somewhat shorter on gaining the rocks at the head of this ridge at nine m we halted for an only lunch we replenished the wine bottle and the water told with the drippings of snow that we melted on a slab of warm stone we had now gained an altitude of between ten zero and eleven zero feet and the views were magnificently grand tasman the second highest mountain in new zealand with his wonderful slopes of snow and ice and a magnificent snow cornice was quite close to us on the north then came mount lendefend and the jagged pinnacled ridge of Haast, which from this point of view seemed to bid defiance to the mountaineer farther along on the main divide rose the square top of mount hadinger from which the magnificent runs and broken ice of the Haast glacier fell away towards the tasman valley beyond that the rocky peak of the Lobeck, and the beautifully pure snows of the minarets cleft the blue leading the eye in turn to the gleaming masses of ellie de beaumont and the hoxteter dome at the head of the great tasman glacier across the valley malt brun towered grandly above all the other rock peaks of the range and still farther away towards the north he asked was the finest view of all range succeeding range and mountain succeeding mountain for more than a hundred miles or as far as that i could reach in the distance to the north of the main range we looked down on a sea of clouds upon which the sun was shining the higher peaks piercing the billows of mist and looking like pointed islands we could plainly trace our steps along the snow reeds that we had climbed and across the plot all thousands of feet below lower still were the great shruns and toppling pinnacles of the hoxditter ice fall and below that the magnificent sweep of the great tasman glacier eastward a few fleecy cumulus clouds sailed over the foothills and beyond were the plains of canterbury and the distant sea an hour passed all too quickly amidst scenes of such magnificent and grandeur but there was still a long climb ahead if in high spirits we started to cut steps up another very sharp snorage with a drop of four thousand feet on one side balancing on this narrow ridge and gazing down those tremendous slopes was quite an exhilarating performance this ridge brought us to the last rocks which were steep and afforded some fun climbing at the top of these rocks we found zerbegrin's matchbox under a few pieces of splintered rock and left a card in it fife led up to a shoulder below the final line spot still cutting steps and then the order on the rope was reversed and graham went to the front this shoulder turned us to the left and soon we gained the final snow reed that rose steeply almost to the summit the last bit of the nice cup afforded easy climbing and at one o'clock on wednesday afternoon we stepped on to the topmost pinnacle of orange jetting rowers and fortifwood minutes from the time we left our bivouac the view was again magnificentus indescribable we looked across the island from sea to sea and in addition to the views northward eastward and westward we now betled a glorious alpine panner emma stretching to the south as far as that i could reach the giant tasman and all the lesser mountains were dwarfed and the whole country was spread out like a map in relief at our feet hector the third highest mountain in new zealand seemed a pimple street david's dome had become a low peak but led bowment near the head of the tasman 
still looked to Grand Mountain, the effect of distance seeming to make it the more imposing. Through rents in the clouds to the westward patches of sea appeared like dark lagoons. I stepped out of the rope to secure the first photograph that had ever been taken of the summit of Mount Cook. Then we congratulated each other, and while Graham got the provisions out of the rucksack, Spife employed himself in taking in the view and coolly cutting up his tobacco for a smoke. Fife had intended to take the pulses of the party, and I to make some careful notes of the surrounding mountains, but we did not do so. Professor Indel in his famous description of the ascent of the Weishan says that he opened his notebook to make a few observations, but he soon relinquished the attempt. There was something incongruous, if not profane, in allowing the scientific faculty to interfere where silent worship was a reasonable service, Thus felt we as we gazed around at the marvellous Piner Amma. Then thoughts of the descent began to obtrude themselves. We had climbed Mount Cook from the Tasman side. A more serious problem now presented itself. Could we descend on the Hucker side, and so make the first crossing of our on the illustration? A three thousand foot snow slope. Illustration. Summit of Mount Cook. Chapter Kex, the first crossing of Mount Cook and Stolden, now that I have climbed and won this hat. I must tread downward through the sloping shade, and travel the bewildered track still night. Dante Gabriel Rossetti. We spent altogether twenty valve minutes on the summit of the Mount Wintetfen, three hundred forty-nine feet above the sea. The views were certainly grand and very beautiful, but not so fine as from between the altitudes of ten, zero and eleven zero feet for the simple reason that from the greater height of the summit all the lesser mountains were dwarfed and many of those that looked imposing from below had now dwindled into insignificance having repacked our rucksacks we gave one last glance about us and then started down the slope on the other side of the mountain we were now met by wind which of course at this altitude was very cold. The snow slope was not steep, but it was frozen, and we had to cut a number of steps before we could reach the rock reet. In half an hour we were on the highest rocks of this reet. F. To our dismay, we found them in the worst possible condition for cling the plastered with snow and ice, and fringed with great icicles. We might have returned to the summit and climbed back to safety before night fall down our upward route, but we were very keen to call the peak for the first time, and decided to take the risk. Very little was said. If, after a brief consultation between Fife and myself, the word was given to continue the descent, and we started with grim determination to conquer the difficulties and overcome the dangers that lay between us and the upper slopes of the Hooker Glacier, thousands of feet below the summit on the western side. It now became a question not only of climbing with care, but also with all possible speed, for there was no place on this long ridge, in its present condition and with the cold wind blowing, where we could bivouac in safety. We had reckoned on a comparatively easy climb down these rocks, and also upon crossing the Bergschrund at the head of the Hooker Glacier before nightfall, but soon so that this would be out of the question, especially as one of the party was a slow climber, Fife repeatedly urged him to hurry and trust for safety to the rope. Fife was now an responsible positionalist man on the rope. I came next, and Turner was between me and Graham. Oh, under general directions from Fife, led down. After descending a few hundred feet, we soon found that, owing to the ice glazing in the new snow, it was impossible to keep to the crest of the ridge and the descent became largely a series of traverses across difficult and, at times, precipitous faces of rock, mostly on the eastern face of the reet. On the west the climbing was even more difficult, and there was a bitter wind blowing, so we avoided that side as much as possible. In one place we had to climb back from the eastern face through a gap of overhanging rock and great icicles, Peter smashed the greater part of the icicles with the handle of his ice case, and the broken pieces went switching down the precipices towards the hooker. 
under the circumstances. There was naturally some hesitancy in selecting the best route, but there was little time for in due deliberation. And as Graham paused now and then in some doubt, Fife would call out, Will it do? Peter Peter, in quiet and solemn tones, would invariably give the one answer, Well, it doesn't look too good. And then would come the answering admonition from Fife, Get down, get somewhere. At last we came to a break in the ridge that looked utterly unscalable. We halted and glanced ahead and from side to side. Then we cast longing eyes to some snow slopes leading down to the Linda Glacier on the east, but that was thousands of feet below us. Will it do? Peter, we asked. And back came the non-commodal reply. It doesn't look too good. There was considerable hesitancy. It now appeared that the moment for decisive action had come. So I suggested that we should enrope and be lowered down singly over the face of rock. I was lowered down first, and then, untying, the rope was hauled up, and Graham was lowered. I had gained a footing on a knob of rock that jutted out from the snow and ice in a narrow chimney, but there was not room on this for two people. So I cut a few steps and climbed down some twelve or fifteen feet, and held on in a somewhat insecure position. I confess that I was anxious to see the last man make his appearance, for, with a keen wind nearly freezing the fingers with which I clung to the rock, and without even the moral support of the rope, my position was not altogether one to be envied. Graham climbed down the slanting chimney for a few feet towards me, and then Turner was lowered to the knob of rock on which I had gained my first secure footing. It remained for Fife to get down. His was a position of the greatest responsibility, and it required a cool head and splendid nerve, for there was no one to lower him. He had to use the rope doubled and hitched over a projection of rock. The greatest care had to be exercised, especially for the first few feet, in case the rope should slip over the knob. Fife, however, managed to get down in safety, and then be all roped up once more. There was no room for us to shift our positions to revert to the original order on the rope, so that now I had to take the lead. We climbed round the foot of the steep wall that had cut us off, and once more gained the crest of the ridge, but it would not do, and we crossed to the eastern face, scrambling down a short broken couloir, and then traversing back to regain the ridge. I had to hack a hole through long icicles that were hanging from a jutting rock. There was just room to crawl through. The knapsack grazing the broken fingers of ice above. There might have been a route on the eastern side of this face. But a glance down the dark precipices and colors, filled with clear ice, to a depth of three or four thousand feet, was somewhat startling, especially when that glance was made in search of a practicable line of descent. Besides, under such conditions as we were face to face with it. The known is always preferable to the unknown, and the more so when time is so important a factor in a climb. We knew the ridge we were on could be descended, but we might easily have got into a cul de sac on those grim, as plastered eastern precipices. Our difficulties, however, were by no means over, for, in a few minutes, I was peering over the face of a dangerous scaling. Precipitous cliff. A glance showed that there was no practicable route either to the right or the left. The afternoon was wearing on. There was no time for hesitancy. So I went over the edge, F, with the assistance of the spare rope, scrambled down a steep chimney with square smooth sides and few henderpings. This chimney, however, fell away from the perpendicular near its foot and sloped inwards. On its final twelve feet there were neither hen nor footholds. There was accordingly nothing for it but to enrope again, and be lowered down singly. Graham lowered me down with one rope, Fife and Turner anchoring on the rocks above, for a little wake, by clawing at the rock with feet and hands, and by the friction of my body. I was able to descend with some slight amount of dignity and told Graham to lower away. Then, 
as I reached the part where the chimney sloped inward from the perpendicular. I lost contact with the rocks, and hung suspended like Mahomet's coffin between heaven and earth, the strain of the rope round one's waist, threatening to effect a complete change in one's internal anatomy, a vague clawing at air with one's hands and an equally vague searching forefoot hold with the nether limbs as you dangle in space at the end of a forty-foot rope with precipices and snow slopes of over a thousand feet below, have a chastening influence on the most seasoned mountaineer. If, however exhilarating the experience may be, it is always with feelings of supreme satisfaction, and almost of devout thank that he once more comes to close grips with Mother Earth, at all events, when, after these brief and more or less graceful gyrations at the end of that particular rope, the strain was removed from my waist, and footholds and handholds once more became actual realities. No complaint was made, even though the middle finger of my left hand, which had been cut on the sharp rocks, was spurting blood, and dyeing the snow a beautiful crimson. The spot on which my feet again met the mountain was not the best of land of Plassens, for the rock shelved outwards into snow. It was now Peter's turn to descend, so I planted myself as firmly as possible and watched the operation. He was a good stone and a half heavier, so there must have been a considerable strain on five arms. As he slid off the rocks into the air, his ass case got in the chimney and sent him swinging round like a top. I saw a long body and a swalling mass of arms and legs above me, preceded by an excellent felt hat that went sailing down on the wine to the Linda Glacier thousands of feet below, and then a somewhat disheveled but cool mountaineer, with a little assistance as to where to plant his feet, landed beside me. Peter's descent was so comical that I could not refrain from laughter. Turner was the next man, and Fife furnished him forward. The rope was fastened round his waist, and he too cut a conical figure as he slid off from the perpendicular, clawed vainly at vacancy, and eventually landed beside us, Fife's grinning countenance above, peering over the edge of the precipice, as if he were enjoying the sport, was quite a study, sensational as this performance was, especially until all and Diplis had been found. A more serious one remained for Faf to accomplish. At, however, well knew Fife's capabilities. Otherwise, I should never have undertaken such a descent. We had been together in other tight corners before, and I had absolute faith in his ability to get down safely. Once more, he hit the double rope over a rock and scrambled over the edge of the precipice. The only rock available was slightly loose so he had to be very careful at the start in case the rope should slip over the projection. Such experiences are apt to be a little no histaturge, and these two sensational descents descalous the latter one used to have put some strain upon his nerve. However, he was again equal to the emergency. If, assisted by Graham's long reach as he swung like a pendulum over the last few feet, he was soon beside us in safety. A halt was called for a few minutes while we donned our spare clothing. I gave Gray my hat, as I had a spare cap in my rucksack, and then bound my bleeding finger with strips of adhesive plaster. After all, there was something very exhilarating in such difficult work. Every nerve and muscle was at full tension, and thoughts of all else save the matter in hand were banished from the brain. The way I had now seemed clear. We had drunk the light of battle with our peers, if, thus far, had won. Roping up once more in old order, we continued the descent. We were still a long way from the saddle, and the summit of Mount Hector seemed very far below. The climbing, however, now became easier, and in places we were able to make fairly quick progress. Eventually, at a quarter to seven on Wednesday evening, we had left the dreadful reed behind us, and Peter cut steps across a frozen ridge that led from Green Saddle into the long to thousand at Coolor that sloped steeply down to the Hooker Glacier. It was a quarter to seven on the evening of Wednesday, if, as we had now been going since eleven, fifteen p, 
M. on Tuesday, or for noon attention hours. We hoped to find the color in good order. Our hearts sank as we saw Gray implying his ice case. Fife shouted to him to endeavor to do without the cutting, and to kick steps. But this was impossible, slope was frozen hard, the wind was also increasing in violence, and bitterly cold. There was still the alternative of cutting down to the Linda Glacier on the eastern side, and of a comparatively easy and comfortable descent, out of the wind, to the great plateau, from which we could gain the glacier dome and then descend to the Bivracroc by means of our steps of the night before. The matter was mentioned between Fife and myself, but we scarcely gave it a second thought, and decided to stick to our original intention to call the peak. The word was given to go forward down the couloir, and young Graham, who was leading, treated us to a splendid example of Ike's and physical endurance as he hacked away with his axe down that two thousand feet of frozen slope. It was an arrow, steep gully varying in width from about fifteen to twenty yards, and flanked on either side by great walls of precipitous rock. I, after our, went by and we appeared to be getting no nearer to the foot of the couloir. The wine seemed to pierce to our bones, and every now and then it would send a shower of broken ice from the precipices above switching down about our rears. Some of the bits were big enough to hurt. In one place we took to a rib of rock in the middle of the couloir. Occasionally the rocks on the left of the couloir were used for hand rippings, thus enabling Graham to cut smaller steps. Toner at this stage, began to feel the want of sleep, and asked me to talk to him to keep him awake. The mere suggestion of a man's falling asleep in such a situation was, of course, sufficient to keep one more than ever on the alert, especially as, if Turner had slipped, it would have devolved upon me, being next above on the rope, to hold him up. A few minutes later, some bits of rock and sloating. No doubt, through the falling icicles that were broken by the wind came whizzing past us, and as Turner immediately cried out, Oat, my head, my head, I knew that he had been struck. In a moment the handle of my axe was driven into the frozen snow and the rope hitched around it. Wine Fife, behind me, had already taken a firm stand. Toner, in his account of the accident, says, we would have been dashed to eternity if I had fallen and upset Graham out of his steps while stepped aft, which would have been a very easy matter. Set, however, was not the case, for both Fife and I had the rope absolutely taut. If, being well anchored, we could easily have held up three times Turner's weight. As a matter of fact, he could not have fallen a single yard. Fortunately, the accident was not a serious one. It resolved itself into a scalp wound about freakters of an inch long, and Turner, after a few minutes, was able to continue the descent. Stones falling from such a great hat row by sea a thousand feet or more cower at extraordinary velocity. Indeed, they come so fast as to be invisible, and you can only hear them whizzing past. Had this stern struck Turner on the top of the head, it would undoubtedly have cleft his skull in twain. Luckily, it only grazed the back of his head at the base of the skull. We had now descended about a thousand feet of the couloir. The sun had dipped to the rim of the sea, and the western heavens were glorious with color, heightened by the distant gloom, almost on a level with us. Away beyond Sefton, a band of flame cordelbrook clouds stretched seaward from the lesser mountains toward the ocean and beyond that again was a far wall continent of cloud, sombre and mysterious, as if it were part of another world. The rugged mountains and the valleys and forests of southern Westland were being gripped in the shades of night. A long headland, still thousands of feet below us, on the southwest, stretched itself out into the darkened sea, a thin line of white at its base indicating the tumbling breakers of the Pacific Ocean, Difficult as was our situation, Fife and I could not refrain from occasional contemplation of this mysterious and almost fantastic scene of mountain glory. Turner was concerned mostly with his head, 
and Peter had to devote his whole attention to the step duft. We climbed down a rib of rock in the dusk between the lights, and then zigzagged on down the cooler in the steps cut by the never tiring Graham. Presently the moon rose and bathed the snow slopes of Stokes and Sefton and other giant mountains in a flood of silver. After the accident we kept closer into the rocks to evade any falling icicles or stones that might come down. Graham, anxious no doubt to get out of the cooler, was now making the steps rather small, and there was sometimes difficulty in seeing them in the Semda Crances, and in standing in them once they were found but we got occasional handrippings on the rocks, so that the danger from a slip was reduced to a minimum. On one occasion I did slip in a bad step, but Fife was easily able to hold me on the rope. Down, down, down we went on this apparently never-ending slope. I rafter hour went past, and still the end of the cooler seemed a long way off. Very little was said. Occasionally there would be a request by Turner asking me to hold him tight on the rope, or a plaintive cry of Peter where are the steps Peter was nunt motel. He had enough to do to cut the steps without telling us where they were, and there was the additional fact that, in some instances, identification might not have been altogether an easy matter. But if Peter was too busily engaged to be other than nunt motel, at, on the other hand, had sufficient time to be optimistic, and I made a point of answering cheerily that Turner was doing splendidly, and that there was only another couple of hundred feet of step duft. As a matter of fact, there was more in Ellery a thousand feet of it, but under the special circumstances, I have no doubt the recording angel has overlooked all the lies I told between half past nine and twelve of the clock that night both in regard to the length of the cooler and the figure cut by our now despondent companion. Nine o'clock, ten o'clock, eleven o'clock went past, and still we could not see the final Bergschrund at the foot. Fife took a turn at stepped aft, but quickly relinquished the task in favour of Graham. Fife, however, relieved Graham of his knapsack, if, with his doubled load must have had a difficult time coming down in those economical steps that Graham was making for the sake of speed. Speed, the word, seemed a mockery. We went almost at a snail's pace, the wine continued bitterly cold, and the shadow of the precipices in the moonlight seemed to fill the head of the valley with gloom. Some lines of Shelley seemed to fit the situation the cold ice slept below. Above, the cold sky shone, on ball around with a chilling sound, from caves of ice and fields of snow the breath of night like death did flow beneath the sinking moon. Towards the bottom, the cool lore broadened out somewhat, and the work was easier. We progressed a little more quickly, and at last reached the Bergschrind. This trund, an ordinary season's a very formidable one, had been often in our minds during the past few weeks, and gave us some concern from the commencement of the descent but we reckoned that we could cross it somehow, even if we had to sacrifice an ice case in one of the lengths of alpine rope. The first attempt to find a bridge failed, but Graham, with a pretty bit of sconrifts in the uncertain light, found a comparatively safe snow bridge, over which we crossed one by one, while others anchored with their ice cases and held the rope taut in case the man on the bridge at the time should show an appraiser with her inclination by reason of his weight or the rottenness of the snow under him, to explore the known depths of the shrund. In a few minutes we were all across in safety. If, just after midnight and Thursday morning, Hold stepped on to the upper slopes of the Hooker Glacier, and the first crossing of Mount Cook had been safely accomplished. Going down a little way to where the slope eased off, and gathering together on the ice, we lit the lantern, hung it on an ice case stuck in the snow, and proceeded to explore the rucksacks for food and drink. We had been climbing Fort Wentwito and Freak to Rowers, with but little food or drink. Even now we could scarcely eat, but the little water and a very small quantity of wine left in the bottles were soon disposed of. I had some of my demerara sugar, and the others were content with a sardine or two and a little bread and jam. 
What remained of our provisions we now threw away. Fife, brain, and I also indulged in a little whiskey that drive. Fish it had sent us to the ball hut, and a small flask of which Fife had carried in his rucksack during the descent. Now that the mental strain of the climb was practically over, we felt that a little stimulant would do us no harm. Drink and sleep were what we most needed. We almost went to sleep standing up. After our long spell of over twenty hours climbing, we had now to devote ourselves to a journey of ten or eleven miles down the Hooker Glacier and the valley at its termination to the Hermitage. There was some little trouble amongst the enormous crevices and serics, which, even in the moonlight, were a magnificent sight. We got through the first crevices by candle weight, and then plodded on down the glacier by the light of the moon. Twice we got blocked, and had to retrace our steps to find a route through the maze of crevices and broken ice. The sunrise was splendid. The silver of the moon gave place to the gray of dawn, and then the higher snows were flushed with rose and gold, the ice cup of Mount Stokes being the first to catch the glow, the greatest babed valley, loath to reveal the secrets of its grandeur, waited yet a while in the somber shade, but presently the sun searched the dimmest recesses of the lower crags, blazed upon the gleaming snows, and all the world was filled with light. But it will be as well to draw a veil over the details of that long, dreary walk three zigzagging to find a way down through the broken ice, the jumping of many crevices, the uncertain steps along the crumbling live moraine, and the mechanical, sleepy trudge along the final pathway, our throats were parched, if, early in the morning, the roar of a water full on the range across the valley mopped our first, but on the final slopes of the clear ice of the glacier we broke the frozen surface of some pools with our ass cases and drank mighty draughts. Hour by hour we plodded on down the valley, lifting our feet almost mechanically, halting at every stream, and falling asleep at every restance bulge till some resolute member of the party would prod the sleepy ones into mechanical action once more. Never, in all my life, have I travelled such long, weary miles, towards the end of the journey. The one impression fixed indelibly on the brain seemed to be the hermitage. Once across the Hooker River, it was the bar, which loomed large in our minds with a capital B. We pulled ourselves together for the last hundred yards, but I am afraid it was with a rather faltering stride that we reached the winning post after our long struggle of thirty-six hours from the Bivra Croc many miles away on the other side of the Great Range. Toner, for sartorial reasons, had to make a beeline for his bedroom. But the three New Zealanders went boldly into the kitchen of the Hermitage and discussed a bottle of wine amidst the congratulations of friend MacDonald and his were the family. Fife and Graham followed this up with ham and deggs and copious draughts of milk. I had a jug of hot milk, a hot bath, and bed. We had not had a wash nor taken off our clothes for several days, and were now in a position to fully appreciate the luxuries of civilization. I slept till the dinner gone woke me in the evening, and as there was not time to dress I had dinner in bed. Later on, Fife, brain and Clark came into my room, and we climbed the mountain over again. On the way down the hooker I had sworn to myself that I would never climb another peak. But so strange an animal is man, and so fascinating is his most glorious sport, that no sooner had we recovered from our exertions than we now immediately began to discuss plans for the ascent of Mount Sefton, but next day, through the glasses, we could plainly see great icicles hanging from the rocks on the main areat. The ridge was plastered with ice, and we had no immediate desire to repeat the performance we had just gone through. The end in ex accident to Wagonit. Fifty skis. Two Mr. Moth. One hundred sixty skis. Two Toner. Three hundred five. Ava. Mate. Two hundred for Cheeto. Evanson. Fifty it. Nanchain, Age Leisure, 240, Elfin, Lant, 124, Alpine Club, Tribute to, 28, 
ex presidented twenty eight Amory M M S twelve Annan Frodi forty eight Rondi Concord one hundred fifteen Architects Creek two hundred twelve Arthur Bami two hundred twenty four River two hundred for Cheeto Aspiring Mant ten Mantin Austria Emperor of three five avalanche shoot and one hundred eight extin avalanches seventy eight eighty ninety fighter one hundred ten one hundred thirty one hundred eighty watta two hundred ninety two hundred nine chain ball glacier forty sixteen scene hot fourteen six sight one hundred sixty balone land two hundred twenty three two hundred twenty four which freeze one hundred twenty barrett land two hundred sixteen billy barlow two hundred date boat hill station fourteen fictive dife bidwok rock big one hundred forty four one hundred forty hurl one hundred six diskies at Maltbrunn, one hundred eighty in, in Tasman Valley, Totebyth, Mount Cook, fifteen, eighteen, sixty nine, seventeen, eight eighty nine, one hundred two, New Frump, six dit two hundred itixes, on Euler, one hundred thirty in, on Plateau, seventeen, eight eighty me in to the isle nine to free on to toko two hundred fifty or five walks on the water of it one hundred nine to three one hundred nine ninety blue lake for tito tertifor best a meal fourteen botanical paradise at one hundred twenty four bowen falls two hundred for three f Two hundred third of Ife, Broderick, Mr. M. M. Twenty, Brown, Professor Mainwaring, two hundred sixteen, two hundred six Drive, Buller, Mr. Posig, two hundred seventy, Sir Walter, one hundred twenty three, Folks Pass, fifty or Camp Concert, two hundred fifteenth, Cookery. Thirtisbeen, seventy, two hundred twenty, two hundred twenty, two hundred seven time, in storm, one hundred one, Neff, one hundred fifteen in, meditations, for two trois, on Tasman moraine, fifty it, carrier pigeons, seventy ain, Nanchain, Selmesi flat, Tertifor, Selmesis, one hundred twenty three, Chalmers, acclimatization of three, Churchill, one hundred fifty, Clark, Gack, seventeen, Manteen, one hundred nine, one hundred ten, one hundred six sight, two hundred six diskies, Plevay River, two hundred thirty six, Clinton River, two hundred sixty on, Coach Journey, twenty seven, Conway, Land, Mantine, so W, M, two hundred eighty, two hundred eighty, Puff, Land, ten, Eheen, Mantine, twenty, Twetwito, twenty skies, two hundred six sight, Bivouac, fifteen, Eheen, sixty nine, six ditwal, seventeen, eighty eighty nine, one hundred two, Two hundred itixes. Descent of two hundred ninth of sin. Eastern Arit. Dititwati. Final last cop. Nandit. First crossing of two hundred sixth whiffer. First traverse of Eheen. Green's attempts. Fourteen. Hooker root. One hundred five. Hot. Tertifor. Ice cup. New from. Nine tighty. Fiddle Peak, 
a cent of one hundred six northwestery one hundred twelve bridged carnon one hundred thirteen summit reached one hundred thirteen summit of two hundred nine to fighter sunset on three hundred five cocopter color one hundred eleven one hundred fourteen copland river two hundred twelve kite quiller one hundred forty spin fox drive norman one hundred twenty nine one hundred forty four one hundred thirty five one hundred forty hurled crow or an octal two hundred four to twy kikus one hundred twenty two davelson miss bond two hundred seventy cabgear that twenty darwin that seventeen two hundred seventy eight down on mount cook eighteen b Gaubeck, seventeen thirty six nine tighty one hundred sixty swing and the minarets one hundred sixty swing bivouac one hundred forty four one hundred forty hurl one hundred six diskies heif and buck six dixon m seventeen fifty re fifty seven sixty nine eighteen itixis one hundred one hundred